Hello? Is... Is this thing on? One day I'll explain the origin of that joke. How's everybody doing today? This is a very special... Wait, does somebody actually know where this is, where that joke is from? Kajar, do you know? <laughs> unless it's, unless that person is taking that reference from something else, but... Oh, I'm getting an echo. Um, let me see. Am I echoing? I'm going to need verification if I'm echoing. Do not hear an echo. Okay. Andrew Taint is gaslighting me right now. So this, is a, this is a very special stream. Um, yesterday was, uh, was the three-year anniversary for my channel. So, because uh, that was the first, first, uh, that was the day I uploaded the first part for, uh, for a Bolivian. July 4th. So, um, yeah, I, I was a bit busy yesterday. I was on a, another podcast. Um, I was on Indigo Gaming's podcast with, uh, with Indigo, Zarek, and, uh, Patrician. Um, it went very well. We spent about almost six hours talking about Starfield and other things. Um, if you're interested in seeing that, uh, I actually have it linked down in the, uh, video description of this. It's a, it's a good one. Uh, it was a lot of fun. It's kind of um, it's kind of surreal because uh, like I said, third year, uh, three year anniversary for that uh, uh, for the channel yesterday, and to remember where I was like three years ago was pretty crazy. <laughs> to be uploading my first video and be like, no, no one's ever gonna watch this. Why am I even bothering to upload? And um, now uh, three years later, I'm on a podcast with three well established large uh, YouTubers talking about the next. Uh, the next potential disaster from uh, Bethesda Game Softworks, and uh, yeah, it was it was pretty cool. A real a surreal moment, put it that way. But um, I'm just gonna bring Patricia in right right from the start here, as we usually do. Hello. Okay, listen, you fan, you Sony fanboy. <laughs> Who? Uh, saying that Starfield is a potential disaster is Sony fanboyism. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you were calling somebody out in chat there for a second. Mm -hmm. You can't open out the gates by saying that Starfield might, could potentially be less than a <laughs> 100 out of 100. <laughs> Uh, I mean, a lot, I'm, I'm a sorry. Lot I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, pre-order. Make sure. Make sure you pre-order the um, the uh, the watch edition. Mm -hmm. How much is that thing? Like three hundred bucks or something like that? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> More than the Sega Saturn. <laughs> um. Yeah, it's funny seeing a lot of the pro Starfield discourses. Like, well, you see, uh, all those previous games won Game of the Year, and it's like. Yeah, Bethesda says that all their games are game of the year. And some people believe, like, some other people, I think, like, DICE gave them game of the year. But, like, yeah, they do win game of the year awards. So it doesn't mean yeah. anything. Like, I'm yeah. pretty sure every game wins some kind of game of the year award from somebody. <laughs> because it's such a ubiquitous title. That, what was, like, there was a game that was, like, famously, they had a game of the year edition, but no, nobody actually gave them the game of the year award. I think it was like some Ubisoft game or something like that. Some some fucking famous flop. Five games with Game of the Year editions that weren't close to being Game of the Year. <laughs> Dead Island, Borderlands, AFL Alive, Operation Flashpoint, Cold War Crisis, and Red Orchestra, Heroes of Stalingrad. Honorable mention, Fable 2. That is... Where, where'd you find this list? Um, probably some 
I think I've already filtered it out of my mind. Kotaku. Far Cry 6. Ah, yeah, see, I, I knew it. <laughs> yeah, there was some recent case. <laughs> How does Far Cry 6 have a Game of the Year edition? It's called They Can Fucking Lie. Game of the Year has never meant anything. I'm amazed that people actually thought that it meant something. Game of the Year edition is just the edition you want to buy like four years after the game's release when it's like 75% off. Yeah, it literally just means this has all the expansions. <laughs> yeah. The complete version. And in some cases, it doesn't. Um, have you guys seen the Twitter conspiracy that all the Xbox fan accounts are being paid? Um, or paid bots, rather. So, this is a funny thing. that There was a, um, there was a social media website that just shut down. Uh... Oh, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. Um, but they found out that I think like 95% of its users were just bots. And um, yeah, the, like the, the CEO was saying that they had like 16 million active users or something like that. Uh, basically just trying to scam um, scam their uh, investors. And uh, uh, yeah, okay. what else, they, what found else out, is... they found out about it and the, the place like shut down immediately. And they're probably going to get sued. What I'll say is that I don't think that every pro Xbox account on Twitter mm -hmm. is a bot, but I do think that a lot of them are because there's a lot of like yeah. really bizarre logic coming out of them. Yeah. yeah. So like there was one I saw that was ima imagine being more excited for Baldur's Gate than Starfield. The level of cope is insane. So like this is a human being that doesn't understand that some people are CRPG fans more than they are ARPG fans. Like that just that breaks my mind that you could i'm pretty sure this person this person works for a games journalist outlet are you guys buying anything for the steam sale i uh i bought um what was it uh elite dangerous odyssey because i've played elite dangerous before i've owned it for many years but um odyssey with its mostly negative reviews on Steam for like three years now, I think. Um, yeah, I just didn't want to buy it, but I figured for Starfield, I should probably like play it and record some footage and stuff. So I paid this 16 bucks for it that it was on sale this uh, this week. Other than that, no, I haven't really bought anything. Uh, two copies of Halo Infinite. Oh. No. <laughs> it's like thirty dollars. <laughs> Still not worth it. The the fresh Halo Infinite cope is uh guys, come on. You're just you're citing the, the Steam charts and the Steam charts aren't counting the full player base and it's like I don't know, <laughs> like Like Steam charts, yes, they don't count the full player base. They still they still count interest. And like you you especially have to be delusional to have been there for the previous Halo games and their communities to look at Infinite yeah. and say, Oh yeah, it, that's popping off right yeah. there. It's something like the twentieth uh top played Xbox game and it's free to play. It's yeah, it's free to play and MCC is like handily beating it right now. So it's like if the player ba if the player base is playing the old games instead that that basically tells you all you need to know. Infinite Infinite failed. They didn't even show anything. They didn't even mention it at fucking E3 or not E3. I'm sorry. But but listen, we're just Sony fanboys. <laughs> I totally own a PlayStation 5, I promise. Um Oh yeah, and July's Humble Bundle is Spacer's Choice Edition of Outer Worlds. Oh, that's what that was. Yeah, that, oh, that's, oh. A, that's a steaming <laughs> theme key that I have in my library right now. <laughs> and I played Fallout 76 for like 20 minutes last night to record the Mothership Zeta event. Wait, so... We were working on the Fallout 76 video. Fallout 76 goes on Humble Bundle. You're about mm -hmm. to release an Outer Worlds video. Outer Worlds goes on Humble Bundle. Yeah, I know. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a very, very convenient. <laughs> I don't think they're tuned in to me, but it, it's just, it's just the timing is, uh, it's a little interesting. 
I do like to think that they were like rushing to get Fallout 76 stuff content out after the videos dropped. <laughs> and it's like, oh shit, this is like a half a million view video <laughs> on our game. And it's and it's not pushing the it got better narrative. In fact, it's going pretty hard in the opposite direction. <laughs> Quick that would be break funny. the emergency glass. I, I really I really would be interested to know if anybody at Bethesda has seen like any of our videos, like you, me, um, just like, just like, honestly, just any of the videos out there. Joseph Anderson's videos. I, like, I, I just want to know how clued into the um, the game analysis scene they are. Well, Todd Howard's son watches uh, Maddie plays or something. <laughs> <laughs> so he's in the pipeline. Give him a few more years. Mm -hmm. Is Outer like Worlds worth a playthrough? No. <laughs> I've never had an outpouring of comments <laughs> that said to the extent that the Outer Worlds has received that they regretted buying a game mm. as much as Outer Worlds has yep. gotten it. Um, one sec. Yeah, I'm thinking that Outer Worlds is going to be a repeat of uh, Creator Clash 2 where they're going to do Outer Worlds 2 and they're going to have this expectation of player base and then like they'll get a fraction of it because they're going to be using projections from the last time and they don't realize that like the majority of people who played Outer Worlds last time regret having purchased it if they did purchase it. Sorry, I had to take that phone call. The problem with Game Pass is that it is inflating player count numbers and like interest. So I don't think even Microsoft has an accurate perspective on what they should be doing because of all these like inflated game pass numbers like if they go by the game pass numbers then outer worlds is like the success story and i have plenty of people that are like yeah i regret even paying for game pass <laughs> to play outer worlds <laughs> yeah i i bought that game at launch too on the epic store of all places so <laughs> talk about uh talk about regret And I never even finished playing it. I got... I think I got up to... After after Nioka's, like, introduction, I basically fizzled out at that point. Mm hmm So... Yeah, because yeah, that's, that like, right at... The, that's right at the start of the Monarch, if you actually if you follow that up. Yeah. Um, so it's, like, this nice little ambush they have on the... Basically what is the second planet, and you're like, oh, God, it's... Or, well, I guess... <laughs> technically third but really second um it's just this oh god i like the, i like the introduction to your video which by the way if you can't wait until friday because you're going to be releasing it in parts right yes it's going to yeah. be two parts so if you want to get get access to patrician's uh video early subscribe to his patreon you get access to the whole thing right now how I feel about uncensored. Avowed is each time they say the words, it's like Outer Worlds, the less enthusiastic I am. I'm already <laughs> I'm already of the opinion that I will not be buying it at launch. Yeah. Like, I might wait for a sale, which is not great for how little that they've really shown about the game. As well, as well. I, I, sh I realized I showed your thing before I showed my thing. Um, I have a video coming out uh, Friday. Um city skylines a nice hour-long review if you subscribe to my patreon you get access to the uncut uncensored version right now as well but otherwise public review public release the full thing because it's only like an hour or so on uh friday i'm probably i'm not even, i don't think i'm gonna, even gonna do a premiere for it i think i'm just gonna push it out immediately i want to i want to take friday off as a reason and um yeah. i like to be present for my premieres but uh Friday's supposed to be pretty nice, and I want to actually like get out and do stuff. So I think it's just going to be a instant release. I still have to make the thumbnail. I've been struggling with that. Yeah, you showed me the concept. It looked fine. Yeah, I start. I started putting in more stuff, and the and the composition just got all like out of whack. So I gotta, I gotta really dedicate some time to it. I haven't had the time yet. It's probably going to be tomorrow. I'll just spend the whole day working on the thumbnail. All right, City Skylines right now is nine dollars. Let's look at the DLC. Yeah, I wonder if the DLCs are like super discounted now. Uh, airports is only thirty-three percent off. Yeah. 
<laughs> Ask me about a DLC. I'll how much? I'll tell you how much it's on sale. Um. Well, I know like a lot of them are. Is there any that are even fit, like seventy five percent off? I, usually, they only stop at fifty. Yeah, there's a sixty percent, which is campuses. Hmm. Yeah, campuses. Park is life. A, okay. I mean, those are those are decent ones. Those are definitely worth picking up at sixty percent off. Oh, and some of the radio stations. Yeah. <laughs> The radio stations that are mostly like just songs lifted from a royalty free music database. Mm. I had a joke that I should have I, I should have done a dedicated music section for that video, but I didn't. Um, but I had a I had a funny joke where it was like their radio stations are the Fisher Price versions of uh, GTA's radio stations. Yeah, it's like yeah. It, they, they even have the skits in there, too, like the like the commercials and all that. And it's just like it's all like this watered down PG stuff compared to, you know, GTA's. It's like an effort was made, so I didn't I didn't really want to make fun of it, but um, yeah, it's also one of those games where like people, everybody that I talked to is like, oh, yeah, I forgot there's music in that game because uh, I just turn the music off and then, you know, watch videos or listen to my own music in yep. the background. So that's why I kind of like didn't do I that. I like all the defenses of um, that are like, you know, I like an RPG that's only 40 hours long because it gives me a really bad taste in my mouth because that was like the main defense of Outer Worlds. Was, Guys, it's not going to be a huge RPG. It's going to be a, a smaller but more thoughtful RPG. Yeah. It's like, no, that's total, total <laughs> bullshit. Like, the only, off. the only good thing about it being short is that it's over quicker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a shorter video, thank God. It's not another 150 well, that, hour playthrough like Fallout That's kind of the weird thing about the debate. Though, so the whole debate is that like Starfield and Baldur's Gate 3 are going to be like these mm -hmm. massive, lengthy uh, playthrough style games. And it's like, the problem isn't that the game's really long. In fact, I would love if Morrowind had 500 hours of content. Yeah. It doesn't. Um, the problem is that the fucking RPGs suck. And then they go on for a long time and people, <laughs> for some reason, play them for their full run times. Because they spent the money and they have to justify the expense. Uh, you could justify the, like, it's fucking, after 70 hours, it's $1 <laughs> for an hour. Like, <laughs> you don't have to justify, like, no. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't really, I don't really measure, uh, it's kind of like a proportion like there's a ratio to it of like enjoyment to hours gotten out of it and stuff so it's like if i paid 60 bucks for a game that was 10 hours yeah i'm not really going to be pleased regardless of how good those 10 hours were but it was like you're like you're talking like 60 hours for like 20 hours that i really fucking enjoyed I, that's that's fine i don't i don't need it to be 60 out 60 bucks means i need to get 60 hours out of it or something like that but i mean i you see it's also it's also like I have so many other games that I want to play and stuff, so I kind of appreciate when a game is only 20 hours. It's like, all right, cool. I can knock that out in like three days and then play something else. When I, when I was younger and it was like I, I was only going to buy one game every six months, yeah, I would like that game to have a lot of replayability. But most kids these days are playing free-to-play games anyway, or they just have Game Pass, so... I, I don't I, I don't think we need the the job simulators anymore. Or at least not as many. I, I just want to know wh where Starfield is forcing people to play for such long playthroughs that you're feeling fatigue from it. Because <laughs> honestly, like, yes, I get the concern. I really don't want to go back into the, the realm of we're going to start making games smaller and smaller in scope until they're charging like, you know, 70 bucks for a four hour game. Yeah. Oh, but it's so thoughtful. It's such a thoughtful <laughs> experience. And it's like, no, I like my hundred hour games if the game is good. Yeah. So, what mods are we uh, running here today? Uh, we got a bunch of mods. Um, the main stuff, let me pull it up. It's also listed in the description of the video, if you're curious. I want to look into... Um, I want to look into... What's it called? Um, sorry, I'm just trying to find this thing. Um, how collections work on the Steam Workshop. So people could like just just get yeah, the collection. Yeah, if it's like way too much work, I won't bother. But if I could set it up in a few hours, I might. But um, yeah. So basically, 
it looks like it's a lot of mods, but it really isn't because it's a lot of like tiny tweaks here and there. Um, the idea behind the mod pack is to just fix the fundamental problems with progression and gameplay. Um, so there's no like content additions or anything like that. All the quests and stuff, they're all the same. Uh, so like the, the heavy lifting stuff is going to be in the last section, which is the uh, leveling and balance section. And there's some pretty beefy ones in there. Um, I think it's called like Ascension or something like that. Yeah, Ascension Immersive Vanilla Overhaul. That one does like a lot to uh, just rebalance the leveling system, uh, enemy scaling, um, dungeons and stuff like that. It basically overhauls all that stuff. Um, and it ends up making a lot of builds viable in this game. Uh, a lot more skills are actually worthwhile, like worth investing into, like speech and mercantile. Uh, so yeah, it's just subtle stuff, but it's enough subtle stuff that it kind of changes the game and hopefully makes it a more so, enjoyable, hardcore RPG experience. While we have a few generations of Bethesda game characters up on screen here, um, I thought it would be good to show an image of a Starfield character <laughs> as, as contrast material. Let me get you an image. Okay, this one's been making the rounds. Let's see if the one that's really bad. Oh, I can't re I can't react in my own quickly. chat in my own chat. So I see somebody dropping the hearts, but I can't do that. Reactions is, are unfair. Mm. Mobile I'm, focused. I'm glad we have reactions, but we don't have um, any additions to uh, to the membership system that I've been a. Uh, a partner in for almost a year now and there has been literally not a single single update to that system literally no feels like uh it feels like an alpha version of like patreon or something it's pretty uh it's pretty sad no mods for voluptuous females that every elder scrolls youtuber seemingly uses i always thought that was weird because i'm not into like hugely voluptuous women <laughs> what you, you don't See Sydney, was it Sydneyus or whatever the uh, the Argonian from Coral? She uh, she doesn't do it for you. No, sir. <laughs> All right, where's Cyberpunk Planet? All right, we're close. Here we go. This is this is the face right here. Let me get you a screenshot. Take snapshot. And where is my Oblivion mod that makes the uh, makes the horses have like super detailed butts? Oh put yeah, this, put this character up on screen. Oh yeah, as this contrast is... material because we've got Skyrim, Fallout seventy six, and Fallout New Vegas. And then this is what Bethesda is uh, putting out there. Come on, Windows. Well, I'm not a fan of the big dick mods either. Um, hmm. Oh, oh, there we go. It, it took Windows about 20 seconds for it to actually like they, show up on my they desktop. They did something. They did something to Windows Explorer that is uh, okay. that compromised it. Okay, it's not just me. They probably like intentionally fucking broke it. Oh yeah, this is gonna be a, a 1440p image, so. You'll have to scale it down. Are you using the mod that lets you order dominoes? That is an important mod to <laughs> include. <laughs> All right, let's see. Can I get this dude on screen with the rest of them? Yeah, that, that should that should work. Just so we can. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Just so we can contrast. <laughs> so I mean, th this is like a, a trailer shot, right? But I, th it's supposed to be in engine footage, so this is like candid pictures. Now, what you have to bear in mind is <laughs> that applies to all of the other characters that are on screen as well. Um, and it's, so I, I really so want to draw lighting. attention to like the lighting exactly. The, you'll notice there are shadows in every game, <laughs> f 
Fallout New Vegas probably has like the softest, almost non-existent sh character shadows, but you can still see it on the sides. Yeah. Uh, so we seem to be back to that kind of soft shadow approach. Yeah, wow. That's... It's... There's no way. There's no way that's what it looked like. I, I still think this was like earlier footage that just made it by... Yeah. Because, like, every everything in Neon looked fucking terrible. Unless well, unless he, Neon is he, such a complex scene that they have to just well, limit the let's number be of fair. lights This there. is easily one of the worst character models they showed. There are better looking ones. Yeah. But I still think that, like, the best model that we've seen so far from Starfield looks worse than even, like, Fallout 76 character models. Real-time private sessions coping. Um, I mean... Make sure you pre-order the game. It's this is absolutely not a problem. It's it's all in your head. Constellation 30, edition. Thirty FPS on Xbox. Of course, it's going to be thirty FPS because the game's going to be just so big. You're going to be able to drop so many sandwiches that <laughs> <laughs> it has to run at thirty. FPS. It has to run at thirty FPS to create like, a nice okay, consistent at, experience. Look at the next right. <laughs> The neck is almost completely absent of any kind of detailing, which especially for like he's a stockier guy, right? Yeah. They've they put they put him on the chubby side of the character triangle. So there would be like creases in his neck where like the fat was sticking together and it forms into like this red line. Those should be present. Um Yeah, there's almost like nothing on his yeah. neck. <laughs> there's more there's more definition on like the New Vegas neck. And like, what's, what's going on with like, the bridge of his nose? See, I think he's got some kind of scar. Yeah. There. Like, uh, it's, it's just... probably like a, the free scar placement system that they have. Mm, maybe, yeah. I wonder if there's, there will still be mismatched seams on their necks. Probably. <laughs> it's a Bethesda game. That's, uh, I mean, that's, that's the benefit of spacesuits. It's harder to see. True, yeah. All space suits terminate just below the chin. But also the hair. <laughs> the hair, the facial hair. It, how do you, how do they have worse balding hair? <laughs> like just copy the balding hair from Fallout 4. Incredible. Truly incredible. Game of the year though. Yeah. Ignore uh, um, this is this is not a Starfield stream by the way. Ignore uh yeah, that's that's tomorrow on your channel. Yeah. Um yeah, ig ignore the uh the new Zelda game. Um uh, I think the Star Wars the, game even was pretty well regarded. Yeah. What else um, came out this it, year? It had, it had, they they uh, made the character uglier though. Hang on. What's his name? Cal Kestis. I'll send you a picture of his uh his new Matt Watson style incarnation. You might get that cut. Not the not the known YouTuber Matt Watson, more obscure, but come on, Google. That's oh, a web P. Can can you can OBS load web P's? Um probably not. I'm gonna go out and let me assume not. Here, try it out. I'll I'll, I guess, like a savage screenshot the image. <laughs> I know you're supposed to be able to change the file name in Windows to get it to change from a WebP to a PNG, but that's literally corrupted every image. Oh, wait. That oh, I tried it, to do it, that with. oh, it actually took it. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, now that's that's some hair right there. But anyways, thank you for indulging me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just it, it's not it's not one of our streams until we bitch about Starfield's hair. If we if we complain about it enough, it might actually get fixed. Who knows? Now, is this is this an engine or is a doctor to look better? It looks 
pretty close to the in-engine footage that I've seen of the game. There are you do get to pick his hairstyle, and there are some horrendous options. But horrendous <laughs> in terms of why would you, as a redhead, ever have a ha have a that handlebar like mustache? Ah, <laughs> oh, all right. Well, like you can make him a redneck if you want. It's pretty weird. Nice. I li I like that. I like that. All right, but we're gonna switch on over now. Get this, get this uh, show on the road. So the reason I am playing Oblivion is, um, well, it's for several reasons. First off, I just want to do. Oh, look, Oblivion's resetting its settings again. Mm. Cool. All right. Changing changing the file extension doesn't change the data. Screenshotting is definitely the easiest solution. It's it's, it's the easiest. Well, like with JPEGs and PNGs, you can just change the file name, and I've never had an issue with doing that. But anytime I do WebP to PNG, which is supposed to work, um, some program I have will inevitably just not be able to load it. Oblivion, you are super loud. And mind you, the problem with WebP is that they just, like, they threw this uh, file format out into the world from absolutely nowhere. <laughs> and then no program on earth was it, like besides internet browsers were able to load it born 87 years ago like mind you premiere still can't load web ms yeah and that's existed forever all right so like i was saying um so the reason i'm start the reason i'm playing oblivion is because one uh i need footage for uh for the Skyrim can we, video. Can we bring the Starfield character back up? Well, <laughs> <laughs> hold on. Let's see. Can I bring it back up? I wish I had like a masking tool or something. Yeah, just to cut him out real fast. Yeah. Uh, I'll shrink him down a little bit more. You could like put him put him over where the normal face is and just like turn it on and off. Just to really help. And just... Try and recreate the Starfield character. <laughs> I don't think Oblivion doesn't have the facial hair support. That's like the Here's only your... points that Starfield in every Bethesda game has over Oblivion is that it doesn't have the facial hair. <laughs> I hate How bad to say I... it, but I really do think Oblivion's only a very slight step down from Starfield. See, Oblivion has like, it's so... Overlay him and change the opacity. Yeah, that's an option. Mm. Let me see. Opacity... Cropping them out is like above my pay grade for a live stream. Like, yeah. I'm not putting that much work into this. It's that skin texture. <laughs> it, it's like the weird, smooth, plasticky. Like fucking yeah. Ken from the Barbie movie has more texture to his skin than this guy. Oops, that was the wrong thing. Oh no! I, I killed the capture. Whoopsie. Oh yeah, you can uh, you can crop in OBS. Yeah, it, it's it's a bit of a process though. Anyways, we 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 gotta move we on. Gotta, yeah. <laughs> Please. Uh, here I'll I'll get my mind off of Starfield. I've been working on a Morrowind <laughs> mod. Oh really? In my, uh, in my free time. Yeah, it's some rebalancing stuff that I've been doing. All right, so I got to do a stealth character for this. So are we going to go Argonian, Wood Elf, or Khajiit? Does it have to be optimal? Um, the mods that I have encourage you to play a little bit more okay. optimally. It's not not like Oblivion, um, not like vanilla Oblivion. See, here's the problem is Oblivion character creation. Now, that's not a uh, topic that I'm 100% <laughs> on. Let me look at what everybody gets. Bosmer. Agility and speed, and they lose strength, willpower, personality. Females lose endurance. So if you play a Bosmer, you probably want to play male. Really? I didn't know gender 
defenses yeah. were yeah, in still in oblivion. Yep. Um, so the greater power command creature up to level five for 60 seconds. I think the uh, one of the mods I have also changes the powers a little bit. So I mean, that's the only like that's the only thing is if that power is a little better than Wood Elf would be strong. And the reason I advocate Wood Elf is because of how many fucking creatures there are in Oblivion. <laughs> that that is just like, can I please just turn you off? <laughs> well, um, one of the mods uh, does rebalance the. Um, the creatures okay. and undead and stuff so there's significantly well, see, less of them and um they're not as tanky now everything is not nearly as tanky in this uh in this version well see that's kind of the complicated thing mm -hmm. then is i'm not sure what the balance is um i just want to so know I, what what is chat what do you want to see yeah, what what fits into uh, the I'm, private sessions harem of characters? I'm leaning towards Khajiit just because they get the night eye ability, and I have a mod that makes dungeons actually dark. So <laughs> being able to yeah. see in dungeons from the get go would be nice. Oh, but their attribute lineup is absolutely terrible. Does do you have a mod that changes it? Um, I don't think so. It... All right, so like um, typical attribute lineups, like so Bosmer are two pluses and three minuses whereas khajiit is one plus and two minuses hmm oh man the fucking attribute spread is so weird it's gonna be my place so i'm gonna be doing just like um probably stealth archer honestly because uh stealth we gotta do um, we gotta do the thieves guild and the dark brotherhood i need footage of those too because... I mean, if you want, if you want the bonuses, then uh, Bosmer is where it's going to be at. Mm -hmm. Khajiit is uh, acrobatics, hand to hand, for their plus tens. Like their, do... the, like their only weapon plus is going to be blade and hand to hand. What are, what are Bosmer's like um, magical stats looking like? Um, plus ten alchemy, plus five alteration. Mm. Um, so poisoner, poison, stealth archer, yeah, Bosmer yeah. is going to be super strong. That that might be funny because it uh, is funny. Al Alchemy is still bustedly OP in this version, as far mm. as I'm aware. And then what was the third option? Argonian. Um, yeah, Argonians plus ten athletic security plus five alchemy blade hand to hand illusion mysticism. So more of a night blade skill, but you're not going to get your bow. The, and the mod pack is suck. the mod pack is something I homebrewed, so um, I have the mods listed in the description. Um, as far as I'm aware, I don't have anything that's modifying the starting stats you, for the different races, though. You know what's cool? A conjuration stealth archer, just to make it a bit more unique. That could be cool. Hang on, though, because Oblivion is kind of weird about conjure like bound weapons. Mm -hmm. What are the spells? Bound Bow is a journeyman spell. That's not too bad. Uh, but that That's going to be, what, 25? Um, journeyman, yes, it's 25. In character planner. None of the races that we select have as options favor Conjuration. Yeah, what is it? Breton, I think, favors Conjuration. And... Altmer. Come on, give me the. I Oblivion do have has no has no good character planner. Uh -oh. I do, I do also have a mod that lets me get um. I think it's unlimited number of training. Are you gonna use uh, daggers at all? Mm, we could. I don't know. I think Bosmer that plus ten alchemy. Like, Bosmer's got a lot going for it, other than, like, people are going to, like, make fun of you for being a film boy. <laughs> That's fine. But I think Bosmer's going to be your strongest I, pick. Yeah, I think so. Oh, did we ever poll? Can I even do polls in your chat? That's a good question. Yeah, I can't add polls. You could... I don't know. Don't leave it up to chat. Chat's going to vote for Argonian. Because <laughs> it's the fucking worst. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm just going to go with Wood Elf. 
female Bosmer to avoid widow allegations. <laughs> um, the only problem with female Bosmer is that you're going to lose endurance. Yeah, I don't want to lose endurance. So, like, male Bosmer for what you're doing is probably the strongest. Because you, you just lose personality instead of endurance. Look at this hair. <laughs> it's... Honest to God, it looks pretty much the same. Adorian, as... Adorian fan. Oh God, no, no, I'm not. <laughs> Fuck don't, off. You're not gonna. You don't want to role play as the Adorian fan. <laughs> Fuck off. Not, not in the, not in the current environment of. Um, I, I looked at the, I looked at the fucking thing today. Uh, the Oblivion Steam page today, or not the Steam page, but you know the community page. And first things, adoring fan in Starfield. Mm. I'm just, yeah, what's that What's that key in the top left? Um, I think that's a notification that's about to pop up. It got, it got cucked oh. by the character creator popping up first. So he'll listen to me when I say Bosmer, but he's not going to do the adoring fan meme. <laughs> yeah, so um, my Morrowind mod has been, it's a rebalance you know, um, I started with, I'm starting with character generation stuff. So I started with birth signs and I've been doing starter spells today. We could do, you know what? We'll do, we'll do the anti, we'll do the dark. Uh, yeah, correct. Well, that was kind of my proposal is if you're doing stealth, I mean, <laughs> Thieves Guild, Dark Brotherhood, you could, we could do evil yeah. adoring fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll give him like. Thinning is the prime haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get you a adoring fan Oblivion era. Unless you want to do like based on the Starfield image. Oh god. That that would be cursed because it's like uh, <laughs> going through the Chinese language filter. <laughs> so this is you should make Google translate adoring fan. What I love about the hairstyle too is that it's a it's like the lazy version. Like it doesn't look at all like his original hairstyle. Yeah. It's just nineties bikes with like it, it's um like kind of black to gray hair with yellow highlights, not actually yellow hair. And he's got like an undercut on the sides. Oh god. Like it doesn't at all look like the original haircut. And his eyebrows are wrong. And like his facial proportions, I think his eye color is wrong. No, his eye color is right, but it, yeah, it's like super. And they didn't like, guys, you've made knife ears like you have knife ear assets. You couldn't have like added <laughs> a single elf ear option just for this joke. It's a trait. Like, and that, it's a trait. That's you why can it's get. so sad. That's why it's so sad, <laughs> because if they had gone full ham on like, um, they don't really have like a like, if they if they had gone full whole ham on recreating the adoring fan, the hair looks right. The character model looks like looks like he's from Oblivion, and he has like elf ears. This is the and you can like write a line like mohawk that we got. That it's like a it's like a cosmetic surgery that he got, and that's why it's exclusive to him. Yeah. Like if they if they added the knife ears to Starfield just for the joke, I would be more amicable to it. <laughs> But it's the fact that, like, they did it in the laziest way possible. Yeah, yeah. They did just enough for people to recognize it and spread it without recognizing that, like, how they did it was super lazy. Because, I mean, like, I want you to remember that uh, one of my favorite bits in the Skyrim video was giving the guys in Windhelm that are harassing that Dunmer woman, giving them Stormcloak armor. There was a lot of console fuckery that went into that bit. <laughs> Because, like, um, it took me multiple attempts because what you have to do is you have to load into Windhelm, immediately open the console, oh, and, like, manually input all the commands to give them the armor. And then, because you have to give them the armor, they don't auto equip it. You then have to tell them to equip it. And uh, anybody who's used the Skyrim console knows how much more difficult it is to actually select the correct NPC. I don't know if there's just like air particles that you're clicking on. <laughs> I love it.
Yeah, I got, I got, I had to give him the original haircut. So what's he, what's he planning building wise mod list? How are they fixing this mess of a game? Yeah, I think you should kind of like introduce some of the mods that you have installed. Okay, well, so the big mod, the big mod that's doing most of the heavy lifting is the Ascension uh, Vanilla Overhaul mod pack or Vanilla Overhaul. Um, and basically what that does is just, it just goes through like top to bottom throughout the whole game and just rebalances, um, skill progression, um, it sounds like what I'm doing with Morrowind. Yeah, like skill progression, enemy scale, enemy level scaling, enemy spawns. Um, it be, like take everything that you complained about in your uh, combat analysis during like that whole arena bit, and mm -hmm. that's what the whole mod fixes. So it's like I could go through it, but it's we're gonna be here for forty minutes. Well, you're doing character creation, so you might as well talk about it. So. I don't even remember what it does for character creation. I don't think it actually modifies much for character creation. Um, skill progression is mostly what it uh, alters. So, like, some skills will level faster, some skills will level slower. I don't think, actually, I don't think any of them really level slower. It's also, also bear in mind, I haven't looked at the uh, mod in a while. So, I'm going off of memory. So, things probably have likely changed since I last, uh, since I last looked at it. Um, we have uh, attributes can carry over now when you level up. So like you're you're not gonna have to you're not forced to take dirty levels. Um, I'm pretty how can you sure have we an have... oblivion? How can you have an oblivion overhaul mod pack without Pat's mega dungeon mod? It's the superior <laughs> way to play the game. <laughs> yeah, so don't you want to run through fifty? Don't you want to run through like sixty dungeons just to get out to the thieves guild and then have the I have not, like, I've not gotten a report back from people who've played it and then tried to play a normal Oblivion on their save after they escape. So <laughs> I have no idea how it breaks the overworld Cyrodiil, but I'm going to imagine that it breaks some stuff. I didn't even know you could escape. Yeah, there's an end. <laughs> Does it prevent potion spam? Um, I don't think so. Uh, I'm trying to think. I think potions are a little bit more rare, though. Yeah, Oblivion uh, Radiant Loot is, like, super heavy on giving you potions of stuff. Yeah. Like, even worse than Skyrim is. I agree on the Oblivion faces. I think a lot of people overstate how bad they are. They're bad, but um, yeah, I, I get used to them pretty yeah. quickly. Yeah. It, it, there's like it a shock the value. Aesthetic. There's a there's a shock value at first when you're doing it, like when you're playing the game, and then like four hours later, it's like yeah, <laughs> it's just their faces, like they're fucking ugly. Who cares? <laughs> um, I talk a bit about the mod that I'm working on. Um, so I started with birth signs. Uh, the only I've added one birth sign so far, which is that it does nothing because a lot of the birth signs I've worked on have more drastic oh, changes that um. Right. I can imagine some people are going to want to opt out of birth signs entirely. Yeah, we gotta gotta give him that like surprised look. I don't know, like, um, ugly character faces only bother me if they're approaching like high levels of realism. So whenever there's an uh, like a particularly ugly Fallout Four NPC, that stands out way more to me than like oblivion faces in general and i think it's just because oblivion faces don't look human and so but they look human in the sense that like there's a part of your brain that pattern recognizes <laughs> human faces right? <laughs> that part of that part of my brain goes okay in this area like everybody has downs or something uh so like i could still pattern recognize that they're human and then eventually it's just um like i don't even consciously uh recognize that there's anything particularly wrong with their faces all right. I don't, I don't, I don't think Morrowind. Like... I don't think Morrowind faces look bad at all. There's some goofy ones, uh, like cross eye stuff or um, uh, just, uh, just plain looking bad. Wanna... But again, same thing with Morrowind. The, the, the difference with fun. Morrowind though is that there's not a huge oh. focus on people's faces, like there is in Oblivion. Like because Oblivion puts the face up front and center for everything. All right, there we go. You were in the console? Yeah, I was in the console. <laughs> Dark Adoring so fan. <laughs> was I was I doing that whole thing in the console? And then I, I must have been. 
Maybe you've, oh yeah, that's maybe that's why because I think I'm pretty sure pop ups can appear. Yeah, when wearing character creation, and uh, you were probably just in the console. All right, birth sign. I don't think anything changed these. I think uh, I think some of the spells got modified a little bit, but that, I mean, yeah, that sounds. I'm a. That sounds exactly what I'm doing. I'm a I'm a basic bitch. I generally prefer uh, just attribute buffs so i'm probably just going to do the thief 10 to agility speed and luck well hey i modified the thief in morrowind um so i'll tell you a bit about what the thief does in base in base morrowind just to kind of indicate why you've never picked it in any of your characters i know you haven't done that many playthroughs but um do you, okay let me ask you first do you know what the thief does in morrowind no. Okay. In Morrowind, the thief it gives you an ability that gives you sanctuary for ten seconds. Right. Or not ten seconds. It's ten points of sanctuary. Do you know what sanctuary does? No. <laughs> yeah, because nobody fucking knows what sanctuary does. It's <laughs> it's not a bad effect. It's just there's no circumstance where it's ever taught to the player what sanctuary is or why it's particularly valuable because it's a dodge multiplier. Oh, okay. So, like, it, you cast Sanctuary, and then there's, like, no visible effect of what it's actually doing, even uh, though <laughs> behind the scenes, it is actually it is actually doing something for you. Yeah. Um, high levels of Sanctuary make it impossible for enemies to hit you. Oh. Now, 10, point, 10 points is not a high level, but, like, if you max up, if you get 100 points of Sanctuary, which is the max, there's only, like, I think there's only, like, eight enemies in the game that can hit you at that point. <laughs> So I'm actually leaning towards picking the mage just because um, if I do the conjuration thing with this character, you're going to need magicka. Is yeah. magicka region changed at all? Um, I think it's slower. It's either slower or it's non-existent. You have to wait. Well, OK, so there's flavor text for the thief that says. Um... Those born under the sign of the thief are not particularly thieves, though they take risks more often and only rarely come to harm. They they will run out of luck eventually, however, and rarely live as long as those born under other signs. So it has flavor text that says that like uh, they take more risks and they rarely come to harm. Um, the sign like sanctuary doesn't really re reflect what the flavor text is supposed to be saying about the thief. So I made some changes to it. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go to the mage, honest, honestly, because agility and speed, 10, 10 extra, like I don't care about 10 extra points of luck, but agility and speed, I can come by those pretty quickly, so. So what I did was I changed it to where instead of it being a sanctuary spell, it's a permanent sanctuary effect on the player. So instead of having to consciously cast sanctuary at the start of every combat, uh, you're, you just, you're better at dodging. And, uh, but it comes at the cost of 10 health. But that's not the only thing it does. I added a spell to it. Well, it had a spell. So I added a passive, but the spell is uh, telekinesis. A very minor, like low level telekinesis. And that's the main thing that the health cost is uh, paying for, is to get your hands on level one telekinesis. Um, I thought it was passive in the base game. No, it is a... I thought it was a power. Is it an ability? Oh, well, then I didn't do anything. Uh, no, the the main change is the telekinesis. I thought I changed it. I think there's a different one I changed. Then I might be mixing up memories. I only brought up the thief because he's picking it. And I would like in an explanation of what all I changed, I would never start with the thief because it's like, what? You lose 10 health. What the fuck? Yeah, so I'm thinking, hmm, intelligence, agility, because I'm just trying to think what's going to be quickest to level, and if I'm going to be doing some magic, because I, li I like the conjuration idea, uh, conjuration and alchemy, so intelligence mm -hmm. works well with that. Uh, speed is a meme, I can get that pretty easily, all that's going to affect I is light you, armor I think anyways. You, so. I think you're getting speed from being a Bosmer too. Yeah, so... 
Yeah, I think intelligence and agility would be a good thing. Shadow's the one we added the passive to. Uh, is it? No. It, it, the, if the shadow is passive, that would mean you'd be permanently Kabillion. I'm not. I'm not giving making that a birth sign. Um, no. What I started with was the warrior. Now I think you know about this one because I, I might do illusion. Didn't you fall for the the warrior trap with your first character? Um. Yes. Yeah. So you picked the warrior, thinking that that for, that fortify attack is a good thing, and I let you do it. Um, so that I could then say, so you picked the warrior, huh? Well, did you know that the lady gives you 25 agility, <laughs> which equals 5% hit chance? Yeah, yeah. It's less than the 10% you get from the warrior, but that's also extra dodge chance and sneak and block and security. And, yeah. And fatigue and like all this shit. Like the lady is objectively superior to the warrior in Morrowind. Um, so I changed the warrior to give you 20% hit chance instead of 10% and 10 strength and 10 magic or resistance but you lose 10 agility and intelligence so the idea is that like you are playing a pure warrior if you pick oh, the wait. warrior oh illusion is actually good to... okay yeah yeah i'm gonna all right so this is this is what You're we're rolling use... with so we got alchemy conjuration illusion light armor marksman security and sneak i might be wondering what illusions for first off i need light spells because dungeons are gonna be dark as hell in this two um i can use illusion to use charm spells to get better prices and stuff with, I might be thinking uh, of the merchants lover. and everything like that, and trainers as well. So, yeah, L illusion actually ends up playing pretty well. Here's the problem: is half the flavor text is like half the names and flavor text don't make sense. So, like, why does the Lord make you a troll? <laughs> uh, yes, I have played Daggerfall before. Does the Warrior's Fortify attack bonus scale well, or does it not really matter as much if you're fighting like a Dremora Lord? I mean, 20% hit chance is pretty big. Um, the main reason that you're going to be picking up the Warrior, though, is going to be that plus 10 strength, plus 10 magic or resistance. All right, so what is my background? I think I should be um, an, acad adoring. an academic. What does this affect? Uh, it just affects some starting e equipment and stuff. Okay. Um, like craftsman's gonna start you with some repair hammers and stuff. It's not that big a change. Yeah, then academics probably gonna be the one because it'll probably start you with a mortar and pestle. Daedric worshippers is my primary research. <laughs> Necromantic practices. Battle magic, theoretical magic, Tamrielic history. I think, yeah, he's a he's a history major, all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's comfortably off. Sure, his parents, you know, paid for his college education and stuff. Uh, no diseases, no, please. All right, I think we're ready. And then, yeah, this is just at the amulet. It explains, just go to the, go to the, uh, the <laughs> sewers. <laughs> oh, you have it. I thought that happened in the flavor text. It's a dream of it happening. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. So what you, with all these books. So you poke your head in there, grab the Amulet of Kings, and you can do the main quest. Yeah. The only reason to do the main quest would be to get sigil stones. I tried getting a mod that delays like all the uh, all the DLC uh, pop ups, but it just would not work no matter how hard I tried. So we still got the, the spam. Um, I don't think this armor even does anything. Yeah, it's j just decorative. Is it really? What, yeah, there's it, no stats on it. Yeah, the armor, the armor that the uh, mod spawns you with. So that's wild. It it's, so it's it's clothes, and yeah. it, uh, it they no hang on hang on they start you with clothes that don't weigh anything. That's super powerful. <laughs> that's way better than the robes. <laughs> 
because dope. some of the some oh of the best yeah the ropes some of the best uh, clothing items in their game don't weigh anything. That's why they're the best. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can hold on to that then. Yeah, I mean it's not like it's taking up encumbrance. Yeah. So out the gate, UI change to uh, let you see more than six things at once. Yeah, yeah. So we got it. We got some small UI changes here. Uh, just let's to... open the map. Yep. There we go. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh yeah, so you can see a little bit more in the um in the inventory and stuff. Just more more readable, but it's not like a major overhaul or anything. Mm-hmm. They start you with a silver dagger. Did they start you with a mortar and pestle? No. That's that's interesting. Yeah. Interesting and weird. Keychain, I like the idea. Yeah. Um We have So these should all be the same. Um these should be the same starting stats. I don't think anything actually changes that. This I like. So this will explain all the different um perks that you get when you hit like a journeyman, master, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Oh. So yeah, the, that is a noticeably missing. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah, that gives you so much information. I love, it. <laughs> I love that Oblivion. There's like basic design principle changes that they could have made that would ju have made the game so much less of a headache. Yeah. <laughs> so don't worry, we have mods now. Um, I don't think. I think it's still, uh, what is it, 10 skill ups to level up or something? Oh no, I'm sorry. Levels are actually slower. Um, I think it actually takes double the amount of skills to level up. And that's one of the ways it gets around uh, the level scaling creep. Hmm. So instead of tackling level scaling, it just slows it by... Uh... Well, it, it also tackles level scaling, but that's another thing that it uses to like slow it down and stuff. And smooth out the, uh, smooth out the experience more. So what I like to do is just head right off to um, fan favorite Vilferin. Oh yeah, um, no fast travel. To, you have to, or no fast travel to locations right out of the gate. You have to go and actually explore them. Right. I was gonna say no fast travel. <laughs> yeah, no, not not in this game. I was, was so I played Oblivion recently to do that little clip show I showed, and I like was running around looking for an Oblivion gate Might to get well. the Oblivion gate footage. Um, oh wait, and okay. uh, it, it was reminding me of like there's components of Oblivion that I actually really like in terms of its world design, particularly the way that it spaces stuff out. We have um, more hotkeys. This this mod is also very nice. Oh yeah, did it did it change your beast tongue power? Um. Command creature up to level five for sixty seconds. No, that's the same. Yeah, dang. But it shouldn't fall off as fast if you're not going to level up as quickly. Yeah. It, um. Actually, yeah. I might as well put that on then. Yeah, you could probably avoid the occasional annoying wolf fight. I mean, wolves aren't bad. The problem with animal fights is that when mountain lions and bears start showing up. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we could and even... not that they show up, but that in getting the footage for the for Indigo's stream yesterday, I ran through that cave and there was like at least seven bears in it, which I just ran past them because that was that was actually my uh, my Oblivion video character. Any anytime you've seen Oblivion footage for me post Oblivion video, it's the Oblivion video character. There's like this small, there's like this save that keeps incrementing and it's just me go, running around recording footage. <laughs> I did call. Alright. Oblivion, or sorry, Morrowind races. Let's look at it. Yeah, I can change race stats. Cool. Let's look at Dark Elves. What's the point uh, of making oh, race powers that right. if, if they don't scale up with the person? I was exactly lamenting that you can't make uh, powers and abilities 
in Morrowind that scale with character level because something like the tower like is either overwhelmingly OP out the gate or just completely falls off after level three. Are you going to be ordering pizza through Oblivion? Uh, no, I'm lactose intolerant. I can't eat pizza. Um, so another change is to uh, how fatigue affects like everything now and how it regens and stuff. So running around jumping all the time is actually not a good idea. So what is the difficulty setting at? Because this is like heavily balanced. We played like no higher than normal difficulty. So this is going to be interesting because I do not... I might just console command myself a bow and arrow. No, 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 no. You got to earn it. <laughs> just look for bandit. Some bandit's going to have it. Yeah, I know, I know where... I'm going to Vilverin so I can get outfitted. It's basically it. So you're I, telling me when I when I come to New York, you're not gonna you're not gonna treat me to a pie. You can have a pie. I can't. <laughs> so chat for anybody that's Morrowind familiar, uh, where do we start with rebalancing Morrowind races? I don't know if what I want to tackle. What's the worst race, like race gender combo in Morrowind? Uh oh. Can I find a place where I can uh, rest? Let's look at race skills. So. Wood elves, wood elves are bad in general in Morrowind. I've got decent usage out of Wood Elves. What you need to do is use them as archers. Because they start high agility, high speed. So, like, if you're not running around using a bow, there's no reason to play Bosmer. Have you managed to add block missing miss animations? See, this is why talking about this is so tough with people. Like... I'm changing numbers behind the scene. I can't... I'm not adding new functionality to the game. Yeah. Rebalance the economy and the enchanting system. So in my... Uh, Vivek... Kill Vivek without leaving the city of Vivek challenge, I thought about banning alchemy, uh, particularly respawning alchemy vendors, until I realized that it's really not a problem because you can't just yoink Master's Alchemy sets from Caldera in that challenge. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> so there's you really don't need to ban it. I do ban... Uh, the challenge does specifically ban the Dark Brotherhood Assassins, though. So... Uh, you have to disable them. You can either turn off Tribunal, which I don't like doing, or there's some console commands that you could do to just disable them. That's can you make the different races have right different base speeds? Through. They do have different base speeds. I think Bosmer's problem, if I remember right, in Morrowind, running speed oh, no. is running speed is affected by weight. And I think Bosmer's are Oh no, my agility is being drained. That's not good. So it's ironic. Bosmers do like, like by default both genders have uh, 50 speed, but they are lower weight, meaning that they end up running slower than uh, they, they end up running slower anyway. So the speed benefit that you get from playing Bosmers will not, not noticeable because of their size. Robot Pat. Oh no, that sucks. Because I have to explain that again. <laughs> Just give it a second. All right, chat, tell me if I'm a robot. No, no, it's a Discord thing. Yeah, it's a Discord OBS thing. You just got, it just got weeded out. I have no idea why. And it's only I, on only on my system. 
I rejoined and I changed the Discord region. I have no clue what, what causes it for you. So anyways, um, the way that speed, like racial, racial speed works in Morrowind is that weight affects it. You might be familiar with, um, I think it's Skyrim, like Altmer, the fastest race because they're the tallest. Yeah. So in Morrowind, it's weight. Now, I don't understand why there's a fucking weight stat in Morrowind. I don't know. I don't know if they were going to have like some kind of like eating system that you could change your weight. And I don't know why being heavier makes you faster. Wait, but what? yes, being heavier makes you faster. <laughs> Meaning that uh, in terms of racial weight, I think uh, like male Nords. No, no, no. Male orcs have the highest weight. Um, but they get they get a speed penalty, so they get a speed boost from being the heaviest, and then they get a speed penalty, and it like I don't know why because some <laughs> races are just supposed to be faster and slower. I don't know why there's this extra weight system that's affecting things. But, anyways, I think that's kind of the first racial edit I'm gonna make. Maybe it's like weight is muscle mass. Who knows? <laughs> All right, so um, I basically got to rush the archer and grab their bow. Oh, no. Nope, I feel like weight is backwards in Morrowind. Yes, it, it's very strange. And they have multiple systems that are describing the same things, which are like, Orcs are slow and lumbering, and they're also heavy, and that makes them slower. And it's like, yeah, you could have the speed stat or you could have the weight stat. And since speed is an attribute that affects other things and can be leveled up and changed and stuff, I don't see the point of having a weight I'm just gonna, attribute. It's gonna have to. Oh no. Oh, this isn't good. Does weight influence other things too? I don't think so, but it doesn't hurt to look. Sadly, we still have Oblivion AI, so, you know. I think there is, there was some tweaks no. to make them, like, this dude's gonna keep trying to run away because I'm chasing him. Oh, God. Oh, no. Why is the mud crab attacking me but not them? Why is it... Life isn't fair. Okay, okay, it's going after, it's going after the hammer dude now. Find any humorous coder notes? I don't typically stick my head in the script part of the CS. Um, I did today look at some Todd Howard code, though. Alright. I, 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 I just need to kill this dude. That's... Please. Oh, oh, his... His thing broke. Oh, no, he switched to his fists and he's more effective with his fists. Oh, no. <laughs> it probably did break. Yeah, I, th I think his dagger broke. I heard it. Hmm. I think weight is just for some races to be inherently slower or faster, but why would it make sense that orcs that orcs are faster than All right. Why didn't you run private sessions because dying is easier, I guess. This isn't a hardcore run, so. Yeah. You might want to enter the fight with more stamina just so that when he decides to just beat your ass, you don't uh, get knocked down. Oh man, they already detected me. I'm also like diseased. I don't remember if these things cure diseases or not. Whoever did the uh, racial attribute system in Morrowind, I think did a fine balanced job of giving the player a decent number of like options. All right, nice, they're split up now. Stephen A. Smith went on ESPN and had a great rant about Morrowind. You got to give more context than that. I love I, I love the notion of um, only, only seven arrows. I better make some, it count. Someone fucking going on ESPN and complaining about Morrowind. <laughs> Why are there multiple arrow types? Um, one was just equipped, and then one and the quiver wasn't or something like that. I'm not a huge coding person. I've done some code for fun. Um, I will put this out there for any coders in the chat. 
uh, Todd Howard's coding style is basically a series. Morrowind scripts, by the way, are this like language that are is specific to the engine, but it's basically C. Uh, Todd Howard's coding style is a series of else if statements, but each else if statement ends by advancing a state as well. And there's no like he never like I don't know if it supports functions or not. Um, so like that guard that walks in Morrowind when you start the game there's that guard that walks down to the deck and gets you like each leg of that is manually coded to tell him where to walk and so like I was messing with his speed trying to like speed up that encounter and then it would end up uh, it, it didn't affect anything because like he's scripted to take a set amount of time to get to you um, <laughs> is Yandev coder does, so Yandere Dev does that that is funny. I, I feel like when I was like learning about coding, I was like discouraged from just using oh, a series it. of else if statements. I do like this this dungeon uh, darkness change. Yeah. Um, okay. I know. So, I know there was a joke going around about him doing a chess mini game by manually putting in each uh, each possible combination of the chessboard. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think that was real though. How many? Con how many chessboard combinations do exist? Yeah, I, I need uh I need night eye. There should be a cheap night eye in uh Edgar's discount spells. There is estimated it is estimated there are between ten to the one hundred and eleventh power and ten to the one hundred and twenty third power positions. There we go. That's that's the stuff right there, those sneak attacks. Yeah, you gotta be careful with um uh hand hand people in this game uh with this mod because <laughs> it's uh pretty freaking powerful okay for reference apparently there are 10 to the 78th power to 10 to the 82nd power number of atoms in the observable universe Yandere Dev became famous because his source code consists of completely else if instead of switch statements, and he excused himself saying that he doesn't have formal uh, computer science education. <sighs> I don't have a fucking formal computer science education, and I know that like a series of else if statements seems like a really bad idea. Because to me, what it seems like is going to happen is that something's going to there's going to be an error in one of your statements and then it's never going to advance the state and the co the rest of the code will just break all right and then what we do when we get detected we send out the minion and more arrows <laughs> i'm just going to take the ones she's shooting at me with nice Uh, I need that arrow, so can I please have that back? Thank you. So, um... Any other famous... I, I, What I need to do this mod is, like, uh, data on how, like, how people are playing the game. So, like, when I do a release version, I am gonna, like, um... I am going to ask like when people give feedback to post their like character sheets just to see what what's popular and what people are picking and what's what people think is viable. Yeah. What microphone do you use? Uh, I use a Shure SM7B, the 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 meme one the, that yeah, uh, meme Joe one. Rogan uses. The Joe Rogan yeah microphone because I'm that... in my, I'm in my fifties.
the thing is, from what I know in Unity, the environment itself optimizes it, so it's not because of lag, how some people claimed it to be. Unity self optimizes. That's a uh, that's a statement. Indigo has an SM7B as well. Your sounds nice and smooth. Do you have a good amp? Um, I have a um, I have a cloud lifter, which is like an inline amp, and I just plug that into a Focusrite two i two, and I am using a bunch of like compressors, equalizers, blah 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 in OBS right now. Hello. Yeah, stealth, uh, stealth archery though. When I when I'm actually able to do it. Oh god, I can't see him, but he can see me. <laughs> All right. I have a lot of problems with my focus. Right, two i two. Had a weird bug, it would turn me into a robot after streaming for four hours. I heard it was a rare bug, though. It was tied to which version of the Focusrite you had. And it was a Focusrite driver issue. Because really? I had the same thing. Yeah. If you had one of the one of the older, like, version 2 Focusrites, I think that was the one that had the issue. I don't know. There's a, there's a good version and a bad version. I think there's somebody standing there. Yeah. It's like I've done this dungeon a million times before. <laughs> oh, poor lady, her shoes were broken. Yeah, no, my focus right woes were fixed by uh, not using a focus right. Actually, I do still use it for recordings, but you know those sessions aren't uh, particularly long, so it, it doesn't have to last long enough to uh it doesn't have to survive for a particular amount of time how does that even happen what is it like a caching Hang issue on. i don't know okay so i just learned something about morrowind and uh i am fucking flabbergasted <laughs> all right in morrowind there is an upper limit on the number of skills that a race can have as a buff you can't just keep adding races that get buffed. There, You can only have um, seven racial skills in Morrowind in their engine. Seven racial skills total or like per character? No, like uh, when you know racial bonuses, the skills, you can only set seven of them. This is from the UESP. No, this is from I'm like looking at the engine right now and it literally will not let me add an eighth. Oh. I'm not talking like the presets. The preset, like, the preset definition is probably just because they're like, okay, we've set it up to where there's going to be seven, and so we don't need to add functionality for anybody to ever in the future add more, which I, I'm probably not mm -hmm. going to add more, but like, that is a very strange, that's a very oh, bizarre wait, limitation that I'm running into. Keep spamming the uh spell the light spell old old engine jank no i can totally see what happened which is just that um the most like there are four races in morrowinds that have seven uh seven skills and then like they they figured out that balance said this is what we need on their design doc and then they were like you got it added that and then like that's it yeah once again um this is still a bolivian ai so their detection is kind of weird. I, I genuinely thought it was like broken from the mods, but then I tested vanilla Oblivion and they're also just really stupid. So sometimes they'll detect you if you have a light spell, sometimes they won't. It's it's Oblivion. Can you set all of them to plus 15? You can set all of them to whatever you want. I don't I don't know if the numbers will go negative. In the editor it goes negative. <laughs> so Hmm. No, damn it, I've changed it and now I don't remember what Widow's acrobatics bonus is. Five. So you could actually make a race worse at stuff. 
by default. The problem is with only seven skills, I can't say, oh yeah, orcish orcs, they're just bad at magic across the board because there's not enough skill slots for me to like add a minus five. Ah, yes, the zombie, the zombie tank. There were ether dynamics updates. Oh, he hasn't he hasn't done anything since the last time I saw him. I mean, he's released stuff before. Oh. Are you I'm able to make to stat ranges at all? Maybe you could make it so like certain things can go over 100. Um, that might be in the game settings. Something just attacked me for a split second. Like, there's all kinds oh. of interesting game settings I could mess with, but right now I'm just focused on, like, minor tweaks to rebalance character creation, and then after that I'll add stuff that's, like, in the middle of the game. Oops. I'd like to be able to see. Probably the closest you can get is a custom spell effect with negative skill fortify. That That's basically what you would have to do is add a racial ability that reduces whatever skills past produces or fortifies whatever skills you want past seven it's just a really like they have a they have a built-in system because the difference will be that any skills that are raised or lowered by racial power rather than skill bonus will have uh, a red or white symbol instead of the normal like inlaid like normal yellow color All right, I might. I think I have to take a break for a bit. I have to do something. Um, might be gone for a bit. So I can entertain chat. Yeah. Do you want me to set up like a watch together again, and you could just hijack the stream yeah. for like ten minutes? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I thought that worked really well last time. Um, I can set up but, a watch together. We can watch a an interview. Yeah, but um. Yeah, I gotta, Get a little I gotta in. take care of something real fast, so. See, this is this is the benefit of the co-streaming uh mm -hmm. dynamic. Alright, chat, so oh, this is El what? Elon Musk. HGTV? No. Why did that just pop up? Okay. No, watch together. All right. Uh, the chat is praying for your safe return. All right. So our options are we've got. Um, All right. So here's the. Uh, I wish I could get good previews. Invalid access code. Do not show. Uh, is there, am I showing anything in here that I don't want to be showing? Uh, no, not really. Invalid access code, it said. Mm hmm. Um, am I messing something up here? You are showing the invite code to the watch together so anybody could join. Oops. Yeah, you want to make <laughs> this frame bigger so people can't see it and then make a new watch together. Hold on. Whatever, I think I screwed up that uh that lobby anyways. Uh, all right, try uh this one. All right. All right. Uh, can I full screen this? 
I would just make it bigger so that when you unfull screen it, it doesn't show the watch together link again. Make what bigger? The uh... so just scale it up in OBS. Mm, okay. So it's just the the video frame of a of a smaller window. How do I even scale it up without switching to the scene? Um, click on it in the scenes, and you should see a red like a red outline around it, no, and then just scale that up. Still... I think I still flash the uh, link. Well, just open it and then uh, make it bigger there since you've shown it and uh, make a new lobby in the background. Oh, yeah, okay. Don't worry, I got to pick out which interview I, I want to poison myself with. Yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to scale it up like that. There we go, that. Yeah, like that. That was what I was recommending. Where is my ESO Necron Let's Play? Oh god, do not. <laughs> do not. Do you, do you want me to go insane? Yeah, ask Zarek. <laughs> Zarek's the one that will tolerate that shit. Alright. So our options are the kind of funny interview and the IGN interview. Hey, the Lex Friedman one, but the, with the Lex Friedman one, I kind of want to know what the good timestamps are because I'm not going to watch all of it. Okay, uh, let's see. Now we will give you guys sound. I'll make sure this volume is like half. So it shouldn't be too overpowering. Can we watch Maddie cover Starfield? No, because Maddie is Maddie knows as much as I do, and so what the fuck? What? <laughs> it didn't save the the scaling. Really? Yeah. Unless I was scaling the wrong. No, I was scaling the window. All right. I wasn't in dis Oh, I was in I was in display. Oh, all right. One more time. <laughs> Professional here. You have like multiple scenes and you, like you showed one that's just display capture. Yep. So volume is good. I'll drop it down a little bit more. Okay, so I'm gonna do the IGN interview. This is display. All right. Here is the final link. <laughs> Invalid access code. <laughs> what the? F did I copy the wrong one? I did. Cool. Now go. All right. I hope what you're doing is going to take like 30 seconds because that's going to make this whole venture funny. No, no, no. I'm going to be gone for like 10, 15 minutes. Otherwise, we're right. bothered. All right. Let's just make sure that it's working. Yep. Looks like Firefox. You guys got audio and stuff. Hey, everybody. Ryan McCaffrey with IGN. I'm All right. chat can we get some confirmation that you guys are good that's all i can i can hear it okay i'm just sweet. on the stream all right sweet um i'll be back it might be quiet chat i don't have volume control so i'm joined by my good game development friend todd howard good to see you again it is oh this is only 27 minutes that's a uh, probably the most surprising part of this interview i thought i thought i was walking into a 90 minute interview
And you know what's funny is he's he's gotten like three interviews with Todd at this point. So I have to like specify IGN interview from 2023 with Todd. Ryan's going to grill him, not going to softball it. It's good to see you. Uh, we chatted a year ago remotely, and you shared some Starfield details with me there. Uh, things are a little different now because the game is imminent. I played it for about an hour. We just watched, we're recording this the day before, but everybody will have just seen the 45-minute Starfield Direct. Uh, there's a lot to get to, though. There's a lot going on with this. So I want to just kind of start at the top, and we'll kind of work our way uh, down to more nitty-gritty details. Uh, I wonder what they let them play. Did you see the kind of funny interview with Phil Spencer? They did an interview with Phil Spencer too. I can't control subtitles. And I am speeding it up because I want to get to the meat. This is like the fucking... This is the introduction. So there's literally nothing that's going to be gleaned from here. This is the first new IP you've done in a couple of decades now. It's been a little while. So totally new thing. Uh, the Tenth Planet? It was like... No, I think the Tenth Planet was uh, more than 20 years ago. It's the biggest exclusive Microsoft in a long I'm d I'm giving it some thought. I'm trying to imagine what a one hour vertical slice that they gave journalists was going to be. Maybe they get just gave them that planet. It's called Crete. Um, that planet that was in the 2022 showcase. Certainly the biggest thing Microsoft's put out since they acquired Bethesda. So in all seriousness, like, do you kind of feel any extra pressure compared to any of the other games you've made, or you just kind of you kind of focus on what you do? I'm just sort of curious if, if this They're using okay, he, he's using weird music in the background. Hang on. Let me turn it to one time speed. Turn up my audio just a bit. Long time. Uh, and it's Okay. This music, when it's at two times speed, sounds like Morrowind music. When it's at two times speed and I kind of can't hear it. I was hearing like the Moro and uh, the horn that plays in some of the exploration tracks. And I was like, what are they playing like Morrowind music on an IGN interview? No. I can't enable I can't enable captions on my side. I will slow it down when he gets to anything that's actually like when he asks Todd a question, basically. Since they acquired. So pressure. <laughs> do you in all seriousness, like do you any of the other games you've made or you just kind of Kind of focus on what you do. I'm just sort of curious if, if the stuff that like we talk about in the gaming community is something that goes through your head or gets talked about in the office at all. Well, clear. That's such Ryan. That's such a long question. I have to summarize it as: Do you feel any pressure? Uh, just do you feel any pressure? That's kind of how I would summarize that question he asked. Starfield has Morrowind motifs. No, they're using some. I think they're using some kind of like uh, generic, uh, royalty free music in the background. Clearly, you know, I'm, I'm aware of that, you know, everything you said. Um, and compared to our previous games, there's always a lot of attention on, on what we do. We're, we're very fortunate. And, but for us, it, it's, we have put so much into this game. And it is, as you said, you know, our first new IP in over 25 years. It's our first major release in about eight years. Yeah. So for us... Eight years. Their first major release in eight years. Okay, that's going in the fucking... That's going in the fucking notes. That's going... That's going to be uh, in the... That's going to be in the... Oh, Bethesda didn't actually make Fallout 76 section of the video. Our first major release in eight years. Fallout 70 what? Fallout 76 was clearly only a very minor side project. That's the weird thing. Okay, so there were three Bethesda games that have been released since Fallout 4. Technically, uh, Blades, Fallout Shelter, Fallout 76. Fallout shelter was a it was handed to a contract studio that makes mobile games in general so there were a couple bethesda personnel that did help with that 
uh, particularly like art, the artists that do all the the Fallout Boy artwork. Yeah, those guys. That guy worked on on Fallout Shelter, but I'm fair to say that like no, Bethesda did not make Fallout Shelter. Blades. There was more participation from Bethesda on Blades, but I do think I still don't think that that counts. And even if it did count, it's not like a major release. Another mobile game. Um, Fallout seventy six absolutely was made by Bethesda Maryland. By eight years, he means since Fallout Shelter, right? Fallout Shelter was twenty fifteen, I think, right? I know Fallout four was twenty fifteen. And I know Blades is 2018. It's so weird. Like you would think that like we'll have Fallout Shelter in 2016, and then Blades in 2017, and then Fallout 76 in 2018. Um, so I'm gonna go back a bit. Um, because Todd's saying a lot of things, and would have it. Uh, there's probably like multiple interesting statements here. We're gonna talk. Well, clearly, you know, I'm, I'm aware of that, you know, everything you said. Yeah, so it starts with a softball question. He's like, are you, do you feel, uh, you guys can't see my notes, so you might not remember, anybody that doesn't remember the question, it's, do you feel any pressure? Yeah, of course, Todd's, like, familiar with uh, the what people are saying about his games, but that this doesn't answer to the extent that he knows about it. So it could be anything from, yeah, I've seen every major video made about the games that my company has made. Or it could be, yeah, I read all the top IGN reviews. <laughs> um, and compared to our previous games, there's always a lot of attention on, on what we do. We're, we're very fortunate. Okay, so that treatment, that statement doesn't track. And he's doing this on the spot. So it's it's fine if there's... Like, I've noticed I do a lot of non sequiturs with my statements. It's very frustrating when I put together podcasts and I'm like listening to myself talk. And it's like, dude, where are you going with this thought process? Like, you were talking about this and now you're talking about something that's completely different. You never re resolved the thought that was in the previous statement. And it's like, I can't fix this. I can't like record, like, it's not a pre scripted video. So I can't just add in an insert that clarifies something. I just have to be like, I have to live with my scattershot brain. So it's fine that he does this, but he is like he is side shifting for a second because these two thoughts um aren't connected. That, you know, everything you said. Um and compared to our previous games. So he starts with compared to our previous games. There's always a lot of attention on, on what we do or there's always a lot of attention on what we do. Those those thoughts really aren't connected he's what he, what he's doing is he's pivoting the question from do you feel pressure about this to i just don't understand what he's um what he's saying with this because which games because obviously he's not acknowledging the fallout 76 exists in this answer because he's about to say that this is their first major game in eight years so that implies that like Oh, yeah, the last thing that we did that anybody talked about was Fallout 4. Let him finish the sentence before deconstructing it. Are we really like you must not be uh, one of my stream viewers like because here's the problem, OK? Here's the problem with that sentiment. I'm going to turn him up, turn him on, on high speed for a second. Todd Howard's about to blow through like four different disconnected ideas, and you're going to forget at least three of them by the end of his statement. You know, I'm, I'm aware of that, you know, everything you said. Um, and compared to our previous games, there's always a lot of attention on, on what we do. We're, we're very fortunate. And but for us, it, it's we have put so much into this game. And it is, as you said, you know, our first new IP in over 25 years, it's our first major release in about eight years. Yeah. See, see how much he's already said in just a short amount of time that like, you would kind of gloss over if you were just letting him finish his sentence. You have to take it part by part because Todd Howard will go all over the place. I think, can I pin stuff in chat? I can't pin stuff in chat. Otherwise, I would pin in chat that I can't affect the volume and I can't turn on the subtitles. I have a limited capacity. It's, it's unfortunate, but I am like trying to summarize what he's saying for those who can't hear it. Um, 
But yeah, it's like so Todd Howard's going to go through five has gone through five different ideas where he's asked, does he feel pressure? He's talked about how people talk about his games, how that's fortunate, um, how this is their first new IP and this how this is their first major release in eight years. And chances are pretty good. I'm going to bet you forgot that he even said that this is their new IP first new IP in 25 years. So like you do have to take it sentence Hello? by sentence. Oh, you're back. Yes. We didn't get through a f the first question. <laughs> <laughs> so let me finish this question and then um, we can get back to what we were doing. Okay. Uh, why don't Ryan, we'll start with this. St I'll tell you what he asked and we'll start at the start, the beginning of the question. He's basically asked him, do you feel pressure on this particular development or on this particular project? Do you to past games? Todd Howard, do you feel pressure knowing that your game, the S Starfield is literally the linchpin for Microsoft games uh entire, basically it's existence. Now everything is riding on this game. And can you turn up the volume so Chad can hear it? Yes. Ed, or gets talked about in the office at all. Well, clearly, you know, I'm, I'm aware of that, you know, everything you said. Um, and compared to our previous games, there's always a lot of attention on, on what we do. We're, we're very fortunate. And, but for us, it, it's... Oh, by the way, I'm going to let him respond so fully. This game. And it is, as you said, you know, our first new IP in over 25 years. It's our first major release in about eight years. Yeah. What? So for us, we have just yep. put Let so him finish. much into Let it him. <laughs> um, that we're just doing everything we can to make the best game that we can. Hope that everybody loves it. So um, we feel we're on, we're on the right track. Um, and we're, we're really fortunate, I think, with some of those things you said to, to get the attention. Yeah. Um, and that there are, we know there's a lot of people out there looking forward to it. And we just view our job as, you know, hey, just do the best job we can do put everything we can into the game and uh, hope everyone loves it ready to lift off when you are captain so todd howard just spoke for a minute straight and said the only thing that, that i got out of that is that fallout 76 did not happen yes and there was like eight different uh like kind of disconnected approaches to the question that didn't really answer like are you feeling pressure yeah i think i think todd howard was asking him like todd howard was answering the question what do you think of how much attention your games get? Yeah. Not, do you feel added pressure? Because, I mean, Ryan's softballing him, right? An actual journalist would, like, go in and say, so, after Fallout 76, do you feel any particular pressure with Starfield's development um, from, a, like, the journalist angle? That's that's the question I would ask him. Um, so... Yeah, because there was somebody in chat who like didn't understand why I was taking Todd Howard's response sentence by sentence, because Todd Howard, like, he, he, yeah, and it's not his fault. He, he's given a live response, but I think Todd Howard rehearsed for a different question than what he's answering. Yeah, they probably did send him the, the questions ahead of time, too. So he probably saw that he probably got asked a different question here or like they just worded it differently yeah um but yeah the main thing i noted in that was that uh Fallout this is their 76. first yeah this is their first major release in eight years you know that so. the game where most of the people who were credited on fallout 4 also were in the same positions in fallout 76 um mm -hmm. yeah that's that that just didn't happen all right Man, so uh we can go back to oblivion now that's pretty uh, for, for the for the person who late joined, we were just watching the Starfield interview during his break. Yeah. You just keep this open in the background in mm -hmm. case you need another break. And uh, we can do more. All right, let's see. Because anything I do here is what I don't have to do tomorrow. True. Okay, so I see this is a little bit off. Let's go ahead and fix that. All right. Fallout 76 is a spinoff game. It doesn't count as a mainline. I agree that it is a spinoff game. That's actually the basis for why I think that um, it's allowed to do the no NPC things, because that was one of the big counter arguments to me was, well, it's a Fallout game and Fallout games have always had NPCs. And my response to that is because it's a side title, it doesn't have the same expectations that Fallout 5 would have. Yeah. 
Um, I think Fallout 76 absolutely counts as a major release, especially given how much they bragged about all of the different studios that they were dragging into the process. And um, no, it's absolutely a fucking major release just because it's a side like ESO is ESO is also a side title and it's yeah. also a major release. <laughs> it's not one of Bethesda's major releases, but it is major. And because it's a side title, it's able to do things differently that it wouldn't get away with if it was titled Elder Scrolls 6. And 76 was supposed to be the ESO of Fallout. So, yeah, so I think the argument that like they can't they can't do the whole no NPCs thing because it's Fallout, I think that's fucking silly. It's a side it's a side game. So I think they're allowed to try weird stuff like that. I encourage it to try weird stuff like that. Yeah. Because the alternative is Wastelanders. <laughs> well, I think the, the problem is that they just there, there's so much there was so much that was going on with Fallout seventy six. It, it's so hard to like um like if the game was actually you know feature complete and not oh. so nearly buggy at launch, would people have made such a big deal about there being no NPCs? I mean, Sorry, I'm sure so there would have been, there still would have been people who would have complained about that, but I don't, I, I just don't know. Someone asked me earlier if I had seen the, the Pete, the Phil Spencer interview um, on Kind of Funny. So mentally in my head, I replaced Phil Spencer with Pete Hines and immediately disregarded that there could be any useful information in it. <laughs> Absolutely link me to the Phil Spencer Kind of Funny interview because I will. I heard, I heard that one was pretty, uh. That was pretty, I, I, pretty raw. I might watch that. Like, maybe we'll watch it on your stream because you're kind of more like general Microsoft. It's, mm -hmm. it's since it's not, it's a general Microsoft interview rather than a I really Starfield want, interview. I, I, I really want to do a stream where, uh, where I go through like the, the FTC, the, all the, yeah, all the, the FTC stuff. stuff. Yeah. Cause it's, it's, there's so much stuff that I've missed and everything. And it's like, I just keep finding new information and it's just, it's incredible. It really is. Like Sony right. just you sent me that thing earlier today that Sony had that had that shit leaked because somebody forgot to somebody used the wrong type of Sharpie. So like when they scanned it in, the redacted stuff was still visible. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, by the way, Sony had a leak in the FTC proceedings. What a what a shit show. I love i I want the FTC to sue more people in the uh, in the games industry. No. So I am loving how much information is coming out about Microsoft and Sony. Yeah. I, I want this kind of, like, I would love to get this kind of thing for the seventh gen. Yeah. You've talked a bit about that. Yeah, yeah. Just when the real, like, bloodthirsty stuff was going on. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is, uh, this is up there in terms of console war eras, uh, for stupid shit that's going on. Yeah. But the, the dumbest part of the console war is that consoles as a business product are fucking terrible. Like, I don't understand why they're fighting this hard over something that has such a low margin of profit. <laughs> You're talking like Microsoft and Sony in general or just the game? Yeah. Division? Yeah. I think there's synergy to it. And I think they're seeing like the growth that games have. So they're willing to absorb like the. Uh, the I don't know if you're louder than you were before, but you might be like blowing out the chat. Oh, am I? I didn't. I didn't touch anything, but I can trim my mic down a bit. No, it, it sounds even. So. Oh, okay. All right. I'll just turn you down. Would you ever try to get Mark Kern? for a conversation um i don't know if i have good questions to ask him i need to work on my interview game before i grab people <laughs> wait consoles i thought the ftc thing is about microsoft buying activision no it's about it's about it's largely about exclusivity yes the Activision acquisition is at the core of the issue, but the whole thing the whole thing that Sony's having an issue with is if Call of Duty goes Xbox exclusive. Okay, so got a dono if we can go over the uh Todd Howard eight year game thing again. 
Basically, they're just pretending Fallout 76 didn't happen. Yes, um, and for those, like, this is a, a somewhat, I'm not going to say somewhat uncommon piece of misinformation. Not common, but not rare. Uh, for those who don't know, there are three companies that are called Bethesda. Bethesda Gameworks, or Gameworks? Softworks. Bethesda's so, yep. Softworks, which is uh, the publishing arm of Bethesda. Um, they have nothing to do with the game development. So when you see Bethesda's name on Dishonored, that doesn't mean that Todd Howard worked on Dishonored. Uh, that means that Bethesda owns Arcane, which they call themselves Bethesda. I'm not sure what the exact relationship is, but basically Bethesda Softworks is the name that comes out when they want to be positively associated with news. And when it's negative news, they're Zenimax. Yeah. <laughs> then you have two game studios that are called Bethesda. Now, this is a fairly recent thing, recent-ish, if your last memory of Bethesda was like Fallout 4, right? Um, you have Bethesda Maryland, which is the Bethesda that made the game we're seeing right now. They've made all the games that you're pretty much familiar with. And you have Bethesda Austin, which is like a newer satellite studio. It's not an Arcane Lions, Arcane Austin situation where they're actually just two separate studios that are under the same umbrella. It is like just Bethesda Austin is the B team of Bethesda. Um, a common piece of misinformation is that Bethesda Maryland had nothing to do with Fallout 76, that it was entirely the creation of this new rogue team, and that's why it was so bad. Um, no, Bethesda Maryland, most most of the people that were in management level positions for the Fallout 76 project have credits in Fallout 4. Which, like, holy shit, talk about throwing your, your like, people under the bus, right? Well, yeah, that's Bethesda's whole MO is... Uh, but if it sucks, Bethesda Austin made it. If it's great, Bethesda Maryland made it. <laughs> if it's a if it's an interview they want to do, Todd Howard does it. If it's an interview they don't want to do, yeah. Pete Hines does it. There's always some there's always some kind of fall guy that they have that, whose job is just to take blame for stuff so that they can maintain this integrity of the Bethesda brand. Yeah. So, yeah, anyways, um, that's the whole we haven't made a major game in eight years thing. Fallout 76 is absolutely a major game. More people worked on it than Fallout 4. Um, and the Bethesda Maryland team also worked on it. Oh, man. Like, as I pointed out in the video, Farah was a uh, was a quest designer on Fallout 4 turned lead quest designer on Fallout 76 and then lead designer for the maintenance period. So like even after it was officially handed over to Austin, there were still Maryland employees tied up in it. Because Bad One also has a credit on Starfield. So, how is this character progressing? I gotta get this, get this have rectified. Had, that disease. Have you had any major skill ups yet? Um, I ha I've had a, a decent number. Okay, yeah. So yeah, yeah, we're we're cruising along here. Well, you know, because leveling up is just so much less ceremonious. <laughs> yeah. Do I touch classes? What's have, the problem? I don't think there's tried? any way that you can make default classes in Morrowind good. Right, I gotta, I gotta run over there. Have you tried Douglas Goodall's Morrowind mod? What the fuck? What is this? It's a slaughterfish. It's a slaughterfish out of water. What the fuck? 
there's been a catastrophic issue. What's... I've never seen this before. It's also like doing the fish out of water thing. Is that... Is that just like a serendipitous bug? Or did they actually animate the slaughterfish to have like an out of water animation? Um, let's, let's look. <laughs> slaughterfish. Let's ask the UESP first. What the fuck? It just did like a backflip. What? I have played this game. I, I think I might have like about 4,000 hours in this game. I have never seen this. On rare occasions, slaughterfish have been found out of water, bouncing and flailing around on dry land. What? What? Yeah, so you learn something new every day. I think it's because <laughs> um, slaughterfish and morrowinds, like, they just kind of turn off when it comes to land. Oh, stuff. so maybe... Disable the bush? Yeah, disable the bush. Oh no. You just disable the wrong thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it's. Easy fix, easy fix. I, I don't. You don't know which, which one's the bush? Yeah. You might need to try near the stem. Oh, yeah, yeah, maybe. Um... Yeah, there we go. Oh, I gotta get rid of this one too. Oh, maybe I can just move him. What the fuck? Oh, that's so... that That's so weird. Uh, there's an Oblivion animation in the base game that the player will rarely do. If you're idle. <laughs> I, I guess I should help him out, right? Like... It's kind of cruel to just leave him out here. Oh no. I'm having trouble hitting him. I think he's like trying to attack me too or something. <laughs> uh, if you if you switch to the watch together, I'll I'll throw up the, the uh idle animation. Alright. Holy crap, I'm glad I was recording that. Alright, so we'll switch to... Alright, it's up. Oh, looks like I... It's so minor that, like... I saw my character do that animation once and the person like there was somebody I was like sharing a copy of Oblivion with. They never believed me <laughs> when I said that it was in the game. <laughs> but yeah, it's just this little animation where like you mess with the sword and your sheath. Like oh. you tighten it up. Oh, really? What? You didn't you didn't see it? No, I didn't see it. It didn't pop up in the wash together. Are you still in it? Yeah, I'm still looking at the uh, Todd Howard. Oh, wait. No. I've loaded up the video. I've been, like, playing it and everything. Oh. oh. Are you in it on the right? Yeah, no. I'm, I'm, I'm in the one that we were in. Oh, okay. Uh, I guess I'll pull it up then. No, no, no. I'll, I'll join the most recent link. I don't know how that happened, but... Because I never closed the tab. Yeah, it's, it said you were here the entire time. Alright, it's it's up now, though. I thought you were seeing it. There's so much of this video that's, like, wasted time, and I don't know exactly... <laughs> like, there you go. Oh! Yeah. My, fr my, my friend never believed that that was in the game. <laughs> Now, I think the out of water slaughterfish is um is better. Yeah. No, I no because to see this one, um, you have to be standing still and happen to be like seeing your character while you're idling to ever see it. Yeah.
10 animations of Bolivian players have never seen before. That's not the game I would expect to have that. Yeah, there's like a obscure stuff that's in Oblivion that makes you think that like, man, this could have been a way better game. <laughs> if things had just been like slightly different. <laughs> if only the managers had given them more time. All right, so what I want is a night eye spell and I want more fucking arrows. So like... Here's what I want to know. There's an animation for slaughterfish being on land, right? So anytime a slaughterfish spawns on land, can that be considered a bug? Yeah, like. I, I mean, there's a feature. I mean, know, around granted, that was it being pretty, a thing. That was pretty far in land. So, yeah, like but... it didn't flail its way over there. <laughs> But like, how did it even spawn out there? Man, it's an Easter. It's an Easter egg. It's a, it's definitely a complicated. Um, well, it's it's consideration. One, of, one of those things where it's um. You could consider an Easter. It's like, is it a bug or is it a feature? Pat, you're what? oddly hinged. This stream, what gives? I'm hinged every stream, fucker. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. People act like I'm this menace. Like there was a comment on Indigo's stream where it was like I was interrupting everybody, just every other sentence. Which I do interrupt people, but you do have to bear in mind I'm in a I'm in a stream with four uh, yeah. neurotic YouTubers. Yeah, and... exactly. We're we're all trained to talk over other people. So and, it's like in, um, in if conversations. I, if I don't bring it up, I won't remember it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In in conversations that I have in real life, I'm usually the one who's interrupting and just like dominating conversations because it's like that's just my YouTuber training. Yeah, it's like four alpha personalities that <laughs> are trying to <laughs> run a show. I forgot how short I am because I'm a fucking Bosmer. Yeah, everyone walk. looks down at you. It's Todd Howard Simulator. <laughs> How come Super Rad never responded to the manlet theory? Is, what is that theory? Uh, it's this theory that uh, because Todd Howard's short, he keeps making the antagonists really big, so they're always looking down at you. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's in the Oblivion video. That might be a Skyrim stream thing. No, I found out that Todd How or not Todd, fuck me. That's so like off base. I found out the super rad like responded to like five things that I said, but in all cases he uh used oh, yeah. the it was some guys say that. Mm. And it's like so he did the Mayron's Dagon theory and it's like that's not some guys say that. I'm literally the only fucking person on the planet who yeah. said that. Uh, he doesn't want to. Uh, I guess he doesn't want to be called would out you really for call watching that, your videos. Like, would you really call that dude who ke who kept talking an alpha? There's a difference between uh, an alpha personality and being able to talk coherently. Like, I'm aware that I can't speak coherently. <laughs> that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, I don't have an alpha personality because I absolutely do. I interject over people all the time. Yeah, it, it, it's funny, um, people seem to have, like, a mental profile of who I am based on, like, how our dynamic works, and, um, they don't understand that, like, literally, I, I just give the floor because, um, I just understand what it takes to make a good show, and usually you need somebody who's gonna yield, but in real life, I'm a lot more, like, belligerent and obnoxious. <laughs> Yeah, that that waitress <laughs> didn't deserve how you treated her. <laughs> um, I also got to remember I am from New York, so it, there is a there is a certain like um thing in the back of my mind where it's like in any situation where I'm dealing with people who are not from New York, where it's like, oh wait, I gotta like 
not be uh not be rude here. What can I interest you in? Um, I didn't even know he had shit to sell. Switch rolls, switch rolls. Um, could I don't I don't think it's oh, that easy. There's a, there's a lot of years of neurotic behavior that goes into <laughs> being me. He does not have night eye. Interesting. I'll look it up for you. Night eye oblivion. I just want chat to be able to see like <laughs> what's <laughs> going on. <laughs> I understand not everybody has perfectly, uh, you know, optimized monitors and stuff, so... Welcome to the Mystic Emporium. Calendar is here. With all I swear that UESP changed spell pages. Are New Yorkers where it's, the it's, people... It's are New Yorkers the people who go, Hey, I'm walking over here. Yeah. Have a look around. You won't find better prices. Kalindil... Oh, you're Adam. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I have Eyes of Eventive. That's gonna be the, the cheapest night eye spell, I think. Eventide, is that how that's actually pronounced? I always pronounce it Eventide. I don't think there's an official pronunciation of it. Half the spell names are like just made up. <laughs> like they're not actually based on anything. Alright, nice. Alright, no, no no, let's look it up. Elder Scrolls Eventide. Tempted that's to get the, that's the spell unlock spell. I should be able to cast this easy. Oh, the the, the, easy. the horse, the uh, the fire horse mod that was called the Blaze of Eventide. Mm. Yeah, yes. I'm pretty sure it's not it's not actually based on anything. Event event eyed. Yeah, that's that's uh, probably the 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 worst way that you could pronounce it is event eyed. <laughs> by my by my books. Does Super Red have a problem with you two? Um, I don't think Super Red liked my Oblivion video. I'm pretty sure he's an Oblivion baby. I don't think he knows I exist. So, and honestly, I I, I kind of want to keep it that way. <laughs> He's a slighted fan. He liked my Morrowind video and then like got offended by the Oblivion video and it changed everything. <laughs> I didn't know you were like that. How dare you not like the same games as me? No, I don't. I really don't know what's up with him. I think he's just on the YouTube grind set. That's that's all there is to it. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm sure. Discussions like this always devolve into like trying to discern what somebody's personality is, and it's just like, yeah, that's basically impossible because everybody on YouTube's putting on some sort of front. So you know, it's if if he's if he's happy with how his channel's going and everything, then by all means, keep producing. I've wow. been told you defended Oblivion too much. <laughs> yeah, that that's that's kind of the thing is um Which is funny because like I'm the, I'm an Oblivion fan and I fucking loved your video. Because it was like nothing in it was incorrect or anything. And at the end it's just like I, I think the mo the best the best way the best thing was at the end where you said like I used to consider Oblivion um pleb tier, but now I'm not so sure. And it's like I'll take that. Yeah, Doing the analysis gave me a lot more perspective. I like, okay, the Oblivion video gave me a lot more perspective on Oblivion than the Skyrim video gave me perspective mm. on Skyrim. Mm -hmm. I'll absolutely say that that's the case. All right, so I want to do the Thieves Guild. <clears throat> should I do the Thieves Guild or should I do... No, I'm going to start with the Thieves Guild. Fuck it. What, what's your objective? If you're looking for money, then... Footage is my objective. Um, money would be nice, I guess, but... Well, I mean, most... I don't think footage is going to matter, because you're going to have it all by the time you need it. Yeah. Like, unless you're editing it right now. No, no, no. Um, 
I mean, we could do the arena. I, the thing is, like, I always start with the arena. That's kind of why I want to start with the Thieves Guild, like, right out of the gate, pretty much. Yeah, start with the Thieves Guild so you have a perspective of what that's like. Yeah. Um, do you want to do the jail start? Um, yeah, I might as well, right? So what is it? You just... You have to learn about the... Yeah, look for a, a Gray Fox poster. Yeah. It's interesting that they have colored print in this setting. Not only do they have the printing press, it's also colored. All right. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> do I have to, like, ask a guard now about the Gray Fox or something like that? Yeah, um... Oblivion Thieves Guild. And I mean, then... Then I gotta get arrested. Raise your bounty and allow the guards to catch you send you to prison. After you're released, this may work if you escape, you will be approached by a representative of the Thieves Guild informing you of a meeting to be held at the Garden of Daraloth in the Waterfront District at midnight. So I think you just have to be arrested. I got a, I got a one gold bounty. My restoration skill is decreased by one. Oh no. Look time. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Joel. Umbacanos. Manservant. Umbacano. Oh man, it's Skyrim. <laughs> They're fucking chasing you down to give you quests. To visit him in his manor. My master is a collector of Meth Redhill. I believe the note will give you all Bye. Remember that Argonian Bye. From yesterday. Little bugger pulled a knife on me earlier. I had to put Maybe it trying to separate himself from you to stand out as the maker of Oblivion long video. I always do. Where's my your video is pretty good, and he may live in the shadow of it. No, there were comments that were akin to. Um, he saw he saw my there. video, and all he took away from it was that it was long. Because as I understand from some people that have watched it, it's a structural mess. It's the it's the score to beat. He, if you're yeah, not going to make that's such, the, a, that's such a petty thing the... too, because I've never cared about the runtime, and so. Yeah. To like to like want to be just slightly longer. Like I have to wonder like him weighing the formula in his head. He was like I could make it 1 second longer to fuck with him or like <laughs> how much longer do I need to make it so I have plausible deniability that it's not about being longer and that like <laughs> so that when he talks about it it's actually him that's fucking coping and focused overly focused and being petty like I have to wonder if there was some kind of mental calculation that went into that. I just heard it was a lot of like rereading stuff on the UESP. And um I know he didn't credit it at at, at the launch of his video. And then mm. uh, some people were like uh analyzing sections of it to see what all he pulled and uh like commenting on it. Yeah, I saw the only thing that I saw that was uncredited was um he used some screenshots from the UESP and didn't credit them, which is like, eh, my dad for it's not. Yeah, yeah. It's so yeah, minor. It's, yeah. Every everybody steals from them. <laughs> he can teach you a lot about using light So I have no idea if it was like he didn't credit them at all throughout the whole video or not. I think I think he mentioned it though, like a few times. Um I'm still not Getting a representative. We may gotta like hang around. I'll, I'll wait around for like a day. I look forward to Super Rad's 22 hour Skyrim video. That's what I've said over and over is there if go. he wants to dethrone the Skyrim yes. video, go for it, champ. Yes. I really look forward to you doing a single playthrough of Skyrim and somehow trying to wrangle 22 <laughs> hours out of it. <laughs> oh. Oh. I'm gonna tell you right now, I did like five playthroughs of Skyrim. All the creation yep. club stuff, all the different paths that you can do in quests, VR footage. Go for it. I how many how many characters have I made for Skyrim? I think Beat I'm me. some. I think I'm at like, like six eight. or seven at this point. Okay, so I had, I had, Sarian, and then there was like another character that I was playing, uh, consecutively with that as well. Um, then there was Gutha, and. Uh, there's another character that I, there's two characters that I did streams with, with that, for that video. 
In this video, I have my uh, my main character, Edwina Scissorhands, and... Oh, and the Khajiit. Alright, yeah, so I'm at like 8. Yeah, I thought it was something like 8. I'll be right back. All right. Have you heard any yeah, so Skyrim is the game that you do a video on if you want to go insane. From what I understand, Fallout 4 is also kind of similar. Vacuum. Hi. Wait, is she taller than me? Isn't she a wood elf? Yeah, she's a she's a wood elf. Why am I why am I shorter than her? Are the are female wood elves taller? <laughs> this character really does feel a lot shorter than normal. Do I know you? Um, I got this note here. Yes. Another scoundrel who served time in an imperial jail. The Grey Fox is offering you a chance to join the Thieves Guild. Right, so I, I can't skip through the dialogue for this stuff because I need to record the footage of the dialogue too, ideally. So, can I join? Everyone is here. Let's begin. Each of you is seeking membership in the Thieves Guild. The Thieves Guild Female Wood Elves are taller in Morrowind than the male Wood Elves. <laughs> Look at this. It's good. <laughs> It's kind of a funny detail. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really is like man manless simulator. It's funny. <laughs> My character's staring up at him. Modern computers scan your height in real life, buddy. Uh, VR games actually do do that. So. Pat, I'm finishing Death Stranding while listening to today's podcast, and I look at the screen with, while my final road is building, and you had a dozen body bags and a car and the baby crying. What did you do? Uh, I cut out the part of the LARP episode where I basically went and killed a bunch of uh, killed a bunch of those mules, and uh, I was I was making an earnest attempt at driving their bodies to the incineration plant, but I got caught by ABT. So that truck full of bodies is still out in that field. Um. And I, I did genuinely forget to like calm BB down enough that he could make like the return trip. So when that BT attacked, he went into auto toxium, uh, whatever the fuck it is, and uh, he he turned off. Which because I did it accidentally, I actually found out that he tur he uh, he only objects until you get into a combat sequence with a BT, and then he'll turn on for that duration, which I think is a weird detail. Is this a thing Armand will always let will always offer is selling you lockpicks for five gold each? Is that a thing? I'm pretty sure it's not. Wait, wait, no, it could be. That could be a mod. Is that could be one of my mods? But I don't. Does he say anything? Yeah, yeah. Can you when, do it? Yeah. Um. Before. No, no, no. No. This is definitely Finella because when I'm talking, when you're talking to him, he's like, I can also sell you the lockpicks uh, if you need them. Okay. That's why I thought to go in here and start. Is he going to... Only for this quest. That's what I was thinking. It's only for this quest. So what I should do... <laughs> That's a good price, man. I was going to say, that would have solved my lockpick shortage problem that I experienced in the Oblivion video. Nobody ever mentioned it. They're all like, no, 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 you got to find this really fucking obscure yeah. NPC that I, like, I got, sells lockpicks. I got plenty of money, so I'm going to just... Yeah, there we go. All right. I don't know. I've had one I... void out while playing Death Stranding so far, and it didn't send me back to a save. Actually, I was trying to kill myself to get sent back to a save, and that's how I got voided out. Uh, I like Which is how, why... how this quest is like in the beginning, everybody's like super suspicious and everything of you. Like they don't, they kind of treat you like shit. But it's literally for this, only for this quest. The why doesn't the... he provide this service 24 7 so he doesn't provide the service because after so you do this quest you unlock the fences he still mm -hmm. lockpicks yeah but i think that i think the fences charge more for the lockpicks if i'm not mistaken they will charge more but i mean this is like if you're starting oblivion fresh 
um, you only have the lock picks from the goblin cave, and you could get soft locked if there's not a way to get more lock picks. Because I mean, like, like I say in the video, Shady Sam's not that obvious of an NPC. Yeah. Like he's he's I on the outside of the Imperial City in a part that nobody ever goes. I to. discovered him once on my first playthrough on accident. And it was such an inconsequential meeting that, like, it was always one of those things that, like, existed in the back of my mind. I was like, nah, that couldn't have, uh, like, my, my brain's gaslighting me or something. That never exi well, and, that never happened. And then and it also, wasn't until, like, I want to say 2020 when I was doing my video where I found out that that dude actually existed. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, and also what he does that's unique to other merchants isn't obvious when you talk to him. Mm -hmm. Like, it just seems like, oh, it's you know a little bit of world flavor there's a shady guy outside the city and he sells poison and it's like no he's a fence and he sells lock picks and like mm, you know, all right there's all these important things that you might want and it's yeah. like oh well i had no clue because i haven't i've yet to try to sell stolen stuff or like you know i've yet to need more lock picks i'm not gonna be switching weapons so i can actually all right let's let's redo these hotkeys a bit this is a bit of a mess i'm out of the loop is pat in a beef with the 12 out 12 hour 30 to 12 30 hour Okay, it's 12 hours, 30 minutes. I'm fixing that for you. Oblivion video guy. I'm not, like, I'm not, okay, I want to be clear here. I'm not in a beef with him. I think he's in a beef with me, and I think it's funny. I've seen a few clips of, like, stuff that he's talking about. I'll listen to the clips. He'll start with, some guys say, and then he'll say something that, like, only I've ever said, right? And then, um, but, like, his response to it will be so minor or mediocre that I'm like, if this is... If this is the bulk of what I'm being criticized, then I don't even need to like respond to it. <laughs> so like, um, I was told that he didn't realize that the Dark Brotherhood works for money. Interesting. Uh, which I think is on the level of an impossible plot point to miss. Um, actually, let me just fast travel. Uh, oh wait, no, 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 this is all just. Uh, districts right here yeah um it's mostly that i think it's funny i've never seen a super rad video i don't hear good things about him uh if he's beefing with me then and that's like what he's saying then it's <laughs> hilarious <laughs> Hello. like he said that the mirren's dagon theory can't be the case because dagon lost when like Yes, Dagon losing was a, a, a presupposed part of the theory. That was, like, evidence for it, so... Yeah. So does she just, like, run straight to his house? Like, could I just follow her? Or I is it just I because... I so. <laughs> this quest is... It's ambitious. Yeah. But That's... it's still Oblivion. Yeah, too bad... She didn't pay the beggar, so she didn't know his did, diary Did he was... think they worked for a thrill? So, I... I'm remembering yeah, more the more we talk up. about it. They said that he, a big part of his criticism of the Dark Brotherhood Sanctuary is that they have a bunch of expensive stuff that they wouldn't have because they work for free. So not only did he miss the plot point, um, but he then based criticism of the Dark Brotherhood on it. So he doesn't like the Dark Brotherhood because of like minor world building stuff, but then he likes the dead drop contracts because they're like intentionally designed. Wait, what? Yeah, that was another one of his counterpoints to me. It was like, no, 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 the dead drop contracts are good because they're like... And I don't remember what all he said. It was something akin now to... Now like, looking they're, down on who, Armand? Because they're in, intentionally designed. Congratulations. It was you very... It was a very strange... You like, everything that I was shown you? where he was responding to things I said was like... You now <laughs> like, sideways. Like, he doesn't like the Knights of the Nine quest where you get the map. Um, and it's, like, it doesn't update your waypoints because it's just waypoints with a degree of separation. Mm -hmm. Which I think is funny because I like that quest because of its, because of its that. Blood Moon version. And the fact, like, yeah, I like physical map items that you yeah. have to cross-reference with. Yeah. I mean, sure, yes, it's, it's not it's too <laughs> difficult to cross-reference it with the map, with the omniscient map that you get from the game, but... Like it would work better in a in a Morrowind where you don't have the entire map unlocked, but even in Morrowind, it's still like just one degree of separation. Yes, it's simple. Yeah, it, it's the but it's you know it's simple, but it's nice. You need more experience so I don't know why that's like a a point of contention, or like 
Oh, like it's right. a it's a epi it's it's an epic style own on people that were tricked by the illusion. It's a very weird. I got a very weird like perspective on the video. Jobs with thieves, not masons or scribes. Look, you're on your own. As a thief. Go Will you be discussing New Vegas in your Outer Worlds video? Oh yeah, you asked you uh -huh. asked about it earlier. <laughs> um, a little bit. What I mostly talk about is that their aspiration to try to be a New Vegas two um, hampered the games in a lot of way, and that's what the thumbnail means. If you uh, want to put the thumbnail on screen, most other merchants won't. Sure. Um, I will send it to you. Yeah. I, I don't expect you to have all my thumbnails at the top of your files or anything like that. Uh, so this is artwork from Spacer's Choice. Um, the Spacer's Choice edition, and it's uh, the like this main character they drew putting on the Moon Man helmet, and so all the artwork is saying is that, um, <laughs> I, I, is that this is a mask that the game is wearing that it's Fallout New Vegas, but it's it's just that it's just a mask. All right, Windows, please, Windows Explorer, man. I, yeah. I'm glad <laughs> it's not just me. Yeah, it's yeah. time to it's time to get a new file explorer add-on. It's it no no it's time to switch to Windows 11. I'm telling you. Mm. Yeah, so you got. Oh the... my god, I forgot I forgot to clarify. Yes, the helmet is called Moon Man. No, it has nothing to do with Mac tonight. But uh, yeah, that's what the thumbnail means. It's just. Fallout New Vegas is a mask that Outer Worlds wears when convenient, and it's nothing. It's nothing more. It's not actually the substance of Outer Worlds. You'll get the special commission, you know, guaranteed. And you know, it. it I, I think that was one of the biggest shocks for uh, for me. Was you know, I was like, oh, this is Obsidian. They um, you know, they did Fallout New Vegas. I mm -hmm. I they did uh, Tyranny. I really liked Tyranny. Um, so this should be pretty interesting, like a their attempt at making a new Fallout type game. Like, all right. Like I said, like, yesterday, th that's why that's why um, I bought the game at launch because I was like, you know, they have a good track record and everything. I, it's you know, I'll pay I'll pay full price for it. Like I said yesterday, uh, I even like kind of blanked that it was the same studio. Yeah. <laughs> I knew, like, okay, I know Obsidian made New Vegas, and I know Obsidian made Outer Worlds. That doesn't necessarily mean that my brain automatically, like, will make the connection when I first start playing a game. Like, for years, I didn't know that Fallout was tied to Bethesda. Really? Yeah, I think it was until, like, I think I made it to, like, 2010, not knowing that uh, Fallout was a Bethesda game. And so I never, like, played it when I was, I never, like, was interested in it when I was at GameStop. I was like, that looks like a really boring fucking game. When I looked at like the cover, <laughs> the best fences are so like then eventually I don't even remember how I got how I ended up with a copy of New Vegas, but yeah that was my introduction to the Fallout series and then I was like oh Bethesda's name is on this oh Bethesda made Fallout <laughs> <laughs> so I was not sold on Fallout New Vegas at the, in the beginning because I was like oh it's just a spinoff Fallout game like uh, eh, whatever. But then um, one of my friends told me uh, about it after he uh, acquired a copy. So then I, as well, acquired a copy on PC. And um, yeah, it turned out we both f loved the game and uh, it retroactively ruined a lot of Fallout 3 for us. Yeah, so it's not always the case that like someone who starts with New Vegas always hates Fallout 3. There's yeah. plenty of people that played 3 first and then New Vegas. Uh, I... Saw a Fallout, my, my relationship with Fallout 3 is interesting. So, like, when I originally got the game, I fucking loved it. Then, like, I played it for, like, a few, you know, like, on and off and stuff. And, like, the more I played it, the more I started to dislike it. Until I... Until Fallout New Vegas came around, and I basically hated Fallout 3 by that point. Like, uh, after playing Fallout New Vegas, I'm like, oh, this is what Fallout 3 could have been. Wow, okay. Um... But then uh, I started to warm back up to Fallout 3 after a while. So it's like, now I consider Fallout 3 to be like my junk food game. Um, it's mm -hmm. like the McDonald's of like, uh, it, the like I get like a good 15 hours of enjoyment out of it before I'm just done. Um, uh, I like the atmosphere. It's like, it's a very moody game. Uh, there's parts to it that I enjoy. The, the uh, 
the museums and stuff like that. There's like cool set pieces to it. And it's like, you know, like 10 to 15 hours and I'm good. What do you um, so someone asked about Warlockracy. Um, so I re very recently uh, saw a video by him because uh, we don't all have each other's phone numbers, by the way. So um, I very recently saw his Skyrim Home of the Nords review, which is a mod for Morrowind that adds um, like a part of Northeastern Hammerfell and the Reach. Uh, and I think Riften's in it too. Like there's different holds of Skyrim in it. I'm not sure what the whole, the whole scope of it is, but it does add stuff from Skyrim. But it's canon Skyrim, as in canon as of Morrowind style Skyrim. Oh. So it's a very different approach to representing the area. Oh. And um, that thinking about that made me think, hey, you're doing a Skyrim video. It might be prudent if we loaded that up into Tez 3MP and uh, did a bit of that content just to uh, as an interesting part of your Skyrim videos. Yeah. That, that Karth, might... isn't it? Markarth, not Riften yet. Okay. That might, yeah, that might be interesting. Uh, probably for like part four, um, when yeah. I get to uh, Dragonborn and stuff. I think there's. Oh yeah, be, you, uh... you 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 could like. Oh god, I, I am thinking <laughs> of the possibilities that you have with like Blood Moon and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of like so... I I think I'm gonna, after I finish um, part three of Skyrim, I think I'm gonna start like seriously doing a lot of uh, Marwin playthroughs. Not necessarily yeah. I'm gonna do a Marwin video before. I I am gonna do a Marwin video like, but um. I might finish Skyrim before I do the Marwin video, but I still might play a bunch before we before I get to part four, where I'll be doing, um, you know, uh, Dragonborn specifically. I think that would benefit from having a lot of uh, Marwind Marwind footage first off, and then second off, just experience with the game and stuff too. So, yeah, I mean, I still got the Tez three MP stuff set up. So yeah, oh yeah, you're still paying for that. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, it's like pennies a month. Like, oh okay, it's not okay. very much money. All really. right. Oh my god, we're going to spend your account if you don't pay us the $3.62 that you owe us from not paying them for like three months. I'm not sure he's even human. <laughs> he's a captain of the Imperial Watch. So like, Test 3MP is something that I am willing to just kind of pay for, even if I don't play it every month. Mm -hmm. uh, just just so that I have it all ready to did go. You, if you ever did you finish it. that playthrough with, uh, with uh, your friend? Yeah, it was a pretty uh, a pretty full playthrough. I think we were like level fifteen at the end. Did some House Telvani. Um, kind of got tired of the support mage thing. I'll tell you that. <laughs> what do you use to host it? You just it it it, it comes with it is uh, the hosting solution. Yes, you can self host it. I cloud host it just because. Um, I'm connecting to people that are in different parts of the world. Yeah. And uh, it's a more consistent experience that way. What what service are you using that's only costing you pennies a month? I mean it's just a it's just a cloud service that is designed around like small application. Oh, interesting. Because, like, uh, when I was hosting a uh, Minecraft server, that was, like, 15 bucks a month, I think. Well, the, the whole deal is it's not running right now, right? Mm -hmm. So for it for it to run, I have to actually, like, go turn it on and then boot it up. And so I, I, I get charged more for when it's actively running. So it would be oh. more if I, if I was running, like, an active Test 3 MP server. But since it's just mothballed right now, like... Interesting. All, all I'm paying for is, like, the small amount of storage that the server files take up. Oh, no. I've been enjoying Death Stranding. Its story is questionable, but the gameplay justifies the weirdness of the story to me. Yeah, let's go to the let's go to the market district. We gotta do some gotta do some independent thieving. Um, this was supposed to be rebalanced to make it a little bit more profitable. So we shall see. I mean, I could just go through and like. The gameplay makes the real story with Death Stranding. The thing is, I kind of wish they leaned into that with the storytelling. Alright, let's see. I wanna... Alright, I've leveled up my 
Alex Friedman interview in Rutgers. I'm going to. I'm going to Man, he's got auto translations. Surprising, but not surprising. Da okay, so he's got it sectioned out. Daggerfall and Arena, Bethesda, video game graphics, essence of a video game, Red Guard. Eh, he's kind of doing the interview that I would want to do with, with Todd Howard. <laughs> I think the pro the problem. Okay, no, no, he hasn't done the interview that I would want to do with Todd Howard because he's talking about Starfield an hour in and crap, everything's um, locked up. I kind of have to. Oh, hang on. I, I, Rejoining. I... Damn it! Everything here's locked up. Hello, hello, chat. You're gonna have to tell me if uh, I'm good. Um, yeah. I mean, you sound good on my end. Okay, we're good. No, no, no. I'm never gonna sound different to you. It's it's only chat that gets it. Oh, yeah, so what, oh, the robot. What I was saying was um. The interview I want to do with Todd Howard would be comprehensive to career his career, and he does start at a good place with this interview, but I think that he's going from, like, I don't even know, why is he asking him about Arena? Todd Howard didn't work on the game, but um, I would start at, like, I wouldn't even start at Daggerfall. I would start with, like, the Terminator game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, 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 it's not, it's not a stream issue. Like, you refreshing it was a coincidence. I have to rejoin the call for it to be fixed. Which sounds like an OBS thing. Yeah, like I, I, I and yeah, I've okay, changed the the audio like capture that I use too, and it's still. Hang on. Let me let me ask you, Ooh, is OBS there. on a on a separate audio channel to your main audio channel? I'd imagine so. Or sorry, Discord. Yes, that's pro it's probably that audio channel that's having an issue. Oh, hmm. It should. Be I don't know. I, I think don't know its... why own separate channel though it doesn't even share anything with any other channel i know but um i don't know why rejoining the discord call would fix it yeah i don't i have no idea but is it a virtual audio channel um technically yes it's built in it's a built-in feature in uh in obs now yeah but like virtual it's... audio virtual audio channels have a high tendency to get fucky after a while. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, yeah, because it's like a it's a relatively new feature in uh, Windows 10, where you mm -hmm. can actually capture directly from a uh, like a, a window or a exclusive application. It so... literally might be Discord. Well, hold on here because it's not Discord. Because if it was Discord, he would hear it. Yes. It's be it's between. Um, uh, it's between Discord and OBS that mm -hmm. the issue is. Yeah. Because if it was between OBS and the stream, the whole stream audio would be bugged. Yeah, my guess is it's the, um, it's probably the protocol or whatever the fuck it is that, uh, Windows is using to give, like, exclusive capture. But mm -hmm. it's weird because it doesn't affect any other channel. It's only Discord. Because I have everything broken out on different channels. I don't know if I'm going to get through this lock. Um, this, this is a bit of an ambitious one for me. Alright, I'm going to have to Yeah, always no. make sure to sound off and chat when there's some audio bugs so that we can actually listen in and uh, see what's going on. Alright, so I guess Lex Friedman has done me some favors by... Uh... Damn. Hi. We've had similar issues with channels on OBS, though the issue issue was consistent and required a restart to OBS to fix. Yeah, it it's just one of those things where it's so inconsistent. I wonder if that's what was causing because I lost some footage in uh to fall out well not footage but some channels in seventy six. It's probably the same issue then. And once again, it was just Discord that was like getting all messed up. I I have consistency, but that's because I have an audio interface that has multiple channels built in, and I think that's why I've never had that kind of issue mm -hmm. uh, with OBS. The Lex Friedman interview was quite good. See, I doubt that though, because you don't know how Lex Friedman's name is spelled. But also, um, I've heard mixed things. 
and it it's always whether somebody's a fan of Lex Friedman or not that um, determines it. It's interesting that this is not a highly viewed Lex Friedman interview. There's some he's done that have like three, oh, no. three or four million views, and then this one's like one point seven million. My carrying capacity. I only have ninety encumbrance. I'm already at eighty nine. Is that reworked? Yes. Okay. Um, shit. Lex Friedman. Uh. Friedman interview sucks. He's just sucking off Todd the entire time and gets basic shit about Bethesda Game Studios wrong. Well, that's the thing is, if you're a general generalist interviewer like Friedman is, where you're doing an, an a episode a week or whatever, that doesn't give you a whole lot of time to do your research to get basic stuff right. Yeah. So. All right. Uh, I got to offload some of this crap then. I've never watched a Lex Friedman interview. I know he comes from the Joe Rogan space. Joe Rogan's a very good interviewer. Independent of your opinions on the person, he's like he's perfect for his job of interviewing a bunch of different people in society because he knows how to ask questions and unlike me, he knows when to shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the that's a very important aspect to interviewing. That's also why I like Jeff Keeley, is that he's good at probing and then letting people just speak. Yeah, versus that Ryan guy that, like, he, he asked a simple question, but he asked it in a way it that made so, confusing yeah, what yeah, he was asking. Yeah, that was, like, way too much. Way too wordy. He lets himself be influenced too much, Joe. No. See, a lot of people say that. Oh, and what right. it is, is that Joe Rogan is an idea chameleon in the sense that in order to make people comfortable and mm -hmm. get them to talk, he will believe whatever's being said that's why he flip-flops on stuff so much and that's why it seems like he's being influenced by every person he brings on really what he like that's part of his skill of, as an interviewer is ma like getting the person to be comfortable enough to be candid you know what's funny is i do the exact same thing i've had one of my friends told me once he's like you know i don't know what you believe half the time because when you're talking to other people you'll like flip-flop i'm like yeah it's because that's if you want to build a good rapport with people, sometimes just getting on their level is a good first step. So yeah, he's, I, he's I, not like a, I've learned to listen without judgment. He's not a Twitch streamer who's going to debate on every point that yeah. like he personally disagrees with with the person he's talking to. Especially the whole reason that when, they came to talk to him yeah. was to talk about whatever they're an expert of. Yeah, especially when your job is to interview people, you need to remove yourself from the equation as much as possible, and just. Like, your job is to get them to speak and to just direct them so that they continue to speak. So, I mean, like, I always give Joe Rogan the proper credit at being a good interviewer. I think, uh, like, uh, the model interviewer that more people need to emulate. All right, so I need to get to Bruma. Here's a walk I've never done before because I was really? able to just fast travel everywhere. I might have done it, oh. like, once. But, um, I remember doing it because I was following those guys that are in Shaden Hall that run like to I Coral. Did not know about that in there. Roxy in. Literally never seen that place before. In my really? Life. Oh, that's where the heavy armor master trainer is. Oh, really? Rogan just lets it go so far off the rails constantly. It's great to listen to. Yeah, I will say there are interviewers that are better at keeping on topic. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember the first time I was on Indigo. Like, I ended up unofficially with the job of keeping things on topic. Because <laughs> uh, Zarek and Indigo were, like, pushing in different directions, and then I would bring it back to the topic of, like, hey, uh, we're mm -hmm. talking about Skyrim here. Yeah. Um, we did not have that issue this time around. That was genuinely... That might have been the best podcast I've ever sat in on. Yeah. That was, like... I, I felt like we, we all, like... Nobody was... Uh, talking over each other despite what people were saying in chat um everybody was like getting to say what they wanted to say and we stayed on topic and we had like a lot of good discussions I yeah and pick anything up i came prepared with a lot of information to give uh mm -hmm. indigo yeah 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 that was that was good too so he was able to just like load everything up and i mean like all the all the stuff we were talking about i have like committed to memory i could literally talk about those topics in my sleep so <laughs> That made it pretty easy, too, so I could just, like, interject with stuff when needed. Starfield has been living in my head rent-free, so... Yeah. I mean, rightfully so, it's... These are gonna be big videos. Like, 
view wise, production wise, and everything, there's it justifies the amount of uh, time and attention we're giving to it at this point. This is probably something I would never mention in the Starfield video, but Lex Friedman's uh, Lex Friedman is of the opinion that Skyrim is quite possibly the greatest game ever. Interesting. Um, uh, which I, which I think is a very interesting perspective. Great, uh, influential, maybe sure. greatest. No, yeah, and even the influential thing, like, mm, it's hard to say. It's had a big impact on players, but the industry as a whole, uh, debatable. I would almost say Oblivion had a bigger impact on the industry. No, I like there were some open world games post Oblivion. There were a lot more open world games post uh, Skyrim, but then no, that tr that pattern tracks through to Fallout Four as well. Mm -hmm. It just got more and more popular with each Bethesda game. Yeah, and so it, it's hard to correlate what was Bethesda's fault and what wasn't, short of it being I, outright stated. Well, well, I look at I look at Oblivion as uh, important for um, influencing console, like big console RPGs. God, don't pick anything up. How would you even qualify the greatest game of all time? Well, I mean, yeah. there's people who can qualify the greatest movies of all time or the greatest albums of all time. So I think it, it, with a matter of time, you could say that there's a greatest game of all time. Like, I don't know, maybe Factorio in its genre might be one of the greatest that's ever been made in mm -hmm. the like, simulation and management genre. If Yeah, if you break it down into genres, I think it's uh, it's a Which is what discussion. happens with movies as well. Yeah. Like so I guess that that's how you have to do it is um like what's the best RPG of all time? Let's have that discussion. Oh man, that's so complicated because even RPGs are like why? like that guy that thought like why are you more excited for Baldur's Gate than Starfield? And it's like they're different genres of RPG of RPGs in themselves. Yeah. yeah. Like there's CRPG people who have never played a first person RPG and there's ARPG people that have never played a CRPG. Yeah. See, whenever I see people talking about the greatest RPG of all time, I see Ocarina of Time. Yeah, which I think is a very weird inclusion. <laughs> but uh, that always seems to be like the middle of the road, like, all right, we got to stop arguing, so we're just going to give it to Ocarina of Time. Call it a day. Which Probably. I... Nobody's, nobody's going to contend it if we say it. You yeah. Know? I mean, I can't even say because I've never played it. So... Mm -hmm. A lot of people would contend would contend KOTOR 2 being the greatest RPG of all time. What I'm approaching it from is when somebody says that, I don't know, The Wall is one of the greatest albums of all time, that's because The Wall is almost a perfect album mm -hmm. in terms of its substance and what it's about and it's uh, all the music that's in it. So, I mean, we're talking something that just nails it out of the park. There can't be anybody that, like... And I'm not talking contrarians. I think there are legitimate arguments against KOTOR 2. I think yeah. there's a lot of contrarianism, but there are like legitimate points in there that kind of hold it back. Yeah, I'd I say just, it's patrician tier I, more than it is greatest I, I, of all time. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to have to agree with what you said, where it's like, we just haven't seen it yet. Like, like I said yesterday, we're in the 50s era films yeah. kind of stage of game of games where like the real good stuff is probably going to be in the next 20 years. Yeah, especially if there is a, like an industry collapse where it all falls into the indie market. From my experience, if you're a certain kind of Star Wars fan, you'll dislike KOTOR 2 on principle. I don't know why we give those particular Star Wars fans that much credence. Like, <laughs> I think KOTOR 2 is a, is a wonderfully playful game. Speaking of somebody that is big into Star Wars. When are you doing a uh, KOTOR video? Oh, man. <laughs> it's have, not impossible, but... People have asked me that, and it's like, I don't... I don't know how to answer that. Uh, well, for, well, I know how to answer it. I have no exposure to Star Wars, so... Yeah, that, that could be a problem, <laughs> but you do, have a, you do have a unique perspective that if you come at it as an outsider. Yeah. I think KOTOR 2 would be more interesting as the outsider perspective. Um, KOTOR 1 would be more like, I'd probably approach it at, from the perspective of, I liked Mass Effect 1. I think that <laughs> gamers are, gamers are desperate to have a greatest of all time. 
And so they will like say that something that has a ton of issues is the greatest of all time. Yeah. Whereas like music and film don't have those issues. Like there's tons of albums and there's tons of films that you can point to and say, yeah, there's not really any glaring faults with this. I think a good way of looking at it is inspiration, like the um, the impact it had on other artists and stuff. And the wall once again stands up toward uh, to that uh, benchmark because it literally is one of the most high, like uh, cited source of inspiration for musicians. Yeah, it's not just a fan perspective; it's an artist perspective. I, that might be what games are missing. Yeah, we have so few like actually um, notable game developers that um yeah and um that you can say fit that I, I think category. the problem too is like game developers are usually very quiet i mean it doesn't help that they have to sign ndas on like everything they work on too so but mm -hmm. um you know like when they retire they usually just kind of disappear if they don't start their own studio or something like there's no there's no like reflection on in like on people's experiences within the industry and I think that's that has a really negative effect on basically everything. Uh, people who want to get into the industry, people who just want to make videos on it, uh, historians, con uh, conservationists. Yeah, that's kind of the thing is, like, I would be somebody who would be against saying that Halo 3 is the GOAT. Halo 3 as the best shooter? As the greatest of all time, yeah. Mm. As a shooter? No, absolutely. I mean, if we're just talking Halo games fitting into the greatest of yes. all time for FPS, like CE is your best bet. And even then, oh. that's going to be contended a ton Crap. by like Boomer Shooter era fans. Uh, all right. So I can't get rid of my disease because my infamy. You need a potion. Ugh. Why are you like this, Oblivion? <laughs> the gods will not offer their will not extend their favor towards. Can I pray to the Daedra then? Will they, will they heal me? <laughs> most auteurs in gaming are japanese most of the western ones are from the 90s early 2000s era yeah i was gonna say there's yeah. a there's a bias towards the the east uh with their kind of game developers as artist culture whereas like yeah very much in the west here we we uh we look at game development as like a studio brand name rather than people there yeah. there is the occasional like war inspector the the sole creator of um I'm blanking on what all he's credited with. But there, there's a famous article where War Inspector's John talking Carmack. about, like, yeah, being recognized as, like, the greatest of ever, and then the article, like, recognizes him as that. I've got a book here. I've talked about it before. Game Design Secrets of the Sages. Um, this has been, like, one of the most uh, surprising pickups I've ever had. I was I was at a, a, a bookstore in... Uh, Olympia and I found this on like on a clearance shelf not a clearance shelf it was like a used bookstore but um so like the guy who originally owned it his name's at the front actually but see um, it's it's a compilation of various people the contributor list is really oh, long exactly. but like there's some great contributors in here Molyneux in here Marty O'Donnell's in here uh Richard Garriott's in here Cliff Beliz Cliff Beliz Blazinski, John Romero, Bill Roper, Warren Spector, Tim Sweeney, uh, Miyamoto's in here, Gabe Newell. Um, and this book's from, I want to say like 2002. Oh, 2000. Wow. wow. Yeah, it's, from two, it's, it's from the year 2000. Holy crap. So like the newest, some of the newest games in here are like Half-Life. Um, so so I've like got this, some, of, some of those people like Peter Molyneux and stuff. Mm -hmm. He was still like kind of small potatoes back yeah. then. That's before yeah, we've Fable, got, like put him on we've the got pre Fable Peter Molyneux, where he's talking about black and white. Yeah, wow. I think I can, um, I think I can move this item for you at that price. Mark Laidlaw's in here, yeah. Um, I need Tom to Hall. Do more, do more stealing. So, yeah, I love this book. Um, I've wanted to integrate it into the channel before, mm -hmm. and I, ju I just have yet to cover any of the games that are kind of featured in here. But there's some really great tidbits if you're into the game history stuff um, to read about this this particular era of uh, when game developers were artists. <laughs> 
Yeah, we've we've actually seen like a pushback against uh, the rock stars sort of mentality of like uh, you know Kojima being the this great artist and everything. Like, well, no, it's the he has the whole team behind him and everything. It's not just one person. It's like, okay, yeah, but we can still appreciate his contributions and his ideas and stuff. It like. Yes, it's a team effort, but it's there's more to it than that. There is still like, there is still a leadership aspect to what Kojima did during those productions and everything to get his vision to come through in the final product. All right, I need to just right. do alchemy. So I've, I've I turned a page to a Peter Nall Mall new thing. Uh, when asked to offer advice for budding game designers, Molyneux responds with the following. The art of game design is not so difficult as people might imagine. The first piece of advice I would give anyone designing a game is to use every source of inspiration available to you, from films, books, and music to everyday life. For example, I got the initial inspiration for Dungeon Keeper after seeing the films Pulp Fiction and Interview with the Vampire, where the bad guy was the hero. Once I've been inspired and have the idea, then I always spend at least six months turning it around in my head. Personally, I never write anything down. Once I do that, it seems to solidify, and I'd rather keep it developing until I'm completely happy with it. Once this happens, I write down the idea, keeping to two pages and just listing the exciting parts of the game. Parenthetical, if you need more than two pages to do this, your idea is too bulky. Close parenthetical. Only at this stage do I feel ready to reveal my idea to friends and colleagues, and if they're excited by that idea, then I know I'm onto a good thing. In conclusion, I would point out that my game ideas are evolutionary as they grow as the game is developed. That's uh, Peter Molyneux. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I just have to go to school to be a game developer in order to get this sort of information. Yeah, what's funny is none of these guys had that as a resource when they were coming up. Yeah. All right. Uh, all right, so I can level up now. I'm going to go back to the market district. I th oh, speaking of, actually, Molyneux's next, uh, next thing is actually about not. this topic. The genius behind such beloved PC no, classics as Populous, Syndicate, Dungeon Keeper, and Magic Carpet offers the following advice on breaking into the gaming industry and touches on a few do's and don'ts as well. And this is Molyneux's quote. There are three main ways into the game industry. The first is education. Get a related degree such as math, programming, or philosophy if you want to be a programmer, or a branch of the visual arts if you intend to work as an artist. To take this route into the, in the UK, you would need a very good degree from a very good university. The second way would be to start at the bottom, say as a games tester or assistant, and work your way up. The Todd Howard approach. The third way, and the hardest way these days, is to get together with some like-minded game freaks and start your own company. My dues would be as follows. If you want to be successful at anything, you must be willing to make it the most important thing in your life. It's no good expecting to be a success if you want a 9-to-5 job. If you're sending stuff out to prospective employers, make it brief but exciting. This covers everything from CVs to game design. Detail can be long-winded and off-putting. Peter Molyneux urges you to, quote, believe in yourself because if you don't, no one else will, end quote. And that's just Peter Molyneux's contribution to this book. <laughs> um, there are so many so many people in here that uh, had some interesting thing to say. That's a, Yeah, that's a lot of, like, good advice. That's a lot of good advice, even for, like, this is good advice for a lot of different things. YouTube's mm -hmm. YouTube. Uh, a lot of what he just said there definitely carries over. You know, don't don't let's, approach uh, it if you want just a nine to five job. That's so fed. Let's uh, Gabe Newell quote. Let's see, that seems a fair. All right, with Half Life, Newell says they started from an experiential definition of what they wanted to build. Well, we knew how the player was supposed to feel playing Half-Life and used that to make a whole bunch of decisions, end quote. What exactly did you want the players to feel and how did you accomplish it? This is Newell's quote. 
Prior to starting work on Half-Life, I'd been reading a bunch of Stephen King. In particular, there was a novella he had written called The Mist. The primary aspect of the story that really appealed to me was the sense of an ordinary world spinning out of control. Setting a tentacle monster in a grocery store, for instance. There were elements of science fiction crossed with horror, which I really liked. And in general, the main character was struggling with realizing he had to be the main actor in the situation. That people who should be on his side were turned against him. And that even though bad things were happening, the shape of the catastrophe wasn't very clear for a long way into the story. Given how I had felt playing Doom, it seemed possible to put the player into that kind of intense, scary action experience. I wanted to get away from the notion of shooter, where every player is the deadliest thing in the universe, who just jogs around killing everything. The character of Gordon Freeman was left as transparent as possible to the player. There's no voiceover, no third-person camera, or mirrors. We tried never to pull the player out of the experience through cutscenes, voiceovers, or even easter eggs, or other obviously authorial devices. We made the other characters in the game sympathetic and helpful, and then we did horrible things to them to try to get the player to feel both lost and the sense that the world was actually dangerous. We left a lot of ambiguity, ambiguity in the story to allow the player to write the story however he wanted to from what he was experiencing. Uh, so yeah, that's Gabe Newell talking about the origins of Half-Life. And there's like six more quotes on this page that I'm not going to read you. <laughs> but, How long uh, is this book? Uh, it is 400 pages. Oh my god. How much did you get it for? Four dollars. <laughs> This book is called Game Design Secrets of the Sages. It's the second edition uh, by Mark Saltzman. So if anybody wants to try to track down a copy, that would be it. There's a ton of insight into the late 90s era of uh, game development. Uh, so like I've got uh, Murder, Death, Kill. I've got some notes here. Uh, Naughty Dog, Frogger, Raven Software, Sid Meier, Age of Empires, Dungeon Siege. Let me hang on. Let me get to my next. Because like the whole thing, like um, I've got those like pop out notes that come at the top of the book. I've yeah. got literally multiple layers of that from how, <laughs> how like dense this book is. David Cage, Phantasmagoria, Final Fantasy, Warcraft, Starcraft, Diablo, Fallout 1 and 2, Arcanum, Bioware, Baldur's Gate, EverQuest, Tetris, The Sims, Roller Coaster Tycoon. Got a, my, this is my next section of notes. Leisure Suit Larry, Tomb Raider, um, Duke Nukem Forever, Arachnorox, Sin. At this point, I'm mostly mar marking down names because it was getting tedious to mark down all the games that were like in here anything from planescape torment let me see what when was planescape torment nineteen ninety nine um could be let me see if obsidian it was that was obsidian right was it oh, I have no I have no idea An, that's an era of uh, games I'm unfamiliar with. Remember, I'm a I'm an I'm an Oblivion babby, so. Yeah. I don't think Planescape Torments in this book. Sorry to say. Keep asking though. I've uh, I'll um. Uh, and I'll check. Black Isle. I think Black Isle's in here. Wait. Or is that a response to my question? Ognar? No, they're not. Ognar, yeah, are you I, listening? I know Fallout 1 and 2 are in here. It's been a minute since I cracked this book open, so... Am I wrong? What? Orgnar. Really <laughs> <laughs> this will devolve into uh, Delphine quoting if we're not careful. <laughs> I think I can. You 
drive a hard... I think... That's why I didn't recognize it. So Tim Kaine's in the book, but he's not at Interplay. He's at Troika Games. Uh, this is his, like, intermediary period where mm. Obsidian wasn't a thing yet. Uh, I'm going to hold on to that, actually. Or am I? That's, that's five pounds. I, do I want to carry on five pounds? I don't, I don't think, think I, I don't think Gothic's in here just because of um, the German devs. Before leaving Interplay to launch Troika Games, Tim Kaine became one of the most recognized RPG develop diviners for two of his most famous works, Fallout 1 and 2. Currently, Kane is developing an original RPG titled Arcanum to be published in late 2000 by Sierra Studios. Oh, oh we're almost it, there. Oh my god, so close. I'll, I'll just sell some of these things. I have to I have to speed read this to see where the interesting parts are so I'm not don't spend the next five minutes reading you quotes. There we go. Alright. Kane goes one step further and extracts examples from his previous work to support the aforementioned game design recommendations. In particular, he discusses his work on Fallout, the successful post-nuclear RPG developed and published at Interplay in 1997. Man, this book is published at a time when Fallout was still at Interplay, and that like <laughs> Interplay wasn't in trouble. <laughs> and how it influenced Arcanum, a Tolkien-esque fantasy RPG currently in development at Troika Games. Tim Kane says, Fallout was the first game where I worked on the original design rather than accept a pre-designed game to complete, and it was my first game where I worked as a producer as well as a programmer. I put many of the principles I described above into practice on Fallout, and I assembled one of the best developed Mint teams I ever had. Fallout won numerous best RPG... Yeah, that's his accomplishments. Arcanum is a radical departure from the standard Dark Ages fantasy RPG, and I've tried to give it the look and feel of late 1800s Victorian-era Europe. Technology and magic have reached an unstable equilibrium, with technology being on the rise in the last several decades, and magic being in decline from its once penultimate position in the world. You yes, that's funny and arcanum. Fine... Sorry, chat. It turns out I didn't vet it as well as I could have. So here's a mod that I have added. It adds some basic alchemy uh, tools that you can go find in shops and use them. Like in Skyrim. That was an idea I liked in Skyrim. So we got it in, uh, in Oblivion now. And there's also a storage oh. system there too. Oh yeah, that is cool. Yeah, so I can also store my ingredients here. Some designers draw on their life experiences. Others like to watch movies and others play their competitors' games. But for myself, I read a lot. I can totally see Tim Kane reading a lot. I play those games. <laughs> uh... I read fantasy and science fiction novels as well as historical essays, humor books, and old game adventure modules. You'd be surprised at where you can find inspiration. I'm reading a ladies' home journal published in 1883 called Dimmerest's Monthly Magazine, the January issue, volume 19, number 3 for those who care. The magazine has provided me an incredible window into the last century, especially into how people live day to day. How they worked, what they ate, and how they reviewed the world at large. The issue is full of grandiose advertisements, romantic short stories, fashion tips, and lightly covered world affairs. My favorite section is Kitchen, which is full of recipes for foods like pickled oysters, mincemeat pies, and homemade mayonnaise sauce, all to be washed down with beef tea. It is amazing what you can find on eBay these days. And uh, literally the next part is... Uh, Ray Muzika Bioware fucking talking about Baldur's Gate. Gate. I, I really vibe with that uh um that idea of uh Give me one second I gotta rejoin. Oh. Hail Alright, continue. I really vibe with that idea of, like, um, finding inspiration wherever. That's why I watch random crap on Twitch and YouTube and stuff, because I've gotten ideas for videos, or just bits and stuff from, uh, from the strangest places, from the weirdest videos. It, like, if you just, if you 
continue to like try and find inspiration in your sphere, you wind up making you you can wind up making just like a lot of repetitive uh like regurgitation. All right, I have the money. The gray fox has asked me to take care of the profit. But I'm putting you on it. Hey, what happened to Meth Redhill? Your job is to recover those taxes. All right. We've got War Inspector here. Know what you want players to feel as they play. You can't be sure what players will see or do. That pesky interactive thing, you know. But you can set up situations designed to evoke certain kinds of feelings. Fear, paranoia, tension, sadness, etc. To be honest, I've come to this realization fairly recently. Largely as a result of playing Thief the Dark Project and System Shock 2. The former game, I, the former a game I had something but not much to do with, and the latter I had no hand in at all. This is an area where I don't think I've done a particularly good job, and I'm not sure how I'll work this into my development process. Anyway, in the future, I intend to pay much more conscious attention in pre-production to the emotional state I want players to be in as he or she plays. When I figure that out, I'll let you know. Abandon reality and put gameplay first. I like that. Recreating the real world is a seductive goal and something we do a little bit every day. A little better every day, sorry. The question is, should we do it? Verisimilitude can be a powerful tool in the game developer's arsenal, but it's not the only one. Use realism sparingly, and you can suck players into your game world in powerful ways. Fall victim to realism's seductive charms, and you almost always end up with a game that's just not much fun. This is a lesson learned during the course of developing Deus Ex, which started out with the re with the phrase "real world role playing" as its motto. It took much Warren beating by lead designer Harvey Smith and others to convince me we had to shift our focus from reality simulation to believable simulation. Dude, imagine those conversations: <laughs> Harvey Smith and Warren Spector talking about the uh, design principles of Deus Ex. <laughs> We were talking about skyboxes on the on that podcast. Look, here's yeah. another another game where it gets lighting on the on the moon. On the planet. Yeah. <laughs> it's so simple. I actually think Oblivion kind of looks a little worse than Morrowinds just because there's less um detail on it. But this is, it's this still is actually kind of cool though, so there's like fog down right now, so the moon mm -hmm. like you can only see the moons. You can't see uh the stars. And yeah. like the moon is like kind of fuzzy because of the mm -hmm. fog. Neat. I do have a weather mod though, but all it really does is it changes. I only got it because I want to change the darkness of night. So it's and that's really that's mostly what it changes. So the game looks a little bit different, but not like that much. Don't think of your AI as a tool to beat the player. This is War Inspector still. The role of AI is to act as the player's foil. They are to challenge players, not defeat them. To make them sweat, but ultimately to make them feel cool and powerful. Yet another lesson I learned, embarrassingly, recently. This time from Doug Church, project director on Underworld and System Shock. Given that we've worked together for about the last 10 years, you'd think I would have le learned long ago. I didn't. On Deus Ex, we made our AI-controlled enemies way too tough at first. We wanted them to behave like real, highly trained terrorists and military units. Because of that, we went through a period where players screamed in frustration as they failed miserably to avoid detection or got blown to smithereens when they chose to engage the enemy. Fixing the problem wasn't so much a matter of dumbing down the AI as it was tuning the believability rather oh, than realism. And for maximum challenge, we wanted players to end combat exhilarated and exhausted with one bullet left in a gun. We wanted players to work hard and break a sweat evading and hiding from pursuing enemies. We did not want players getting killed all the time by our super realistic super spies and having to load a save game every 10 minutes. There's so much War Inspector stuff in here. Of like stuff that would be great quotes that like 
there's a lot of videos that like are made by just having like a single really good quote in them yeah and this this book is full it's... packed to the brim with uh, <laughs> a a material for your videos yeah um and, and it's a shame that we're talking about th that this exists like for the year 2000 and uh it's much much harder to find stuff like this today yeah Thoughts on using survival mods? Um, In Oblivion? Yeah, I don't, if you want, go right ahead. If you like the like rhythmic uh, gameplay that like hunger meters provide, really, yeah. um, my favorite component of survival systems is sleep meters, and that's about it. Yeah, especially like I think sleep meters works well in um, in Oblivion because. Uh, it discourages you from just sitting there waiting for everything. I guess hunger and thirst would do that would discourage that too. So I, I I guess there's like some aspects to Oblivion that would work well. But um, Oblivion has a ton of food items already. Yeah. In place. Come on. Can I talk to you? Speaking of naughty dog, uh, it's not Neil Druckmann though. It's uh, Jason Rubin, you only talk the code founder and lead designer, Jason Rubin, talking about Fine. Crash Bandicoot. <laughs> Man. <laughs> well, you know, it's it is a game. Oh, right, man. OK, here's a quote right here. <laughs> George Broussard is the president and partner of 3D Realms, one of the most sought-after development studios in the world. Yes, 3D Realms. After all, they created the franchise known as Duke Nukem, and they're currently working on their fourth official title, Duke Nukem <laughs> Forever. <laughs> oh, no. Why is this in enemies nearby? This was in 2000? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Quite a different time period. That was when people were looking forward to dick kick him forever. Uh, oh, there's fucking Duke Nukem Forever concept art in here. Does anybody in Duke who's familiar with Duke Nukem Forever remember this prospector character that they were going to put in the game? Because uh, his concept art's in this book. It's crazy to think that uh, Dick Kick'em Forever would come out like 14 or no, 12 years later or something like that. Hey, you know, uh, Tez 6 is going to, it's going to take longer for Tez 6 to come out when, uh, compared to Skyrim, so. Yeah, and they've been working on it full time the entire time. <laughs> it's true. I heard about it from someone on YouTube. Oh, really? I can do another quest. I don't have to go do more thieving is there any on kingsfield uh i'm pretty sure like the japanese developers are very rare in this book that's kind of, that's why i like this book is it's going into the um it's going into the depths of the industry but it's primarily focusing on the west and that's just not something that you see anymore that's why it's kind of a time capsule I'm really wondering why that is. Like, why Western developers just don't talk as much. Is it the NDAs? Is it? I think I think the industry's just crushed them, and yeah. a lack of appreciation. Like a lack of appreciation. You're either an auteur or you're fucking nobody. Yeah. Or like you're some legacy developer. Like say War Inspector, right? You're some legacy developer that everybody knows from back in the day. They don't know what you've been up to recently. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I guess that that really could be it. This book's I mean, it's, got it's probably a, like a it's a combination of factors, I'm sure, but I, I can know, imagine just, that being a very crushing uh crushing thing for creatives. This book has a breakdown of puzzle styles. Um environmental puzzles, inventory puzzles, conversation based puzzles, and 
It's just a, like a miscellaneous puzzles category. I do. So. I did like the uh, the quote from Molyneux where he's like, "You have three routes to get in," and he said like the hardest was starting your own studio. I wonder how m like it, it, that probably still is you know the case to be the most difficult way to get in, but to break into the AAA, yes. Um, but starting your own company now is per much more viable. Like it was harder yeah. back then. It, yeah, it was definitely harder back then. I want to know. I, I'm curious, like how much more in line with the others now is it I, I guess it would depend on what you want to do if you just want to collect a paycheck doing game work then yeah just go work for a studio but if you actually want to make games i don't know i really do think starting your own studio is a more viable option at this point than going to yeah, work if for you, somebody if you else wanna, if you want to make games your ways and yeah the way and have or, or even just have like any serious creative input yeah it's like i want to i just want to make like good artwork that i'm allowed to you know, picked style off and stuff, and it's like, oh, maybe you should start your own studio then. All right, uh, Tim Willits from id Software. Every game has one overall mission or goal. The game then is made up of many single levels. Every level in turn must also have one overall mission. And every map must have a reason why it exists. It's important that the designer doesn't forget this. It happens a lot. A designer will be working on a level with a goal in mind, and then something happens. Sometimes a technology is introduced into the game, or a technical problem arises, and the focus of the map shifts. Sometimes the, de Sometimes the designers don't even realize that they've lost focus on their original goals of the level, but they have. When this happens, the designers must step back, look at where things are going, and focus more attention on the overall design and goals of the level, sometimes reworking areas or changing the goals to accommodate the map's mission. Basically, it's crucial that designers stay focused on their ultimate goals in designing a level. I'm going to say that's very relevant to Skyrim. <laughs> Is Undertale the biggest indie game ever? That would be Minecraft. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the the indie game that was that got so big people forgot that it was an indie game it started off as literally just one dude working on it in his spare time i was watching a video recently um somebody um uh, i'm gonna get his name wrong i think it's like chunk munt or something like that he did like a five hour uh retrospective and all the ultimate retrospective analysis on uh minecraft and um yeah it just reiterated it, it i want to do a minecraft video at some point but watching that video reminded me why i don't <laughs> i'm seeing a lot i'm seeing a lot of excuse making for why minecraft doesn't totally count minecraft totally counts just because it's super successful now doesn't mean it wasn't in any game mm -hmm. and it's like it's it funny, people people arguably, will say that Minecraft's design hasn't changed that much, and then like they'll try to say that oh no, it's changed too much from the it's indie game days yeah. to be still be considered an indie game. It's pretty funny. It's arg it, it arguably kicked off like the indie renaissance that we've seen. Um I think that was gonna happen regardless, but it probably did help propel that a bit because it made it it showed like, oh no, you can be wildly successful as an indie developer. And, um, yeah, when people see success, success breeds success, so. And you get people coming in being like, oh, maybe I'll try that. And it also helped establish a model that a lot of developers used for a while. No, like, <laughs> Minecraft was an indie game. Minecraft was an indie game. Focus your video on Minecraft's modding scene, and it's guaranteed to, to enter production hell. I, I already started getting into that with, uh, with fucking, uh, City Skylines. I yeah, started I'm, I'm doing not... modding, and I was like, oh god, this is, um, this I is I like the idea, slippery. but I'm not in the right mindset to do it. Mm -hmm. John Romero. Quote from John Romero. A level designer has a very responsible position, because maps are where the game takes place. Yep. 
Uh, first, Romero maintains that the inevitable breaking up of responsibilities at a development house can take away from the overall vibe and consistency of the level. Quote, some companies do their maps in stages with many different people handling different tasks. There's architecture, texture placement, object placement, and this specialization can take away from the cool factor. Although most of his suggestions, in quote, by the way, although most of his suggestions on what makes a good level are fairly universal, Romero also proposes an interesting rule that's broken more than it's obeyed, in his opinion. Quote, the gamer must be in constant fear, in quote, believes Romero. It's extremely important to keep gamers on their toes when playing shooters, with plenty of traps laying around so they're constantly in fear of dying. Uh, I talked about this in the Outer Worlds video, the landmines and the kind of, they're inconvenient, but they play an important role and you can't afford to like fuck up how your landmine is balanced. I wonder if the... I'm a random, living saint of Arke, and the chapel's chief cruc... Oh, I thought he was a, uh, beggar. Leave me alone. I, was, I, I was wondering if the, if... It, there, so there are no elf beggars in this game. I don't from think Cliff, anyway. From Cliff Blazinski. Ah, Cliffy B. Good pacing is a skill that applies to every element of level design. Pace your flow of monsters and have areas where the player feels like he is being engulfed by less intelligent cannon fodder foes, as well as areas that have just a few devious baddies that are hard as nails to take out. Know how often to reward the player with goodies or health. Don't cover the level with items. Rather, give him the prizes after monsters are killed, doors are opened, or a ledge is reached. You know, that's such a concise piece, like, little <laughs> piece of nugget of information, <laughs> of advice. That's what I like about this, is, like, these are people who have learned a lot of this from experience, and it's like, a lot of these lessons are just so internalized that they can just effortlessly and concisely state these things yeah and these are lessons that um that a lot of like modern games are failing so yeah. like for instance <laughs> this section of cliffy b's little sec thing is um monster ammo and health placement and then he call he calls this game flow so you, we might remember with my Fallout 76 video, I have a big section breaking down its pro the problems essentially with game flow. During the course of Unreal's development, I harassed the level designers to all... He harassed the level design. <laughs> <laughs> we know what he means. To always make their monsters patrol a local area or to have them spring out of the dark or even crash through glass at the player. If the player walks into a room and the monsters are just standing there waiting for him, oh no, he's not going to feel that this is a very believable world. The fucking this Bethesda games. <laughs> However, if he walks into a room and his foe is just walking past him to go to work on a computer terminal, he'll appreciate the extra effort that's been taken to further the believability. What a what what a fitting quote! To t oh no, oh oops, I killed somebody. Oh, you're gonna have to pay the Fuck. blood price. Fuck. You didn't even think about it. You've been playing Skyrim, haven't you? <laughs> All right, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and restart. Yeah, this is a fitting fitting quote to talk about while I'm literally dealing with a patrol. Uh -oh. Do you guys like? Do you guys like the Dark Souls get good attitude of developers? I know that's that sparked a big conversation. That came from the community. Dark Souls, here's the thing. Dark Souls is massively overrated as being a particularly difficult thing. Mm -hmm. What's difficult about Dark Souls is that it expects you to play at its pace. And games for about five years before Dark Souls release were not doing that anymore. Game design as a whole was shifting towards we have to facilitate the player as much as possible to, so that they stick around. And we uh, are adapting the game to fit the player's mindset rather than asking the player to fit yeah. the game's mindset. And so, like I said, Dark Souls is not a particularly difficult game. It's that it expects you to learn it. 
and yeah. that shocked people and that made people think that like oh it's this uber hard game it's not the hardest game i've ever played i don't it's, think any of the dark souls games would even register as being close to the hardest it's I've ever also played. there are a lot of things that are built into the game to make the game easier for the player if they're willing yes. to play if they're willing to play by its rules so it's like oh you're having trouble defeating this boss you can you know uh increase your stats and stuff um you can grind if you really want to or something like that uh or you have alternate options you have summons it's like there's a lot of different things but um because it doesn't have a difficulty slider is really what i think it just comes down to a lot of the time yeah it doesn't have a difficulty slider and expects a little more from you yeah but i don't i don't think miyazaki so there are actually miyazaki quotes where he talks about this and he says that his goal is to provide a challenge that the player can overcome so that they can feel satisfaction. Yes. When they when they complete the game. It's it, and, it, it's not because he wants to ball boss the player and he's like a sadist or something like that. I think the hardest thing to do in Soulsborne game is not fucking have NPC quest lines. You're absolutely fucking correct. Anybody that's ever completed an NPC quest line in a, in a Souls game followed a guide. I have no clue where the guides came from. It's so arbitrary. Uh, but there's more to the Cliffy B quote where he talks about ammo. Ammunition is always tricky to get right in a level. Too much ammo and the gamer breezes through the level without a sweat. Yep. Not enough ammo and your gamer's running around the level hacking at your foes with his default weapon while pondering, looking for cheats online. See, games don't have that problem anymore. Right, they were so scared of that potential outcome of players <laughs> running out of ammo that they completely stopped even trying to uh, create any sense of ammo economy. Yeah, that uh, rewards good management skills. Right when the player's thinking, "Boy, I'm going to be needing some ammunition soon," there should be a box of bullets waiting for him. The same rules apply for health. And see, I understand why out why open world games have this issue, but I also don't understand why we have all these crazy radiant systems that can't respond to how much ammo the player has. How much ammo you're finding in environments should be tied to how much you have. Yeah. You're going to pin the theft of the bust on Mavrina. She lives in the waterfront. Yeah, that could fail. No, that no, that's probably a shitty idea. <laughs> Well, open, no, open world games are always going to struggle with ammo. I think, no, because then it's arbitrary. I, I think you could, like... So, Fallout 76 is a great example. Where you had the double barrel shotgun, and it was a very mm -hmm. efficient weapon. Um, yeah, so, because shotgun shell placement was, like, tied to the combat shotgun, which uses, yeah, like, eight, eight times exa more Yeah, ammo. exactly. So, it's like, so how about, first off, based on the weapon that you're using, it's going to balance uh, the ammo economy around it so if you're using a double barrel shotgun you're not going to get as many shotgun shells as if you're using a combat shotgun but then i, I guess the, the fear then is oh well the player's just going to switch to using a combat shotgun so they can game the system and uh get more sh like shotgun shells but it's like you know what if if the player wants to game the fun out of their out of their game then just let them like uh, so we've got Mark Laidlaw stuff, um, and he breaks level design down into goals, gameplay, and atmosphere. And he talks a, a bit about how those three principles apply to the level office complex from Half-Life. So there's really great stuff in here. I love office complex. Um, and he's got a section on questionable ethics, too. on duty don't worry we'll get him metal the first met very first medal of honor game uh raven software talking about heretic 2 and soldier of fortune Get good, get good was used as a response towards players who were looking for the easy solution out of a situation. Let's clarify, it wasn't used as a response towards players by devs, because what you said implies that the devs were saying it. 
it was used as a, as a response by players against other players. The, the, the guarantee you, the number one person people that are perpetuating the whole get good thing is the Dark Souls community. What do you want? Can't you see I'm in the middle of an investigation? Uh, I don't know. From my perspective, you're literally just standing in the middle of a dark alley, but sure. <laughs> you know where the bust is hidden? Your credibility is suspect. You'll have to do better than that to persuade me. Now just, just go check her place out. Come on, man. I'm listening. Man, the senior game designer in gonna... Looking Glass Studios, Tim Stelmech's latest and arguably most impressive work is Thief the Dark Project and Thief 2. See? We got Thief in here. I knew it was in here, but... Damn it! It's in the, it's in the, uh, the level design section of the book, too. So if you want some good quotes about Thief level design, it's in here. Holy crap. How much do I have to bribe this dude? <laughs> Does this book have any Blizzard devs? Uh, actually, I did. I did pass over uh, Rob Pardo, who worked at Blizzard, and he uh, was in charge of unit balancing on StarCraft. He was the lead designer on StarCraft Brood War, and he has guidelines for his mission designers and asks oh they adhere God. to the rules. Keep it simple. Design on paper first. Artistically pleasing level. Clear briefings. He's got a lot of rules, but um, yeah, there's 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 a few there's some Blizzard stuff in here. You know what this screen needs to show? How much money you have. Don't worry. Does Oof. it? No, it doesn't. What do you hmm. I thought you had tons of money. <laughs> Not anymore. Your credibility. Certainly. That will get you something. Oh man, this is Okay, he's at 72. It's not going to let me go any higher. Okay. That's what we needed. Oops. You let that one slip. <laughs> hey, yeah, it's really awkward. It's really hard for them to convincingly include that kind of dialogue because it's always going to appear like super stilted. <laughs> Karen's wet dream. What a good line. <laughs> yep. What's the name of the book? Uh, Secrets of uh, Game Design Secrets of the Sages, Second Edition. I wonder if there are scans online. Do you guys have any interesting insights slash comments on League of Legends? I think that League of Legends is a bit after this book was written. Uh, we don't. I I played a little bit of League because I had friends who were into it. I think that's like most people's exposure to it. There was stuff I didn't like about League's equipment system. How um, League is obviously a very meta-driven game, but I feel that the equipment in particular kind of heavily discourages creativity with how you try to play. I felt like if I'm stifled into doing the exact same thing over and over with my character in League matches, why isn't the equipment just automatic? Which I think there were even options to like just preset what you're supposed to buy for the entire game. They really do categorize Hieronymus Lex as being a kind of a fucking idiot during this I know. class. That's why the turnaround on him is so weird. <laughs> Uh, no, I definitely wanted to be protecting my wife. Do you think that there was like a Todd Howard moment where he's like, I actually like this Hieronymus Lex character. Can you work Can you work him back into the story <laughs> with a positive ending? <laughs> now think about it from the player's perspective. We don't want the players to feel too grisly with what they're doing. Oh, wait, that's Emil. <laughs> All right, this is Jay Stelly, the uh, senior software engineer at Valve. 
Any game engine you can create or buy will have a set of technical constraints. You can choose some of these constraints, such as your target platform and target performance on that platform. Others are imposed by what hardware your audience owns. These choices do have consequences, of course. Let's look at an example. In Half-Life, we chose to support 3D accelerator cards for PCs. This allows people with additional 3D hardware to have higher image quality and frame rates. On the surface, this seems like an easy choice to make, but it comes with constraints on its own. One of the biggest challenges we faced was the fact that many of the 3D accelerators in the market only had access to 2 megabytes of memory for storing textures. To make matters worse, the cost of swapping old textures with new textures was pretty high on many of these cards, so using more than 2 megabytes caused a large frame rate decrease. This meant for Half-Life is that what what this meant for Half-Life is that we had to limit any individual scene in the game to a maximum of about 2 megabytes of visible textures. Damn, Armand. I, I, the the dialogue was was not grayed out. I'm sorry. I'm programmed to click on dialogues <laughs> that are not grayed out. <laughs> I also like how that you only gave me 100 gold for that, so it didn't even remotely compensate me for uh, all the fucking bribes that I had to pay. Yeah, should have had a charm spell. Maybe I should get a charm spell. <laughs> the Thieves Guild has a ton of position checks, so... Yeah. You can learn before you want to join the Mages Guild and do the, uh... uh the Breville quest. Oh, right. What level but is I'm this? I'm reading spell? fucking code... code, code. Uh, about code from a game design book, and they're fucking using switches <laughs> instead of Elsif Elsif <laughs> chains. Uh, getting robot again? Damn, it's happening a lot. I, I gotta. I'm gonna look into that tonight and see. What? Uh, with Bungie software. What? Uh. A programmer from Bungie. Man. This guy's gonna have a rough career after this book comes out. You too. What, wait, what was it? What was his, uh, credential? He's the, um, what's his official job title? He is a... God damn it, this chapter doesn't say it. I gotta go to the appendix to find what his official job title is. Uh, I can't tell if that's a C or a G. I'm noticing a lot of game developers have last names that start with C. Oh, wait. The voice of Rapture. Ooh, that is way too expensive. It also lasts for 30 seconds. Ah, right. I forgot. Charm spells. With duration. Mm-hmm. Mm. They still somehow still hadn't learned. <laughs> I can't find him in the appendix. It is my illusion skill, anyways? Why is it that every stream somebody asks if it's up on VODs? When was the I last time you unlisted a stream? Um, I did unlist the last one because yeah, it ended prematurely. Yeah. You didn't but miss it, much. But it is so I the ones that I unlist, I still leave them in the playlist for the for the VODs. That's too hard for the average YouTube user. <laughs> There's just too many degrees of separation. I don't know, maybe there maybe there's like a lot of people who just unlist their VODs. I know that happens a lot in Twitch for some fucking reason. It drives me insane. It's well, okay, it's an old school YouTube thing because of the, when there wasn't a live section. Ah, yeah, true, true. It might also be somebody that doesn't know that there is a live tab on the yeah, YouTube channel. Uh, page. Yeah. Because the first day that I, there's a guy who consistently streams on YouTube that I watch, and the first day that I encountered the live tab, I was very fucking confused where all his streams were. Because he he's rarely does videos. 
Uh, but anyways, he's a programmer on uh, Oni and Halo at Bungie. Ah. And his very first thing is get your game up and running as quickly as possible. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> This man's probably got war stories after Halo 2. <laughs> Bungie's GDC oh. talk was very revealing. Are we talking a game recent crashed. one? Oh, Damn, a... Oblivion game crash. Imp impressive that it made it almost four hours. No Oblivion. I'm not ending the stream just yet. Please kill me. <laughs> I've got a whole book I can read Oblivion. Oh right. I set the thing I set the the game setting I and I files to read only. It was, it was last year's GDC. It means Hang I have on. to do this every time. Sorry. Sorry everyone, I know I'm blowing your ears out. Alright, there we go. Okay, I grabbed the Phil Spencer interview. Bungie GDC 2022. From box products to live service, how Destiny 2 transformed Bungie. Oh my god, and oh. why did they title it that? Oh. That's a spiteful employee <laughs> right there. <laughs> oh, it transformed them all, right? It transformed them so much, specifically their income model, that, uh, Marathon has to be rebooted as a uh, extraction shooter because they need to get on that uh, microtransaction uh, treadmill with the game. That's where they talked about apathy versus people being angry, right? You need to watch it. It's the worst presentation ever. Oh. <laughs> How much Thieves Guild have you done? Um, here, here, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna put the book away, chat. I'm going to watch a bit of this presentation, and when I get to a good part that Private Sessions needs to listen to, okay. we'll put we'll throw on the watch together. Yeah. Unless somebody already knows the timestamp. There's a transcript. I'm going to search for the word apathy. Yeah, I remember I remember okay. having this conversation with somebody recently about Bungie and um they were saying how Bungie needs should go back to making uh like their old Halo games and stuff like that sort of model of like we just release the game and that's it. But um I was making the argument that their whole entire business model is now dependent upon constant income. Um so Maybe they'd be able to swing like a big publishing deal, but they would need a lot of money up front because their entire cost structure is dependent upon like they will not be able to pay the bills if their game is not monetizable like over a period of time. Uh, I can hear that on my end. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm getting us a timestamp now. Okay. Um, and yeah, I, f I feel a little vindicated after seeing Marathon and it's getting rebooted as an extraction shooter specifically for this reason. Do you want to keep playing and just play the audio? Um, yeah. Because the video, there's not much to the video. Yeah, it, it, yeah, there is that's... a slideshow component, but... Yeah, yeah, might as well just... I'll keep playing. All right, chat, tell us if the audio is balanced correctly, because uh, I can't hear Every it. possible definition of success. But unfortunately, that meant that we didn't have to think too deeply about which of those successes really mattered. By contrast, Destiny 1 was the first game that Bungie made in well over a decade that didn't receive universal critical acclaim. And this was like a really big blow to our studio culture at the time, because in many ways it felt like failure. And what we didn't realize when we launched Destiny 1 was that Destiny was already becoming a success in the ways that mattered. Engagement was the true measure of success for a franchise like ours, but we, oh, didn't, we didn't know it yet. And a lot of our efforts to make a better Destiny 2 were because we had a wrong internal definition of what success was. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, so I looked this guy up. So, number one, he started at Bungie with Destiny. Oh, God. 
So he's talking about how their community culture changed when he's he started there in January of 2010. Yeah. So basically, like he doesn't really know the culture. So he's a star fucker. Oh my god, this is this is horrifying to hear, because like what I'm hearing is like this is how creatives lose focus. This is how they go astray. Is they're met with criticism and they go, no, that criticism isn't valid. Um, we're just going to redefine what success metrics are. So this guy started as the activities engineering lead, went to senior engineering, gameplay design director, design director, production director, Destiny 2 general manager, and now he's Bungie's oh. chief development officer. Whoa. Well, we can say this, this uh, presentation didn't tank his career, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I hate to say it, but like, um, because I know we were having this discussion where uh, it would have been nice to see like Halo not die, but I genuinely think Halo was going to die regardless. I think the, like Bungie got out at just the right time to basically come out on top and be like, yeah, we, you know, we made the best Halo games. But um, I know it's crazy because two games prior to this gate this guy joining they had a, a OD ODSC, odsc yeah i know which has so many banger levels in it, it it's it's it, it's crazy to see it but it's, it's it's just what happens man we gotta we gotta keep drinking the poison here yeah <laughs> you can you can fix your review scores you can fix your sentiment you can even fix your sales as long already i'm fuck i'm oh, no you, you can fix your review scores Ooh. I, I hate every aspect of this. <laughs> as long as you have engagement, as long as you have a community of players who care about and are passionate about your game, even when that passion is being expressed as like anger or frustration. No. Anger, we, we eventually learn like anger is not the opposite of loving a game. Anger is like two degrees off from loving a game, and they both come Ooh. from passion. From people um, who are high it depends on the anger. Yeah, um, I mean, I wouldn't say that I'm, I'm two degrees away from loving Bethesda again. Yeah, I'm not two degrees away from loving Fallout 76. Well, okay, and here's the here's the problem with this <laughs> metaphor. Two degrees doesn't convey anything because there's a big difference in location between a meter of two like two degrees <laughs> you got a point two degrees a meter not that far apart a light year you're in different solar systems like are we talking two degrees fahrenheit or two degrees celsius like we, yeah i mean <laughs> we can yeah, shit I mean, on this from a from a few different angles here but there's, there's many it's very obvious that this is a manager because his metaphor fucking sucks <laughs> but like um it's just the amount of time that you have that degree separation the further and further apart anger and love are going to be yeah so yeah your metaphor fits in the sense that the longer that people hate your game the <laughs> harder it's going to be for you to get those fans back <laughs> yeah yeah so like two degrees at the inception like oh we we pissed them off for a week and yeah, they'll come right it. back because yeah. it's not that far apart but if it's two degrees carried across uh three years that's going to be a lot harder to repair you know this guy's a fucking communications major and not a yeah, math major because yeah. a math major would have not done a math metaphor really <laughs> <laughs> engaged with what you're making and the opposite of loving a game the thing that could kill you is apathy and that's so much more scary than anger hmm uh, to a, it, to again, a degree, he's to correct. To a degree, he's not wrong. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of games in my library that, like Outer Worlds, yeah. is a good example. People aren't angry at Outer Worlds; they're just apathetic about it. Yeah, it's and just that's like, really uh, what killed that game. More yeah. people would talk about it if they were angry at Outer Worlds. People are just they say it's the most mid game. That's how it gets the aggressively average label yeah. <laughs> or the most mid game ever. Those labels aren't accurate in any way except for describing but it's the the feeling the game gives you of the just same apathy. but at the same time that also isn't really the case because like i, I made this joke the other day where uh, i consider outer worlds to be the most famously forgettable game 
Name a game that uh, that is forgettable, and nine times out of ten, people are going to say, "Oh, it's Outer Worlds." Here's the game that yeah. you really should know: Anthem. That's the game yep. they wanted you to forget. That's, that's a game that's totally <laughs> slipped out of the social consciousness. <laughs> yes, and it's like out because you saw it with Avowed. Once they they made the announcement for Avowed, and people are still talking about Avowed right now. Outer Worlds, like it was forgot like it was and people were apathetic to it but they didn't really forget it so it's like it depends on like the type of ap- apathy we're talking about and I really i really think it comes down to um repetition so it's like people forgot about anthem because dragon age 2 dragon age inquisition mass effect 3 mm-hmm. um it's uh, in the middle of this andromeda and it's, it's like it's at the end like so many bad forgettable games have happened since like if if they dropped Andromeda or Anthem rather after Mass Effect Two, it would be an Outer World situation where people would be like, "Yeah, it was whatever, not really great." It was but... aggressively average. Yeah, but yeah, then, yeah. You know, Mass Effect Three came out, and <laughs> and I think that's that's one of the other things too is like after watching your video, um, Outer Worlds is not really average. It's a pretty bad game. Like from, yeah, from the storytelling no, I... perspective, they utterly failed. And that's a story-heavy game from a developer that, that is, I'll like, is known a- for storytelling. The only thing I'll say is average is the gameplay. Yeah, that's basically it. Uh, everything else is pretty and it, bad. Not just in the subjective, I didn't like the story component. In the objective, here's how many players got fucking filtered. Yeah. By this, <laughs> 25% by this actually finished the game. That's, uh, yeah. As someone pointed out... More people have beat America and Elden Ring than have uh, completed Outer Worlds, percentage-wise. <laughs> so I'm I'm loving this. This is full of Quotes. beautiful cherries. Quotes. <laughs> okay, so anybody who's in the like anybody who follows like Destiny YouTube videos, I've been seeing those get posted occasionally. Mm-hmm. Tell me that this fucking talk is in every <laughs> Destiny video. I'm kind of amazed. I watched a Destiny video recently that didn't feature this. Dude, Destiny when, when YouTube this? should be like just quoting this constantly. When was this? 2022 GDC. Okay, so it's it should it, it's relevant enough at this point that it should be appearing in a lot of uh, recent Mar- enough that it should that would be appearing. Be, that would be March of 2022. Oh god, you know what's the funny thing is? This guy became the the CDO of Bungie after this talk. <laughs> So as of this talk, he's <laughs> like just I Destiny said, 2's general manager. Like I said, he, ch- you know, so that tells you a lot. That tells you that the culture of Bungie has fundamentally changed enough that this dude did not get, sh- like, blown out of a fucking cannon. That's scary. That's really, that's really sad to see. Yeah, I mean, this would be like, I would clip out just the the good parts of this and have these video files on standby if i was a destiny youtuber yeah <laughs> this would be a meme on my channel i love these kinds of mask off moments i love gdc i need to watch more stuff from gdc because mm-hmm. consistently i find myself fascinated with yeah all the kinds of stuff that come out of there when's the next gdc March of 2024. I'm kind of curious where it's going to be. Don't say anything to... I don't understand it. San Francisco? Oh, it's going to be in the States? Last time I looked at, thought about going to GDC, it was in Germany. Yeah. If it's in San Francisco, I'll, I'll fucking tolerate San Francisco to go to GDC. All right, so we're going to do this quest to get that charm I'm, I'm, spell. This is a great fucking quest to listen to this too, by the way. This yeah. nothing mages guild quest <laughs> just to get a charm spell. <laughs> Couldn't you steal the staff? Hang on. Oblivion mages guild. I wonder if the staff is actually more powerful than the spell, because that sounds like an oblivion. Yeah. Thing. <laughs> Breville recommendation. So the spell is Captivate. So it's 10 points on the staff and 10 points on the spell. Okay. Okay. The the staff does the exact same thing as the spell. Thank God. Oh, no. I've got bad news for you, though. 
What? This is one of those spells in Oblivion that's way more costly than uh, a custom spell. Ah. Uh, wow, what's the duration on it? It's 10 points, 10 seconds. Beguiling okay. Touch. Beguiling Touch is 12 points, 30 seconds for four less Magicka. What the fuck? Where do I get where do I get beguiling touch? That sounds like it's just um uh, the Breville Guild Hall. Fuck doing this quest then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say we're, we're only doing this quest for the spell. But yeah. In typical Bethesda fashion, the freebie spell still <laughs> fucking sucks. <laughs> this is what I love about like, Bethesda why? games. It's an endless it's an endless font of like bizarre design decisions <laughs> that just don't make sense. I, I love a lot of I it, love quest of, lines that don't reward me with anything. Look up in the transcript motto and listen to them changing their motto. Okay, I will need to cue that for later. Uh, I want to because we still haven't gotten the the juicy line. Beguiling sp and it's only 175 gold. All right. Um. Oh, we're not even far from the quote. We could just let it keep playing um, and uh, we'll hit the motto thing. Okay. Maybe. Uh, no. Uh. Spell effectiveness is tied to your level, so the spell effect that you would have gotten would have still been much weaker. Are you looking at my screen right now? Yeah, eight points for 30 seconds. On both these spells? Yeah, no, okay, so that's the thing. Um, Alluring Gaze and Beguiling Touch have the same... No, one's target, one's touch. Oh, okay. okay. Why the fuck would you care about a target? I don't know. The alert... <laughs> I was I, I I didn't I mentally I was so used to, especially in Morrowind's the dumb fucking spell design. Uh, alluring gaze is like seven more magicka. Oh. Let's see. Can I get like any there's there's so much weird stuff. You really need the UESP if you play magic, especially in Oblivion, yeah. because of how arbitrary <laughs> stuff is. Even though auto auto magicka calculation is a thing, there's a ton of spells that are just bizarre. Like, uh, and you don't even have to go that far to look. So, uh, for instance, the spell Void Gazer, Night Eye 150 seconds. By Oblivion's logic, that spell should cost 330 Magicka. It is manually set to cost 54. If you thought that Night Eye should be that cheap, why aren't, like, Night why isn't Night Eye just significantly cheaper? Is there anyone here who bought a Cure Paralyze on Self Spell in Morrowind? Um, that's actually got an application in Tez 3 MP just because you can Cure Paralyze on others. And to get that spell, you need to, you need to buy another spell. Oh my god. <laughs> Mommy? <laughs> it's a fucking smile. Can you tab over? Can you tab over to the watch together? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's a thumbnail i don't know like next stream I, that's a thumbnail <laughs> i love i love oblivion for reasons like this like people were saying don't play bosmer don't play bosmer it's hilarious <laughs> i swear it's modded to make you even shorter uh, some something's going on <laughs> okay so um, do you like do you like this image in the watch together i don't see anything in the watch together the screen's black uh, um, let me let me play, play it. Okay, I, I played it and it just popped up. All right, look at on. this image he's using. Let me switch over. All right, what we got? We make games we want to play. Okay. So you can see they've got Oni, Halo One, Halo Two, Halo Three, ODST, mm -hmm. Reach, and then Destiny, Destiny expansion, Destiny expansion, oh, Destiny no. expansion. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> as i was saying uh bungie's monetization model does not permit them to make games anymore which is funny because like they didn't want to make like map packs and stuff like that for some of their halo games they didn't even want to do um odst uh so they wanted to charge like less for odst when you know because they're like oh well you know it'll be like kind of like an expansion thing if we have to make it and and now they are, they left the evil corporation to become an evil corporation themselves. 
I I prefer games to DLC, but I do. There is a ratio. I like when Bethesda makes a Shivering Isles. I don't yeah. like when Bethesda makes thirty five DLC packs <laughs> for their games. Um. So uh, at some point you have to cut it loose. I mean, the thing is, is like, I know some of the Destiny expansions were really well regarded by players and stuff. Um, they were like pretty extensive and all that. Um, I doubt all of them were, though. <laughs> listen, listen, chat. I know you know where this is going. We're going to keep watching the talk for the part with the mottos. So, so from way back in the Halo days, all the way through Destiny 2 launch, our process was pretty straightforward. We would hire the best talent in the industry. We would give them a lot of freedom to use their creative guts and their creative process to make whatever they considered to be the best game possible. We'd release that product with a big... I love that he keeps saying we as though he has any ownership over this, uh, <laughs> over this process and not that he fucking parasitically stuck on oh, man. with Destiny. Bang, and the largest marketing push we could manage... Stolen Valor. ...that success by every definition would follow from that. And this was all summed up at the time by our studio motto, we make games we want to play. And this is in at the wall in front of our studio. And we believe that when you trust your gut on making something awesome. You know that he's a communication major <clears throat> because this image looks like total shit. <laughs> because, okay, he's taken a picture of this motto, but it's at an angle. But yeah. he's made like a regular circle and <laughs> paint or something. And it doesn't quite line up right. Making something that you can't wait to play that all of the different forms of success that you might want, critical acclaim, sales, engaged players, those all just flow naturally and intuitively from that. And this picture is old and grainy because it's an old, it's an old picture I actually found on my cell phone because we took down that motto a little while after D2 launch as we evolved our view of what success really meant. And our new studio motto, this is a more recent picture, <laughs> is we create worlds that inspire friendship. Right. So it's not about making games we want to play anymore. It's about <clears throat> facilitating friendships. I don't think you want to run a game studio. I think you want to run a pub. Yeah, I think you want to run a social media platform. Man. That's a... I, I, listen... As a business major, I've looked at a lot of different businesses. I've done a lot of research. I've sat through a lot of fucking classes. I've seen a lot of company mission statements and stuff like that. This might be the worst one I've ever seen. It, it means mean nothing. Yeah, it means nothing devoid of context or with even and with context, it makes it even worse. It's like as a game, it's like the fuck does that even mean <laughs> i like it's so obvious that destiny is a tumor on bungie just looking at this picture yeah because <clears throat> it's like because they've given destiny expansions equal footing with whole entire halo games halo three <laughs> just <laughs> destiny house of wolves on <laughs> equal footing with halo fucking three yeah, and they're running out of wow. space because they decided to do this. Wow. Halo 3. Halo 2, the game that literally created online matchmaking for, for the Xbox. Like, they literally had to make whole systems for the Xbox ecosystem that they carried. Uh, they, had to, they had to change the Xbox's, like, framework at one point that made Halo, that killed Halo 2. Because so much of what they made was migrated into the backbone of Xbox Live. That is on equal footing with Destiny House of Wolves. <laughs> Halo 1, the That's game that fucking basically created console shooters as we know it today. With the control scheme and couch co-op split screen. And how much of it is still playable? On equal footing with Destiny House of Wolves. My God. <laughs> and we thought, we thought, we thought Bethesda was throwing shade on their old stuff with uh, just ignoring Fallout 76. I think this is worse. 
No, this is totally worse. I'm so glad that this I is like, shit from Bungie. <laughs> this is, this is, it, it's, it's kind of sad because like, you know why it happened because people just, people play Destiny and they were disappointed with Destiny because like, yeah, but it's, it's not Halo. Like this, like you guys are known for making a specific type of game and Destiny, like, and people were willing to try it out too, but there's just a lot of st stuff that was wrong with Destiny and a lot of people checked out on it, myself included. And that was just catacly. I mean, he said it himself. Like, they were used to making games that were banger after banger, and then Destiny just wasn't a banger. And uh, yeah, that really fucked with their culture, I guess. The lightning rod's pointing right at Destiny, too. Yeah. <laughs> Man. Someone said that all of the Destiny 2 expansions aren't playable anymore, which I find to be wild, if true. Well, isn't you can't even play Destiny One, right? Like that whole thing is gone now. This isn't. This is crazy. This is. <laughs> How do looking, you have this mask off of a moment? <laughs> you're looking at another walking corpse. Yep, and that's the scary thing too. Like that's a, that's kind of the sad thing is that nobody even knows. Like I didn't know Bungie had fallen this fucking far. And I'm a like I'm a. Hard Halo 2 is like one of my favorite games of all time. Halo 3, I regard as really high too. I, all the fucking Halo games, I love them all. You know, you know, I'll say this you should go back to playing Oblivion. We can keep listening to this because this is a beautiful <laughs> break from Bethesda. <laughs> be, being able to have the context of it could be a lot worse. Something you else could, that you liked just as much got bastardized far it could worse. Be a, it could be a lot worse. The studio could be in denial. There's an alternate and timeline been taken where I, over by parasites. There's an alternate timeline where I played Destiny and ended up being like as anti Bungie as I am anti Bethesda. Yeah. Oh, her disposition. It's been it's been know. about 1,200 days since Destiny 2 had a new PvP map. Halo Infinite? Man, Halo Infinite's <laughs> got more P PvP updates than <laughs> Destiny 2. <laughs> Man. And this new studio purpose has a bunch of benefits over the old one, like including the fact that we make games we want to play. It sounds a little too much like it's just like gatekeeping for bald middle aged white guys. <laughs> well, could you play that again? Um, <laughs> I did not expect that the studio motto. This is a more recent picture is we create worlds that inspire friendship. And this new studio purpose has a bunch of benefits over the old one, like including the fact that we make games we want to play. It sounds a little too much like it's just like gatekeeping for bald middle aged white guys like me. What? What? You know, whoever came up with that quote. I'm sorry, I don't know off the top of my head, but you know whoever came up with that quote, if they're dead, they're spinning in their grave at, at, at light speed. Because the cultural context that that quote came out of was very prevalent. This is this is totally a guy from 2010 because where did where the fuck did he work before? He, this this asshole worked at Pandemic. This guy was a gameplay programmer at Pandemic and he doesn't get what the quote is means. Oh, man. Okay. The era that Bungie came up in was an era that was defined by shovelware. It was defined by companies that were making games that they knew they didn't want to play. None of them were going home and playing the game for fun. They figured that half the audience didn't want to play it. It was just, hey, someone ordered a Chronicles of Riddick game. So we have to make a Chronicles of Riddick game. That was the era that Bungie was fighting for their fucking life to escape Microsoft's stranglehold with Halo. Okay? That's the era and the context that they came from. They came from an era when people were making games that not even they wanted to play. And to say that that is an example of gatekeeping is just... It's so beautiful. And he works that... that that race and age and all that shit angle into it. Yeah, he um, he just slipped that in there too. What? Man, it's like each sentence is just like <laughs> <laughs> worse and worse. A, a, yet another step into hell. Each sentence is a quote. <laughs> like, 
this up until this point, this guy probably had a boss, right? A boss who would say, yeah. you can't say that because it's too it's too much. It's too obvious that you're a psycho who doesn't understand anything. <laughs> and, you know, he had a handler. And it's at this oh, point that it's obvious fuck. that he no longer has a handler. He's making his own decisions about the things that he wants to say. And he has no self-awareness to say, hey, this seems like a huge mask off moment <laughs> that no that nobody's going to like. Oh, man, this is incredible. <laughs> this I is, love this. <laughs> this is this is great egg right here. Um. I just realized I fucked myself by joining the Mages uh, Guild because I was going through stealing stuff in the Mages Guild. That's how I was uh, climbing the ranks. And oh, I can't... Yeah, just... A lot of the stuff's not going to be considered stealing now. Oh. Because I'm part of the I'm part of the guild. I might uh, I might be able to do this with the Fighters Guild, but they're not going to have uh, they're not going to have as nearly as nice of stuff to steal. Mm-hmm. Mm, you let the intrusive thoughts win. Yeah, that's a good explanation, man. <laughs> This is hilarious. <laughs> and he got promoted after this. Mm-hmm. That promotion was a shoe-in. <laughs> Besides adopting a more global and inclusive view, this is really about a shift away from that box product mindset into the service mindset. And again, I... <laughs> <laughs> Told you, each sentence gets worse. Oh, my God. I mean, he's Stop. not wrong. The, mo the motto change is absolutely emblematic of the total yeah. collapse of Bungie's work culture. Yeah. My. It's always funny the people who complain about gatekeeping the most are the ones who should have been gatekept. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I'm not talking about the product design. I'm not talking about business models or like free to play or microtransactions. I'm talking about something much more fundamental to how we think about success. So what's a life service game beyond the business model? Life service as a term defines a business model. Yes. Nobody plays live service games. Like the players aren't happy to hear it's a live service game. Let's put it that way. Okay, so he's coming in with some interesting ideas. He's got his own definition that he's going to give us. If people thought YouTubers make shit up, <laughs> they can come up with made up terms. No, yeah, you, gotta you talk, guys you haven't gotta, been to GDC. Yeah, you got to talk to marketing people and uh, corporate ha mouthpieces. But yeah, everybody with a communications degree is taught how to make up terms. Yeah. Like, if you think about the best... Okay, so we're getting a montage of the best games on the screen right now. Um... I don't know how to feel about this montage he's showing. The first image that pops up is a... Monta it is a, itself a collage of um, Naughty Dog games, uh, uh, what the fuck, Uncharted and Last of Us One, and then there's a separate image which is Ghost of Tsushima, and then there's a third image which is Elden Ring. I don't know what the connective tissue between each of these games is, <laughs> and or what any of them have to do with games as a service, because I'm pretty sure none of them are games as a service. So uh, let's hear him out. Let him finish play or microtransactions i'm talking about something much more fundamental to how we think about success like if you think about the best triple a box product games out there like the last of us yeah. the tsushima's the elden ring none of these images are the last of us by the way the <laughs> last of us image that's used is the first game mm. so uh this dipshit can't even put together a slideshow with the correct images. <laughs> and he's disparaging. What he's saying is these are standout instances of box product games. Okay. So this is the, this is the competition that he thinks is doing it wrong is Elden Ring, Ghost of Tsushima, uh, Naughty Dog games. There's plenty more that I can throw up on here. Horizon, like core to the box product mindset in these games what okay but what do, what do you mean about horizon are you saying it's a bad thing it's a good thing i assume he's in the good thing camp but he's saying but so he's saying that like there's going to be a twist where like but here's all these instances of bad box product games and it's like okay here's the fucking laundry list of 99 percent of live service games that <laughs> yeah. were a horrible addition to the industry 
And yours, I got yours news included. Yours, yeah, yours is on the list. Yours at the top. <laughs> is the goal of exceeding your expectations in every way across every axis. They blow your mind with their scale, with their polish, with their quality. At their best, they often almost feel like perfect games. The, the, only, the only but here is, and then you have live service games, which are none of these aspects. Like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand the, uh, the, where he's going with this because I, I, I cannot anticipate his, the way his brain works and how he's going to spin this into being inferior to being the live service games. What year is this chat? This is from 2022, as in last year. Is, we all the, know the, that there's going to even have games here. These products don't start perfect. <laughs> what? What? Of course they don't start perfect. What do you mean? <laughs> is your observation that Elden Ring didn't spawn from the ether as the perfect video game? That's a problem. And if also, you, listen, if your game's not going to be perfect right out of the gate in gray box. You need to make it a live service game. You need to make it a live service game so you can monetize. At least you can monetize the shitty versions, okay? So he's... Oh, I know where he's going. He's going to say, you're not going to make the perfect video game, so release the shitty version and monetize the process of you fixing it up into a competitor to these box service games. I mean, it is GDC. He is making a presentation for other developers, so... Is this the Diablo Immortal guy? Worse. It's a guy at... Bungie. Uh, by the way, the, on screen on his slideshow screen right now, he's showing the Pixar logo while talking about something not starting out perfect. So, I'd be really curious where this metaphor is going to go in relation to Pixar. Like one of my favorite old quotes from a Pixar interview that I love is, "All of our movies suck at first. Said by somebody who's probably a lot more intelligent than you and has a much better point. <laughs> How can you, like, I know a bit about the uh, production of The Incredibles, and I know full well that everybody who worked on that movie probably would hate you if you were on their team. Which, like, it sounds weird. It's almost it's almost incomprehensible when as as consumers, all we get to see is this near perfect run. This is the problem, right? Because we're saying this is being told to other game developers and then he's explaining basic concepts of creativity. Hey, when a project starts, it's not perfect, which by the way, <laughs> the average consumer knows. Yeah. It's like, seriously, you're telling me that you could survey the average consumer and ask them, do you think that games spawn into existence in their finished state? <laughs> and they would and, and they would more than 50 percent of the time actually say yes i believe that these games spawn into existence well this is a this is a i i could see a modern bungee thinking that um players are that fucking stupid given that their audience is destiny fans <laughs> listen it's the it's the audience you cultivate as i always say dude this is wild I love this. <laughs> this is the, the uh, so me and private have been on a binge of like uh, industry fly on the wall of corporate meetings type shit with the uh, there was a Sega leak from the 90s. And then there was the recent the Sony leak, I think, yesterday. Yeah. So like we are eating up anything that's uh, game corpo types, not even like developers, just the corporate types that are fucking everything up, being candid about being candid about it. Because it's like it's easy to be cynical and say, "Oh, they're running things into the ground," but I, you know, I love them having mask off moments. I this is entertaining. Yeah, this doesn't piss. I mean, it minorly pisses me off, but it's more like it's. The, listen, as a, as a professional in this, um, he's just giving me quotes to work in a video. <laughs> yeah, this is this Thank is you. beautiful. Yeah, which like it sounds weird. It's almost it's almost incomprehensible when as as consumers, all we get to. Also, by the way, Cars 2 was out at this point, so don't tell me that <laughs> Pixar fans don't understand that not all Pixar movies are bangers.
to see is this near perfect run of artistic products coming out of Pixar and now Disney. But now Disney? We have a near perfect run of products coming out of now Disney? This is how hmm. delusional this fucking guy is. Is he delusional or is he just like completely out of touch? I think he completely <laughs> buys into the, like he buys into new Star Wars and all that stuff, you know. Yeah. Look this at how much money they're making with it. This guy is a grade A consumer. He's got no perspective on art. He's got no perspective yeah. on any kind of objective measure of of quality. And so this is the type of guy that's lapping shit up on Disney Plus. And I don't know if he wants a job there or something. Like, <laughs> man, this is wild. Now, now he's <laughs> like, this is talk about Destiny 2 where he's defending new Disney. As, as consumers, all we get to see is this Didn't near Disney just delist a, a movie they just released mm -hmm. like two months ago. Yeah. New I, Disney. You, People are saying it's for tax purposes. I don't understand how what? delisting the movie from the streaming service means you don't have to pay taxes on it. That's a, oh, maybe maybe the movie was doing so well, we, right? Oh yeah, that we needed to be a loss. Yeah, we needed to be a loss. <laughs> yeah, we know that Hollywood is very good at uh, tax avoidance by like turning every turning everything that sh should objectively be a success into a technical financial loss, so they don't yeah. pay taxes on anything. Oh, interesting. The paintbrush jar does not I have think, its broken physics. I think that's the thing. His it's not the paintbrush jar; it's the paintbrushes. No, no, no. The paintbrush jars also had a uh, a broken physics thing where if you dropped it, they would like go back and forth in perpetuity, oh, like it, okay. like an endless uh, momentum machine. Um, I think what it is is my high frame rate because I'm be. playing it. I have a mod that uncaps. It's like it fixes like a lot of shit, so you can play it at like a uh, uncapped frame rate. So interesting. Uh, as someone in chat pointed out and is probably correct his objective Actually, measure is monetary stone. success as in mm -hmm. so if it's monetarily successful that means that it is successful which i think ghost of tishima and horizon are very weird examples to evoke as monetary successes because i'm pretty sure they weren't i, th I don't think they were huge monetary successes yeah run of artistic products coming out of pixar and now disney but we're all familiar with what the creative process is actually like behind the scenes, that nothing starts great, nothing starts perfect. Making anything great is always about iterating through failure after failure, making it just a little bit better each time until you finally have something incredible. And this idea of taking a game, taking any creative idea, and doing all of that iteration in secret at your studio so that the only thing you release, the only thing your audience sees is near perfect, that is what we're talking about at Bungie when we say the box product mindset. That's still like completely out of touch because like most gamers are pretty aware that like games are being released in a broken state. Yes. You would have to be cosmically lucky to have not played a game that didn't release in its uh final fixed state i'm i'm curious what the people in the in the audience are thinking right now yeah i'm here like i'm really curious what this audience is it's gdc so nobody can like boo him yeah yeah but, but is, are there like people like sitting there just like putting their hands on their face just like oh my we, god well please. remember this whole statement is about proving why the box product strategy as he calls it is a bad yeah. thing yeah, yeah it's yeah. a bad thing because consumers just see the perfectness of it and live service is great because you get to be more human oh my god because you that's that's even crazier yo but this guy this guy is fucking the kool-aid merchant Th that's insane that they at least be transparent about it and be like, oh, yeah, we can make money on the back end while we're still in development and stuff. But like to try and pitch it as, oh, no, it, it'll make you more human and stuff. It's like, yeah, I think a lot of developers have been on the um on the bad end of gamers is uh, short um, their short fuses. Um, and the understand that that a lot of a lot of players really don't have that much patience. 
So they're not going to see that as uh, as the developer being humanized. But, but see, Destiny has maintained an audience despite them showing their their true development selves. Let's see what he says. Yeah, I want, I'm yeah, very yeah, curious yeah. if he goes that angle. Guide, guided mostly by your talent and your gut until you have something amazing. Then you release it with this Who's giant marketing face? explosion. Oh my god. Dude, you know that um, Halo Reach had a beta. Halo 3 had a beta. Did Halo 2 have a beta? No. Betas were very common at the, not just when he joined Destiny, which I'm sure Destiny had a beta, but yeah, like did. throughout his career. And yeah. betas are on box products. So gamers are not just aware that video games actually have to be produced, that they don't just manifest, but that um, they even get to participate somewhat in the process, and especially <laughs> on the early access side of the industry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that's the other thing, too, is like he's completely ignoring the whole early access. Like, Hello. do people under people under I, I just don't get this argument whatsoever. Players do not understand that games are not released as perfect products. This is what this is good stuff. What the, the fuck? The doors off. And, and to be clear, like, I'm not knocking this process. It's amazing. I have tons of respect for every one of these studios, every one of these games. Like, this, this idea of seeming like you never miss is why I originally applied to work at Bungie. An excellent. That's... I think... He was one of those he's he was totally one of those Halo fans that was on the forum so that was like he was defending uh during the Halo Reach beta armor lock <laughs> and the huge grenade explosion radius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The and like the tactical all, nukes. All of the huge like problems that were in the Halo Reach beta. He was defending it because Bungie was perfect, right? So he is totally one of those fans that internally codifies this idea of um this circular logic of these companies that I like are perfect because they have a track record of being perfect. That's, yes. a, that's a circular loop. It goes over and over and it becomes fanatical. They cannot, they cannot do harm. Yeah. So you like see, you see that in fallout and fallout too, honestly. Yeah. Which like, if you were in the halo community, you knew the whole time that there was discourse all the time about the things that were wrong with the games. Like I'm going to give yeah. you a blast of the past. Cause it's preserved on the RB and the chief series. When, Bungie did the Halo 3 patch to try and address uh, simultaneous melee kills. And there was a huge like outrage with that. So anybody who was active in the community, which I assume is his angle. And we use a game developer at that point. But, you know, if he's got this perception that Bungie was perfect, that's because he wasn't paying attention. Or that he has this perception that people thought that Bungie was just perfect and nailing it out of the park every time. And even at the time we were having these discussions. It's hilarious. This guy's like a total uh, consumer. Got anything else? And he worked at Pandemic. He was a gameplay programmer in 2003 at Pandemic, a lead gameplay programmer in 2004. Hang on. Battlefront 2 2005 credits. What's this guy's name? Justin. Okay. Oh, thank God he didn't work on Battlefront 2. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll, I'll check his last name, too. No, he's not credited. All right. Pandemic Studios. Did he work on Mercenaries, World in Flames? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out what ex <laughs> what does he have a credit on? Does it not tell me how much I fenced in my... Uh, Mercenaries Playground... Uh, oh, no. Mercenaries 2. Uh, let's see. Let's cross-reference. In 2006, he was a senior programmer. Okay, that's a good question. Oh, no, wait. His LinkedIn references the game. This fucking guy, dude. <laughs> he worked on Full Spectrum Warrior Tin Hammers as the lead gameplay programmer and The Saboteur as the senior programmer. The oh, fucking... Oh, God. The, the Saboteur... saboteur. This is this this is this guy's end of Bungie, the fucking saboteur. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the black and white gimmick that they did with that really. Isn't that the last game that they even did and then they shut down? Yeah. 
that's the that's his uh that's his senior design credit holy shit talk about talking up your resume yeah i know like i was impressed that he had a pandemic credit until i realized what fucking games he worked on there's nothing that nobody liked i had a f i had a feeling that's what it was going to be like <laughs> it was the tail end of pandemic no he was no that's the funny thing is he's there the whole time he's there from 2003 2003 right didn't they have a did yeah. they have a um so he was there mmo most... as well he was there uh did they he was definitely there for most of the company's lifespan uh 2003 to 2009 yeah he he uh got laid off when they shut down but i mean they started in 1999 so he was there for most of the lifespan of the company and those are his credits wild <laughs> i need to know the gdc and guy who did this destiny presentation i need to avoid anything this nuts for brains is involved in that's easy it's destiny. anything destiny yeah any, anything, any, bungee. anything bungee yeah because this guy is the chief development officer as in he has a top of the line absolute top of bungee management position this isn't just some middle level manager you know lead designer or anything this guy is above everything i remember he got that position after giving this talk so like what he's saying vibes with with, with, with whatever's with, above him. The, yeah, with what's the CEO. Go, with yeah. And uh No, they're not owned by anybody anymore, but um yes, they are. Uh they're owned by Sony now. Oh, they that that's formalized? Yeah. I, oh, that's why he's using so many Sony games as examples. Oh. <laughs> This presentation is why I think the Marathon reboot is going to suck. This presentation oh, yeah. and, uh, oh, I don't yeah. know, like 10 years Just, of Destiny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when they said Marathon Extraction Shooter, I was like, oh, I'm out. This is great. This is this, fucking great. This is wild. Keep talking, man. Dude, there's 40, <laughs> there's 45 more minutes. <laughs> these are his mask off moments in just 13 <gasps> minutes oh of which god. we've only seen five we didn't even see the first eight minutes oh my god and so i'm not trying to criticize it i'm just setting it up to contrast it with a different approach that we've now had to adopt for destiny so so if that's the boxed product approach then what is the service approach and mindset by contrast and more than anything else, being a service is about being fast. Well, you have to remember when when it was announced, we intentionally made it so that all of the announcements that came from the Sony thing had to sound like jokes. Yeah. So when someone yeah, said yeah. marathon extraction shooter, that <laughs> blended right in with all the shit posts. <laughs> when did this go from an oblivion stream to a bungee stream when someone started needing to farm fucking thieves guild rep? <laughs> for a live service more than anything more important even speed better than quality i will uh let me search it <laughs> because the quality you can fix you can improve that with the player's is input. All right, let's and go. yeah, they might be they might be pissed off, but like we just like I just said, them being pissed off, it, it it's only two degrees. You have to understand. I love the vibe of playing Oblivion and, uh, <laughs> mind you, no, before, this, before, we this works. The talk, before we were doing the GDC talk, before we were doing the GDC talk, I was reading quotes from a book from the year <laughs> two thousand full of every fucking great game developer that was in the West <laughs> at the time. Not every every developer, but that book was so full of gems. And this and is full some of gems of, for a different reason. And some of the things that, there, that was being talked about were things that were like being demonstrated on screen, like what not to do. Mm -hmm. This is beautiful. Oh yeah, <laughs> the Oblivion music. So this is a NPC, <laughs> the NPC meme music NPC on moment, top of this yeah. guy. 
<laughs> this is. <laughs> and this guy looks like uh, this guy looks like the type of corporate officer that you find like drunk at three in the morning in Vegas on, <laughs> on his Vegas weekend. Do you know who I am? Yeah, I'm an important fucking figure. Don't at, fucking cut me off. At this company you've never heard of. My credit card is bottomless. What is my money not good enough for you? <laughs> That's what this guy looks like. <laughs> he's, got, he's got the suit jacket and the uh, the white formal formal shirt, but it's the first two buttons I've are undone. Made it to give it a casual I look. I made it. I climbed the ranks. I did my time. And if, if he grew his hair out just a little bit, he'd have the Caius Casati haircut because the man <laughs> is fucking chrome up there and uh, <laughs> shitty facial hair, shitty but groomed. That's an intentional style, right? It hasn't just, it's not just overgrown neck beard. No, he's, he's like shaped. This man's appearance, entire appearance is ridiculous. <laughs> but he wears it with confidence. But he's not intelligent enough for me to respect that kind of confidence because I love yeah. people who are, who are confident assholes. This guy, this guy is like, it's beautiful. <laughs> I love you, man. This is great performance art. <laughs> than quality a live service is about being fast I'm really <laughs> oh oh that well, was a gut punch right there <laughs> we, pa we paused at the perfect second just, just to be primed we're off guard we're ready. i hope you're Ooh. taking notes i hope you're taking notes with like god. time stamps on this god no this is beautiful i wish that i had a, a, an application for this I am a member of the College of Winterhold. They haven't allowed boxed products in centuries. <laughs> in good standing. <laughs> oh. oh, God. Oh, it hurts. I'm laughing. I'm laughing so hard it's actually hurting. <laughs> I am downloading this because uh, <laughs> I'm going I'm to upload it unlisted on the Pleb TV yeah. channel. Yeah, yeah. This can't be allowed this to... To, <laughs> to uh, disappear, not be preserved. <laughs> like uh, back in, we could be watching uh, Henrik Nyberg explaining Minecraft generation, <laughs> and instead we're <laughs> we're hearing a guy explain that the benefits of live service games is that you get to do a shitty job and people will defend <laughs> it. He's absolutely right. Oh yeah, yeah. Like I said, that's why I'm curious about his audience because it's like. For a certain audience, this is spot fucking on. Mm -hmm. Like we, we, this is on the level of that one talk that they gave, where they explained like the tiers of like, these are your guppy customers and your dolphin customers <laughs> and your whale customers. They were like explaining the basics of microtransactions. Like this is a keystone talk yeah. in uh, beautiful. In 2010, you could you could have a long lasting, high retention game just by releasing something that was super high quality, really well balanced and unchanged that players kept coming back to for years. But but to stay afloat as a service today. Uh, no, hold on. Let's check your logic here because but you said <laughs> that a box product got away with that. But you now you're talking about how a service. So like you were talking about In a box order... product but you've you've mid presentation you've mid-sentence switched to talking about a service What's the news from the other parts of Tamriel? Nothing I'd like to talk about. you need to be constantly feeding your players you need to be responding to their concerns you need to be making them <clears throat> better he's not wrong in the sense that players in the internet age have come especially with um the new like update models because mm -hmm. he, he's leaving out the context of why the industry changed in this way which was higher yeah. higher internet adoption rates online installs cheaper ability to patch to console markets like Oops. the ubiquitousness of being able to patch games is why live service games were able to be so successful yeah so but yeah i'm glad chat has noticed that uh, there's a bit of a problem with him saying well box service games got away with it but or box games got away with it but service games don't get away with it it's like that's two different ideas and so if box products are in the business of over delivery, live service 
is the business of constant delivery. And to provide that con Man, I wish box products were in the business of over delivery. Yeah. <laughs> I wish that was more common. And by the way, the image he's showing is just a, a still frame of a, I presume, a Destiny trailer of a guy just riding a speeder through a snowy vista. This is how he's describing speed. That constant nice. delivery to players, you need to be fast. You need to be as fast as your organization can possibly be. This would make so many 90s era game devs blood just freeze. <laughs> Oops. And so at Bungie, one of the key lessons that we codified here to shift our mindset is that velocity is more important than position. So as long as you're going fast, it doesn't matter if you do it right. That's what that expression would mean. Nice. I'm getting a lot of the, uh, we need to be nimble now. Yeah. Sort of, sort of vibes from this. Do more with less. Yeah. Like, this is this <laughs> is the corporate guy that comes into your company and just starts gutting the culture out. Yeah. It's Insane. like you don't you. Do, why are you doing it this way? Don't you know you can save like thirty dollars every month if you just get rid of that? You know what? The the the, the, the pe people you have like five or six people who only know how to do it this way and they're getting close to retirement age. Fucking fire them! Don't you know how much money you could save by firing people and hiring new kids off the street? The Come on now. The practice of a different person bringing in a pizza <clears throat> every Friday, that's <laughs> not helping our company culture. I'm going to need you guys to stop bringing in pizzas. You need to let the, management order them. Yeah. It needs to be a, a management relationship with the employees on who brings in the pizzas. <laughs> It's really important that people know who to credit. Right, like your I'm position is your here. game's quality right now. How how good is it? What issues does it have? How much how much content does it have to engage your players? And these are all. In this metaphor is another another stupid fucking metaphor. They're gonna be taken a thousand ways and saying. What if you have a desired position, but you completely overshoot it because you were going too fast and not doing it right? Then you fix it. That you can make money by fixing it. This is the exact mindset that creates technical debt. <laughs> important questions, but so much more important for us now is how fast can you change that position? So, I love it. This expression is so fucking stupid. It's how fast can you change that position? Isn't the goal to have a concrete position like a box product? Like eventually have a box product that's over delivered in a lot of ways? No, we're going to constantly keep shifting what we're delivering as fast as we are delivering it. Yeah. This ex this explains what players and perfectly. Oh, it, oh, it does. It does to a fucking T. But players don't want quality. They just want content. Just get them the content. This is like this is the people. This is the same mindset of like people who are like, it doesn't matter what the video is. You get the fucking video out every week, and that's how you succeed on YouTube. Yeah. It, it doesn't. Do, nothing else matters. And we were talking about this yesterday on. Uh, on Indigo's show, I was like, "There's there's different ways you can succeed on YouTube. You can you can focus on um, your release schedule. You can focus on the types of stuff that you cover. You can focus on the ways that you cover those things. Like there's different ways, but the thing is, it's consistency in all in what whatever you pick, you want to be consistent. And so you can break a shit ton of rules so long as you pick one of those things and make it consistent. You'll you'll succeed." Because that's that's how you establish that's that's how you establish a brand. That, that's how you establish credibility. That's how you establish trust. And the same can be applied to video games. You know, like Bethesda is known for making big, big world open world RPGs. So it's like they can fuck up a lot of different things. But if they still deliver on making that product, they're going to have customers at the end of the day. 
the problem with Bungie is that what you're seeing here in like literally in real time is that they are literally abandoning every single pillar that guided them down to their fucking motto. Change, changing the motto is That's perfect. concerning. Yeah. It's like, it's not, it, it's one thing for them to, for, for Bungie to go like, okay, we really just want to make destiny, right? We're, we know we're going to lose, we know we're going to lose like hardcore fans or whatever, but we believe in destiny. We believe that we're making a good product. And if they were, if they actually genuinely believed in that and stuck with it and they made a good product, they would eventually win those member, the, the, that audience. And I think uh, to a degree, I think, I think enough people at Bungie did believe in that. They believed in the vision. They believed in the product they were making. And that's why destiny and destiny two has garnered a solid fan base. But at the same time, you have people like this guy in there who's like, we don't have to make something that's good, you know, guys. Like, the people are going to get pissed off. Who fucking cares? They're going to play it anyways. As long as we keep shoveling shit out for them, they're going to buy it. They're going to play it. This guy has been to a non-zero number of Jordan Belfort talks. <laughs> <laughs> this is... This is insane. This is like... Did he have money in FTX? <laughs> this is that kind of guy like, who's like as a, who's fucked as upwards a, in life and gets yeah <laughs> makes a ton of money and then gets taken advantage of by like, yeah, yeah 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 because he because he thinks because he thinks because he's made money that he knows what he's doing of like, course because everything's created... quality is tied to the amount of money it makes yeah yeah. He doesn't understand anything about like culture or um or uh I'm trying to think of a word. Um like your reputation. Mm -hmm. that, that does that does that doesn't mean shit. Man. It it's crazy to think like this dude got up on a stage, gave this speech, gave this talk for 45 minutes, and then got promoted an afterwards. Hour. An hour. <laughs> an hour. An hour of this. This is like as a even if like I wasn't in like game analysis or whatever and I was just a customer, there's a lot of stuff that he's saying in here that would be tipping me off. Like you're telling me that you just don't care about making quality. Like that 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 that's why I want to know. Like I am more curious about the audience now. Like is everybody sitting there like nodding, like, yeah, this is really good stuff. Good or is like stuff. everybody like just sitting there like like the air is just getting sucked out of their lungs yeah <laughs> i think if they're management level they're like they're listening and then like if they're employee level they're like praying yeah that yeah. that this guy doesn't go to them next <laughs> oh this dude's the grim reaper of yeah, studios this is uh this is frodo hiding under the stump as the ring wraith <laughs> is like looking for him <laughs> If your players need more content, how fast can you funnel it into your game? If your game has funnel it, perfect, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> funnel it into my mouth, dude, dude. Line the by word line. usage, the word usage. Even yeah, even just the diction of this guy is beautiful. <laughs> He's gonna say whale at some point. Oh yeah. Open your gullet. Here comes the content. <laughs> He has like a mental image of the players, and it's not a flattering image at all. This is somebody who like he resents his players. Mm, man, this is great. How long <laughs> does it stay unbalanced? And if you're how long does it? Okay, hang on. We got to give him full context here. Yeah, yeah. All important questions, but so much more important for us now is. How fast can you change that position? If your players need more content, how fast can you funnel it into your game? It's such a wrong application of the word, too. How fast can you... If your players need new content, how fast can you funnel it into the game? Like, I'm sorry, but if you're outside of a kitchen, unless you're disparaging something, you should never say the word <laughs> funnel. <laughs> 
or like maybe you work in a mechanic shop and you're putting oil yeah, yeah, something yeah. like or like an engineer like an engineer and it's like you're talking about traffic or something like that yeah like you need to funnel people into a position like <laughs> when you're talking about when you're in a creative field and you say the word funnel it's because you're disparaging something yeah yeah if your game has an unbalanced meta how long does it stay oh. unbalanced he said if your game has an unbalanced meta how long does it stay unbalanced well, you see, the problem is that your game has an unbalanced meta because you focused on having so much velocity that your development <laughs> designers didn't t weren't able to take the time to uh, focus on their position because meta is a product of position. It's not a product of velocity. You can't design yes. a meta fast. Metas yeah. are designed by you look at what players are doing and you respond to what players are doing with changes in order to make sure that no one strategy is dominating the field. Yeah, the, the way the way you create balance is through a lot of quality control, a lot of play testing, and a lot of feedback. Some some Destiny metas stuck around for months. That's what's that's what's funny too is remember this guy's talking about Destiny. Yeah. This guy considers <laughs> that he's doing on Destiny. He's doing everything that he's talking about correctly. And if your community has a valid complaint. How quickly can you respond to that complaint? <laughs> Come on, this quote's got to be in a bunch of videos. <laughs> Does that mean that when you aren't responding to complaints that you just think that they're not valid? As a quick note, at least once a week, the game goes down for maintenance because the servers can't stay on. Like, uh routine maintenance or actual like emergency the game has shut down maintenance it didn't they just have an outage recently or am I, th I i might be thinking of another game um that they had like emergency uh, an emergency outage man i love Beautiful. it i live for it <laughs> Pump it into my veins. My veins, I tell you, my veins. Drinks water. And this is why this is this this but... is like a mask off moment. Like like how the FTC thing was a mask off moment for the for the industry. This is absolutely another mask off moment. That this dude is not like. Can we not record my presentation, please? <laughs> I'd like to give a unrecorded presentation. Thank you. <laughs> I wonder if like I wonder if it had to be recorded because it was like a COVID uh mandate that like Ooh, maybe. They had to record all their presentations so that people who stayed at home for GDC yeah. could still access it. At the very least, if I don't go to GDC, I wanna still like Hello. I wanna get access to all the talks. Yeah. Cause I'm really tired. It's beautiful. You got some hot property. I hate everything. Did a recent video on Destiny 2. Yeah, that was posted in my submissions channel. I'm interested in checking it out. I don't typically go for I hate everything, but I'm interested in checking it out if it uh, if it is actually on the level of using stuff from this particular talk. Because I almost feel like in order to be a good Destiny video, it would have to. You have to have this. You. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. This informs so much about the game. Even as an outsider, I know that this informs so much about the game. Yeah, yeah. I think. You've made. That... That's a. No, this is gold. This is the type of thing I wish Bethesda was still doing. <laughs> no, they they shored that up when they told Emil he couldn't make any more. Uh... You can't keep saying that modders need to fix the game, Emil. <laughs> I think... Ah, but come on. Don't I got freedom of speech? That's a good... Emil, you can't do your presentation about KISS right after Fallout 4. <laughs> like unintuitive way 
that's I'd rather have fast than perfect. Because <laughs> Dude. <laughs> I can't imagine a context where you would be saying that short of being like a, a NBA player. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather play a fast game than like nail all of my shots. That's the circumstance this is, this where you is, would be saying something. This like is that. this is this is like the this is the um the manager is like yeah we don't have to report everything to the IRS just mm -hmm. you know it, 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 it's no big deal you know and it's, don't don't bother it, it's a waste of time. My God, only like only management people could think that uh, doing it fast is better than doing it right. And this, this is I how you get like into um, like that. this is how you get people killed on a uh, on a submarine. Yeah, do it fast, don't do it right. <laughs> Have you seen some of the quotes that came out of that dude? It's mm -hmm. pretty on point with what this dude's saying right now. Yeah, he said something like uh, their company they didn't want to hire like middle aged white guys. I want to focus on the middle-aged part because middle-aged engineering people are who you absolutely oh, want to yeah. hire when you're doing anything, anything where people's lives are on the line because middle-aged, oh. <laughs> middle-aged white guys, those guys are Navy vets. Those guys worked on submarines and battleships. That's who you want designing your submarine. You don't want some fucking college kid. Yeah. Some college kid who got third place on his balsa wood bridge contest. <laughs> uh, do I have the money yet? Being perfect, no, even even just being great, is your current position. But being perfect, even just being great, is your current position. What? What? Guys, Halo Reach was in 2010, and a lot of people <laughs> don't even think that game was good. Well, <laughs> they think it's good, but it wasn't great. And so already you're working from a faulty position because it seems like the first step of setting that process up would be get perfect and then build velocity from that. Uh-oh. Fast is your velocity. And a fast game will become great. <laughs> what? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> they fixed the game. Oh my god, that, yeah, that's literally, this guy, that internalized. This guy has posted that Shigeru Miyamoto quote. <laughs> Whoa. Oh my god. This is the dude who's like, yeah, the Viper should have won in, during, uh, during the battle between him and Clegane. Yeah. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter about how strong... He's fast! What the fuck? Yeah, true. <laughs> and, you know, uh, Vi the Viper's problem... Um, was hubris. Yeah, it, it was that he, <laughs> he... He tried to make it a big statement moment, and it got him killed. Yeah. yeah. Which is kind of like one of the main points of Game of Thrones and the Song of Ice and Fire series, is that you can do good things well, but simple mistakes can eventually... can get you killed in that series. And this guy's just like, it doesn't matter how many mistakes you make as long as you keep going. As long as you keep going. This is a guy who's yeah. operated in an environment where he's never been fired. <laughs> Which is absolutely <laughs> true because if you looked at his LinkedIn yeah, thing, he didn't yeah. get fired from pandemic. He didn't he got laid pandemic. off when they when they shut down. Yeah, they shut down. So this man has never worried about being fired. Which is why Whoa. he prioritizes speed over correctness. Yeah. No, this is literally the dude who would be like the accountant sitting there, like, you know, if we just do this, we won't ha we won't have to report this amount of money. And he's just like, I do it, do it. Do I don't it. care, do it. We could save thirty dollars if we don't report. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if we don't report this. <laughs> but a great slow game will very quickly fall behind. Oh my god. Oh my god, it it hurts. Which is why Elden Ring came out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that dude, that in the fucking back of my mind, all I'm thinking is, you know, who's been playing the long slow game? <laughs> yeah, he's been playing the long slow great game to amazing effect. Yeah, because it just comes down to, and I was saying this, I was saying this yesterday. What you want to, one of the best things you can ask yourself as a creative or any any business is, what can we make? Not what should we make, not what do we want to make. 
I, those are those are good questions to ask too. But like, really, the most the most important thing you should ask yourself is what can we actually make? And here's the thing. Let's start there. The Japanese industry has to deal with investors as much as the American industry. A lot of people yeah. that are in the West are talking about how it's the investors' fault. It's the investors' fault. It's mm -hmm. all about appeasing the investors. That happens in Japan too. But there's a cultural difference in investment between Japan and America, there's, and that cultural difference a, stems from the fact that their economy huge, collapsed. There is a huge difference in um, in business culture over there as well. Like really fucking big difference. So it Japanese it, investors not... understand that you need to find an auteur and put him in charge of a studio <clears throat> and let him work. Yeah. And that's they how care you about end up with they Elden care Ring. about results and they ca they care about results and consistency. And um, what this dude is saying is n none of that matters. Just just fucking make it go. Just go fast. Eventually, you're gonna. It, once again, it's the YouTuber mentality. As, as long like, as the money if, if you pump out 300 going. videos in a year, if you punch uh, uh, pump out 56 videos in a year, 52 videos in a year, one of the, the, the by virtue of numbers, one of those is gonna be a hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is a, <laughs> like the money printer is gonna keep going. You're always gonna have the budget to eventually make your game good. Fuck, oh, fuck yeah, all the horror yeah. stories that get documented yeah. of games that never got the chance. Yeah. Example given, Starforge. This they, is, see, see, this that's also that's a really good example. That's a really good point because think of Bungie's like their relationship with publishers and everything, how they've managed to squeak out so much money out of publishers and stay out of like exclusivity deal like They've played fast and loose on the on the outskirts for a while. So it's like this dude was coming into a company that was used to like having money to burn, really. Yeah, yeah I mean this guy's because he wasn't because he wasn't there during the during during the do or die days. Yeah, so. he wasn't there during Microsoft. Yeah, that's who this guy would have a totally different perspective if he was there during the time period where Bungie was trying to escape Microsoft. This is incredible. Because this mindset only works as long as you have a revenue flow. And, that, and that's going to be his ultimate point is you need to have the, all these microtransactions so that you can have the revenue flow to enable this model. Yeah, but that see, that's the thing. Oh, my God, it's just proving my point even more that they literally cannot do the they cannot back off of this there. It's so ingrained into everything top to bottom down to their culture. They literally cannot make normal games anymore. It is the it is a it is a one way road. It is the poison that like once you start drinking it, you have to keep drinking it. God damn, <laughs> this is beautiful. <laughs> this is a work of art. If, if this guy was this is if this, this guy was is a, a gift. If this guy was like leading us on, and like actually this whole thing was a bit, and like I'm a yeah. performance <laughs> actor, this would be, I mean, there's so many awards. <laughs> because this guy would be if he was an actor he'd be perfectly nailing a real type of person yeah but the fact that he's real and that he's been in the industry for 20 years 20 fucking years at two companies that informed a big part of my it, re of it my really taste. it really though like it speaks to the current environment of the industry as well that people like this are allowed to just operate like with this mentality and think it's okay think of all the companies he's gone through all the all the people that he's met to be able to get on stage at gdc and deliver this mm -hmm. and, everybody that had to be there to enable it yeah it's so good <laughs> It's so fucking good. It's, it's the context. It's the subtext. There is so much that is fucked up with this. It is incredible. And, and line by line. Each line, yeah. each line uh, each, is a blow. Dude, each, each line is a quote. I thought we'd be at like 20, 25 minutes by now, <laughs> but like... Velocity. And a fast game will become great. But a great <laughs> slow game will very quickly fall behind. Which is why people don't talk about Dark Souls anymore. Mm -hmm. so like, let's tease apart. You know, the, the game, the game, or Elden Ring, the game that hasn't had any, like, we've been waiting forever for that update. Nobody cares about Elden Ring anymore. Nobody talks about they it. Should've... They're not still selling copies of that. Mm -hmm. Even Cyberpunk. Yeah, Cyberpunk's a great example. That game's dead. But people are still looking forward to Phantom Liberty. Yeah. <laughs>
tangible example for us at Bungie. This shift in our mindset to focus on velocity has meant that for our future games that we're building, we mentally shift a lot of our focus away from the launch of the product. <laughs> in other words, release it buggy, fix it later. Yeah, I mean, like that's as transparently as somebody's gonna say it. Yeah. It's like all of our industry experience and training, all that box product training has us traditionally laser focused from like day one on having the best. You've been running Destiny as a live service for longer than you were at Pandemic. <laughs> you were at Pandemic for six years. You've been at Bungie for 13. So don't tell me that you've got this wealth of experience, Mr. I worked on fucking full spectrum warrior tin hammers in the saboteur. Oh, and full spectrum warrior. Which I don't know if full spectrum warrior was good or not. Hang on, let's check. Oh, good. Your start was <laughs> your start was a Man, what is this? This dude loves to insert himself. Uh this is this is somebody who really knows the like he understands how important it is to get credit for uh, for something. Even if you're stealing that credit from somebody else or somebody else is being denied credit, it, he understands like no, you 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 take that shit. That goes on your fucking resume. Man, you know, on Gar, maybe if you slept during the day or slept at night and stayed up during the night, or if, <laughs> if you weren't, why, why is he nocturnal? There's nothing that he does here. Like, he's world wary, he's <laughs> wary. Um, so he worked on three seven out of ten games. I mean, the type of shit that I do like a 30 minute video about talking about how. Uh, mm -hmm. nobody, like, you know, blast from the past that, that it's more interesting <laughs> to talk about the corporation than it is the game. <laughs> That's the type of thing he worked on before Destiny. I think I can move. I think I can move this item. You gotta... I remember Full Spectrum Warrior being one of those games I rented, then returned it the day I rented it and got a different game. God, there's a there's a disc we can't use anymore. Yeah, game rentals disappeared and took a lot of vocabulary away. I, I guess like Steam, it, it would be like I return. I was able to get a refund on it in the two hour window. Yeah, that's that's as close as you can get is refunds. Yeah. Or uh, I didn't pay for this game and I still regret buying it. Yeah, I I got it. I got it from <laughs> I got it from the humble bundle or uh, yeah or on the epic game store for free like deleting something from your steam library <laughs> that's possible game on the day it launches that's what you're losing sleep over it's like what's going to happen when we finally get to launch day but if you're trying to make a live service we found you should actually kind of de-emphasize that launch in your mind like a much more important release Question. a buggy tell Tell that tell that to the dude who has to worry about like the servers melting. Yeah. I'm sure there's plenty of people. <laughs> Just don't worry about it. There's plenty the, of people. The servers are gonna be broken, nobody will be able to play it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, like he's he this is a guy who's had many conversations with his network engineers. Uh there we go. Giving them false reassurances that don't worry, don't worry, we're gonna get you the help you need to to make it work. <laughs> oh no, he's one of those managers. You gotta be in the, the one who's like, listen. You gotta the one, the one who's like because you, yeah, you got like the you got the department leader who's like, I really need like three more people. And it's like, don't worry, we're gonna get you the people. But have you tried doing more with less? You know, in the meantime, maybe well, work no, a no, few no. extra hours. No, 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 not even that. It's um, we're gonna get you the people that you need. But listen. You need to de-emphasize <laughs> the pressure that launch is putting on you because we are a live service studio and it's not all about the launch. Yes. Sessions act actively describe the current state of Destiny 2 servers. I mean, that's what happens. This entire mindset is technical is... debt to a fault. And yeah. that shit is catching up with everybody in the tech industry right now. There's not a company right now that isn't struck that like, isn't having problems owed to technical debt. Look at Twitter. Twitter's falling the fuck yeah. apart because of it. <laughs> uh, where is 
beautiful. Grieve. Beautiful. Is what is your roadmap and release tools going to look like for the first year after your game launches? Roadmap. He said the word. This is after people really started making fun of the concept of roadmaps. I mean, you want to know why 76 doesn't have a roadmap? Because in 2022, everybody started to just say, we're tired of fucking roadmaps. <laughs> we're tired of the game coming out broken and having a, a day one roadmap for how it's going to be yeah. fixed up after we bought it. Yeah, yeah. Where's our house? It's like around here, isn't it? How come you're not using the character overhaul mod? What's the character overhaul mod? The the one that makes everybody beautiful? I thought it was, Is, I, thought, I, didn't... I thought it was a uh a stat thing. Hang on. Yep, a comprehensive all-in-one revamp of Oblivion character heads. Yeah, uh, I'm not concerned. This this was just trying to fix gameplay. Basically, I don't want to touch anything graphical because you just get into the weeds with that. Also, it's kind of the charm of Oblivion, the ugly potato faces. Twitter's probably rate limiting because they can't play their pay their cloud server bills. There's a few different explanations I've heard for rate limiting. There's Elon Musk's excl explanation that there is some concerted effort to like scrape data off of Twitter on like such a level that yes, they are have they are struggling to pay their rates, but that's because like there is like a single like a single digit number of bad actors that are like using a I can I can honestly bandwidth. I can honestly believe that Twitter is used a lot for like getting um because well, my friend works in actually, um, he on, does on, data I, he I, does I, data management right and um their go to like literally in his class the professor was saying like yeah a really good a uh, really good place to do like data data collection and stuff is um Twitter it's a really good place to get um th there's a specific term for it but it's like um basically like getting getting people's opinions on uh on a subject so like it, like twitter's api is also built for collecting that information as well so yeah I, they, they might have been doing it to themselves but you know who just um, said that they're scraping the entire public public internet so Google, Google, Google just said that they're scraping Microsoft. they're scraping Google scraping the entire public internet do you know who just had uh all of their search engine bots turned off by twitter <laughs> is it possible that like these big tech companies that are uh competing with chat gpt and chat gpt is doing it too but these yeah, big yeah. companies that are invested in ai and competing with chat gpt that are training these models on the public internet they're like fucking twitter over because they're all forcing it to read twitter and twitter's like Dude, we can't have every big tech company yeah. in the industry training AI models on us at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Greetings to you. I do apologize. I did have to interrupt him because that is a connection that I wanted to say. I I had figured out. Where the fuck is Scriva? Because uh, she she. This is here, she goes to this inn, right? Here's how my memory works. There was a thing I was gonna say, an alternate explanation that has been offered for why, um, for why Twitter went down, and I've completely forgotten what I was gonna say because I didn't really have a full lease on it because something else came up. So like that's kind of why I interrupt people because I, I just have a shit memory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know. I get it. Hold on. Um, I'm going to console command this because I genuinely don't know where this lady is. Because you can launch with a game that blows people's minds and is super high polish. Or you can launch with a game that has lots of promise, but a bunch of like janky issues on day one. And the sifter that's going to determine which of those two games is relevant 12, 24 months later is their velocity. How many updates came? I have the biggest smile on my face right now. <laughs> I am so glad he's saying this. <laughs> so, okay, here's what he said. You can have a game that comes... You can have an Elden Ring. Or you can have a Forspoken. But people are going to prefer... For, like People would have preferred Forspoken over Elden Ring if Forspoken had more content updates. That's his argument. 
My God. <laughs> yeah, you can't have a crash without having velocity. It's true. <laughs> Once again, oh, yeah, once again, his oh, his sure, dumbass sure? metaphors are working against him. Yeah. Well met. How much better was the game getting yeah, each month? Are. Because that is what builds and retains fans in 2022. From the widow. Like Fallout 76. <laughs> look at Elden Ring and look at Fallout 76. Which one has more players right now on Steam? I promise you right now, it's gonna be... It's gonna be Fallout 76. How many updates has Elden Ring had? Zero content updates. So Elden Ring is... Oh wait, it has, tw it has twice as many players. This is this is this is my face oh. listening to this dude right now. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> this is this is too candid. This is I'm sorry everybody, but I'm going to get into politics. This is what people like this is what Americans have. This, this is the issue Americans have with uh, with current politicians is that they've gotten to the point where they've gotten so brazen that they will air their dirty laundry and their terrible misdeeds and stuff out in the public because they know nothing's going to come of it. Yeah, I mean, this guy got a the, promotion after this the guy. Knows. Indus the gaming industry at this point is so backwards and so toxic that people can literally talk about this. This guy like this in this language with this language. Remember, compared to the book that we were just taught, we were just reading. The people in this industry, they're not fucking stupid. A lot of these people are really fucking smart. You're talking about people who are like top top tier, like engineers, designers, artists, and stuff. These are not stupid fucking people. So, like, if we're able to pick apart this dude's what this dude is saying sentence by sentence, you can only imagine what like the mileage people who have actual experience in the industry working on games and stuff the mileage they could get out of what this dude is saying like each thing like we're just making little quips about every sentence i'm willing to bet somebody could write an entire fucking thesis on every sentence this dude has said so far with enough knowledge and it's like the fact that this dude can make these sorts of arguments and stuff make put for an hour and not get first off like if this was a healthy industry this dude would get blacklisted like he would have gotten fired from this fucking from his fucking job and Nobody would want to hire him. His bonus let alone... must be insane, but I would like to read a quote from Mark Bernal, uh, who worked at Bungie Software as their lead artist on Marathon 2, Myth the Fallen Lords, Myth 2. <laughs> is this from the book? This is from the book. Yes. Good communications between all the members of a team will make the game development <laughs> progress much smoother. Level designers need <laughs> artists to create environments that depict the layouts that they have designed. Programmers need artwork to be created in a certain way, or else the artwork might make the game crash, and so on. Currently, most games represent... Oh, no, this is more technical talk, but that's his general... That That's elite, That's an artist, and uh, most of what he's talking about is the art, which is an exception rather than the rule when it comes to mm -hmm. artists, but... Man, that's the contrast. That's a, that's a <laughs> year 2000 Bungie employee. Bungie. Yeah. And then we have <laughs> this fucking guy who is a chief officer at Bungie. Look at how fucking shit. You know what he's thinking right I now? I can't even see over this. You know what he's thinking right now? He's thinking, I've got 10 more years left in my career yeah, oh before my I retire. God, and I have definitely, definitely one of those. I am here. Once I hit my number, I, I got a number that my 401k has to hit and I'm gone. I don't have to deal with those fucking ingrate mm -hmm. gamers anymore. The the backbiting politics, office politics, you know, the, the, the backbiting politics that he fucking introduced into Bungie most likely. 
him and people like him. Um, it, it it's amazing. I, I know I know this person. This, I've worked with people like this. This guy knows that Bungie could be on a decline for the next ten years, and he still made it. He still yeah, he still made because it because because even if even if Bungie fa- fails, well. You know what? I got laid off. Oh, the game crashed on me. <laughs> <laughs> Even if Bungie fails, I still made it. Yeah. I saw the top. I was a and rock nothing's star. Go- nothing, nothing's going to happen to me. I mean, I- I'll land on my feet. I've made enough friends in the industry. My, my, my future is secure. It's fine. Your oblivion had too much velocity. <laughs> Man, I need to find more bungee quotes. More tasteful bungee quotes to contrast uh, with this guy. So let's look. Yeah, this this dude is a fountain. A fountain for reasons that he doesn't want to be a fountain for. Or maybe he does. You know, he could he could be like he could listen to this stream and go. They nailed everything that I'm doing right. They're just mad because I ruined what they liked. <laughs> but success is all about the amount of money that's made. It's not about the quality I of the can't, product. I can't hear all those whining gamers on this mountain of fucking cash that I got. Do you know I take a, I take a trip two times a year to Dubai? Every year. <laughs> twice. Even during the pandemic. Even during the lockdowns. I was still in fucking Dubai. And if you're optimizing for that, then the position that you're in on the day you release becomes less and less relevant because it's just one beat among many on your way towards a perfect game. <laughs> well, at least we're still trying to make a perfect game, I guess. Yeah, in theory. <laughs> I mean, can we, really look at, can we really look at Destiny 2's trajectory and say, oh yeah, it's on its way to a perfect game. Is Destiny, listen, Destiny fans, sound out. Is Destiny 1 still playable? Did Destiny 1 ever become a perfect game, or did it get shut down and replaced by Destiny 2? I, oh, oh, you're talking about Destiny 1. Well, I can tell you there's there's a lot of aspects of Destiny 2 you can't fucking play right now, because they vaulted their content. We are listening to... How does that, how does that work in the... Explain this to me, Mr. Velocity. How does shut... How does... Um, removing content from the game factor into your velocity. I th- yeah. Does that does it lighten the load I th- so that you can continue to re- operate quickly? Yeah, I mean, I thought that we were building toward like we're we're high velocity, towards, but we're yeah. building towards the perfect product. So why yeah. why is so much stuff being removed from removed. the game that had been launched at some point? This is uh, a. <laughs> Come on, baby. Where's the bungee chapters? Sad. One one criticism I have uh, of this book, in retrospect, I kind of wish that it was in the order of appearance rather than it's sorted in an order of like information. So types of like topics. But I kind of wish there was an addition that was just what they said in order of like where they worked, so you could get all the bungee quotes in one place. Maybe there's a. Tell me there's an appendix. Hang on. I, I like I like this um this comment. How is Dubai even attractive to anyone outside of things there cost money, and so I'm going to go there and spend money. That's that's literally the appeal of Dubai. It's one of the. It, there's an exclusivity to certain certain places just because it costs a lot of money, and there are people. Nice, okay. Usually, you'll usually find it's you you get like a certain type of rich people. So you got like you got your um. Your Warrant Buffets, right? Um, those types of people do not like to spend money. Um, you're not going to see them in Dubai unless they have to do like business there. But then you have people like this where it's like, money made me, and I am now just able to spend. So I'm going to go and do that. I've got a quote here from Charles Go. Um, worked on Halo. We read his quote earlier. I love that. Speaking of velocity, oh, man. I love the velocity of these fucking arrows just like throwing these wolves around. We read this quote earlier. Uh, this is Charles Go. He's a programmer at Bungie. 
Get your game up and running as quickly as possible. <laughs> See, he's a proponent of the velocity theory. Uh, the velocity, yeah, yeah. Uh, but hang on, let him finish. The sooner you have the basic engine and tools running, the longer you have to play and refine your game. <laughs> it will be easier for both your team and publishers to share your vision if they can see a working prototype. You have to be willing to make compromises in your code to achieve goals. For example, you might have an incredible idea for rendering for a rendering algorithm that would outshine everything currently available, but if it runs so slowly that it detracts from gameplay and takes so long to write that you lose your publisher, what have you achieved? That is yeah, so the, the same sentiment conveyed much more intelligently. Yeah, much more intelligently and much more like uh, see that's that's speed because uh, because there is a balance, right? You don't mm -hmm. want to spend forever making something. So that's the pragmatic side. It's like, listen, eventually you do have to deliver something. You have to go fast, but you need to go at a pace that you can control so that you can deliver a good product. Yes. Um uh, apparently um you know, Mr. GDC over here just does not think that that's valid that there there you can't there is no balancing to if you're going slow you're going slow that's it so i'm loving this by the way i forgot how to read old books i forgot how appendixes work <laughs> uh you can go to the end of the book and look up bungee and it'll tell you every page that bungee mm -hmm. appears on so yeah whoops it's been a while <laughs> oh well i'm surprised the the book had appendixes um it's one of those things where it's like like um i'm used to those in like my history books and stuff mm. so I, I will use them there but uh yeah you'd be surprised what what doesn't actually this have is, that especially today this is effectively an unofficial textbook for game design yeah yeah that's why i love this book See, so much um you actually don't get those as often in modern uh books because everybody uses e-readers now apparently yeah. so you just control f so it's sad to say the the beauty of like a good like a good structured book is uh is kind of like a lost art so i don't really blame you for not knowing how to even fucking use it i knew how to use it it's just been a long time since forgotten. i needed to yeah. use an appendix yeah and the reality is like if you try to launch a new live service game in the 2020s it's kind of like that pixar quote like a simple fact is your game is probably gonna suck at launch <laughs> <laughs> oh my fucking god. Oh my god he's saying the quiet part out loud <laughs> guys the intrusive thoughts it has to be that way when again. hey didn't diablo 4 come out in a pretty good state pretty sure that one's a live service game <laughs> yeah the only thing that i heard the only like really the only negatives i heard about diablo 4 is like the stability issues and like microtransactions and stuff blah 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 but mm -hmm. Like, people, a lot of people are saying, like, oh, it's actually a pretty decent game. We're going to go back in case anybody missed it, because... Uh... Holy crap. See, uh, like, I knew I was I was getting ready, because, like, he was getting excited. I was like, yeah. oh, this is going to be a good he, one. He's got a smile on his face, so you know that he's yeah. lining up some fucking gold to shit out on the plate. <laughs> if you try to launch a new live service game in the 2020s, it's kind of like that Pixar quote. Like, a simple fact is, your game is probably going to suck at launch. There you go, Chad. Wait, so the, That's what he said. So, so the, so remind me, what was the Pixar quote again? Okay, I, I hope you wrote it down. I didn't. I didn't write it down, but don't worry. I remembered a paraphrased version of it, uh, which is the general sentiment is at some point in a Pixar movie's production, it sucks. Yeah. Important thing here: at some point in its production, not at its <laughs> launch, its release. <laughs> oh my god. The movie Cats, that one came out with a patch. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't know if chat remembers. So when the Cats movie it's came out, so, they had batch CG, oh God, and there was a, so... there was like a day two patch for the Cats movie, where they released an updated oh, version. Really? Yeah. I wonder if, uh, I wonder if there's archives of the uh, original versus updated Cats. See, it's weird. It's weird to hear him like use movies as an example when he's talking about live surface games it's like they're not even comparable products like one is a product and one is supposedly a service i'm pretty sure you, the, all of the comparisons are trailer and movie because the 
day one movie version is basically lost media. Mm. The version that you can <clears throat> see now is an updated version that didn't like they patched that movie. What the fuck? How did they? When did this movie come out? Was was it like straight uh, to 2019? It went. It was in theaters. It was in theaters. It was in theaters. They released the first version, and then a couple days later, there was a patch that had updated CGI. Interesting. I didn't even know that was possible. And that's and that's okay. Like launch is not the end of your journey. Launch is the beginning. Like the beginning, not the middle. The, the fucking ha beginning. <laughs> well, for, first off. <laughs> has he never heard of like how important f like you don't get a second shot at first impressions where's that one where's that quote yeah like <laughs> if you release a broken product here's what here's what it tells me as a consumer we don't really care that it's broken and that we're charging you full price for it there's a difference between releasing a product like in early access right there's a reason early access products are discounted so, like, what he's talking about would make sense for an early access product. He, where it's like, yes, we know what we're releasing right now is... And not even that, no, because fuck that. Valheim was early access, and even that released, like, in a really fucking good state. Yeah, no, like... The only instance where this would apply would be an indie game that is the product of a game jam. Where... Yeah. And even then... <laughs> um, the very <clears throat> first version of the game isn't what what's launched. It's what's at the end of the jam that gets launched, and that would be. You know, it. you know what I, you know what I could see this being um, acceptable for is um, that game that we were talking about yesterday. Um, uh, Ar uh, Ar Ar Ardenfall. Ardenfall. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they released he, they released a demo, and the only way you can financially support the product right now is through their Patreon. Which I. That's, like, that's fine. Yeah, go support their Patreon. Um, I gotta play that. I'm probably gonna play it tonight. I'd like to read another quote from Charles Go. The game has to be fun. For example, if you are making a role-playing game, it might be realistic to force the character to have to eat and sleep and defecate. But would it be fun? <laughs> <laughs> the newest and from the beginning, making the game fun has to be the priority. The newest and best technology will not save a boring game. Okay. Lead mm -hmm. programmer at Bungie in the year 2000. <clears throat> now, this is the chief officer at Bungie, the chief <laughs> development officer at Bungie. Let's hear what he has to say about video games. No new game iterated on in secret for however many years can show up and immediately beat the existing live services that have had the advantage of being able to iterate directly with their community for five or 10 years. Man, so we're talking about a game that's going to be broken for five to ten years? My jaw is on the floor right now. <laughs> I continue to be blown away at the level of mask, mask off slipping moments. Like, we're seeing the dude's skull at this point. So many layers of the mask have come off that we're going to be at this brain eventually. Oh my God. Like, <laughs> I almost pissed myself from that <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> Holy crap. Listen, your new shooter can't compete with Rainbow Six Siege that's been actively maintained for eight years. Yeah, that, that's technically true. Listen, listen, to anyone who wonders like why me and Pat co-stream so often, this is why. This would not have happened if Pat wasn't here. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. <laughs> this is a winning combo, <laughs> listening to this. There's got to be like... <laughs> with it, it, oblivion. <laughs> Anytime that there's a good GDC talk and you want to play a game while we listen to it, I will back in to organize yeah. that stuff. I love this. This is so good. <laughs> the Myth series is a good example of these rules applied to a genre that has that had seen only minor gameplay innovation. RTS games before Myth involved a lengthy build-up period before the action, and it was fun to watch your orcs smash the little humans. But other than the number and types of troops involved, you couldn't really affect the battle. The Myth team saw a lot of potential in the actual fight, and made the tactics of the battle the focus of the game. Jason Jones had a vision of what it would be like, and decided to make 
a simple demo that involved a tiny 3D map, a dwarven grenadier, a troop of undead axemen, and the basics of a real physics engine. Originally, he planned on having fully polygonal 3D characters and objects, but he felt that the frame rate would suffer and that it would take too long to develop. Damn. So he modified sprite code from Marathon and used that instead to quickly build his demo. This simple beginning was enough to get a cover of Computer Game Strategy Plus. All right. The beautiful little insight into the 90s era bungee culture. Uh, let's continue with our chief development <laughs> officer. You don't, you don't get to win that battle on day one. But if you're focused on your velocity, not your position at launch, then the better challenge becomes how fast can you improve your game once you are in that same direct dialogue with your community. You know what goes unsaid here is the number of dead live service games that tried <laughs> this. It's almost like yeah, he's yeah. giving bad advice intentionally just so on the off chance that to, maybe just to limit limit the competition. Yeah, maybe the competition will listen to my bullshit and kill themselves yeah. against us, a, an established title that is already it, out like, there. Go ahead. See what see what see what's horrifying too is like to a degree he is correct like after launch especially like especially in like the early like the early days something's probably going to be broken or whatever like look at bethesda games or something that's a good example you do have to sprint during that period of time speed really is of the essence those first few weeks absolutely 100 percent. but to say to use that as justification like listen we're going to be sprinting when it comes to launch anyway so just it just just release the game busted it's fine i'll continue uh this is on mm -hmm. the topic of myth two <clears throat> the biggest challenge was getting the game out the door less than a year after the original we had a lot of things we wanted to change improve or add but it quickly became apparent that there wasn't time to do it all so we had no choice but to focus on those ideas that would have had the most impact like pathfinding interface and fire while leaving out ideas like fully polygonal characters non-bipedal units cavalry and catapults and burning trees we had to compromise our design vision but we still focused on the fundamentals enough to release a solid product said in a very intelligent way that explains with humanity the design focus of this of a uh, lead programmer at Bungie in the year 2000. And once again, we will contrast that <clears throat> with our chief development officer, Justin Truman at Bungie. I know of her. How quickly can you change your existing roadmap if you find something in the live game? She lives on the west side of town. Can you deploy weekly patches, daily patches? If you have a major exploit in your game, can you... I do not, do not talk about how fast you can fix major exploits. <laughs> I've got a legion of fucking Destiny fans in the chat right now uh, who could tell us war stories about exploits in the PvP. I've never played the game and I know how bad the exploiting is. Do not, do not fucking tell me how it's a core business model that you're fixing exploits as fast as possible. Man. God. You know what's what's great about this, and this is a great sign for bunch uh, any Destiny channels out there. I never played Destiny One. I played I played the demo of best. It was the beta of Destiny Two. I played that, and uh, I never got into Destiny Two because I didn't have the chance to play Destiny One because I wanted it to be on PC. And um, so I was never invested in the Destiny community, and yet this pisses me off and i know how full of shit he is <laughs> well listen we we can let some masks slip but others so we the, the mask slipped and we're actually seeing another mask this man is talking like every game already has a loyal fan base that will bear with you but 99 percent yeah. of new live service games do not people just move on if your game is a mess at launch what I need right now is a montage of just all the different live service games that have come and gone and they all failed. You can, 
Because... I know, I know, I know now. I know who is in the who's in the audience right now cringing. It's all the people who worked on Amazon games. Yeah. <laughs> I think anybody that worked on a live service game that failed that's in this talk right now is either cringing or going, "Oh yeah, that's true. We didn't go fast enough. <laughs> we didn't have enough velocity with our launch. We were, we weren't patching and then, the, and, then and then there's the other dude who's like, "Dude, we were all working like a hundred hour fucking work weeks for like." for months on end there's no way you're full of shit it, you're just full of shit we would have been so much better off if our launch had been better yeah because here's the thing like he doesn't seem he doesn't communicate this if you start with a good launch premise even just like three more months that's less you that you have to fix that's less velocity that you need to have to be successful i, I, I know where this dude is it's like he just assumes that he really is like the shitty manager. He, you know that mentality I've worked <laughs> against in the Skyrim streams where it's like, but Bethesda had this many ex employees, and that means that they <clears> should <throat> have three thousand quests now, right? Oh yeah, that kind of mentality. This is that guy. This is how he looks at it. If I add six more employees to this team, that means that they should be producing thirty percent more a month. Yeah, yeah. He no, he definitely believes in like production in um productivity metrics. Uh, where is the dungeons? Excuse me, can you point me towards the dungeons? Stop. You violated the law. See, I told you he was going to point me to the dungeons. <laughs> One no, I agree. All the promising stuff's in the um, in the indie scene. Look at Ardenfall. Okay. Here's the uh, which, oh no, he's going to take my armor. Which we were told <gasps> Ardenfall's a, a, not a one-man project. There's actually multiple people working on it. Wait, really? It's it's in here. L listen, I might I might be short in stature, but I am fucking ripped. Holy crap! Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> God damn, he is he's on that he's on that Jet Lee grind set. One percent body fat. Yeah, no. <laughs> I'll, that, that is one detail I love about Bethesda games is uh. Just being fucking natty <laughs> out the gate. <laughs> Are you the count? This is the dark adoring fan. God, we haven't even like we haven't even touched the premise that this character is supposed to be the dark adoring fan. Because this is so much more fascinating. <laughs> you look lost. I look fucking great. What are you talking about? But I mean, okay, this is <laughs> here's another thumbnail. <laughs> This is much more, uh, much more of thumbnail. Oh, sorry, fuck. Of entertainment value than Destiny Two. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you thought I was gonna say like Oblivion? Yeah. I mean, kind of. This is like this is this is so calorie rich in enter <laughs> entertainment value. This this is like this is worthy of a stream in of itself half of, this is half of this like because we're, we're gonna have to stop soon because it's like we're already approaching six hours so we're gonna have to like do a dedicated stream to the rest of this fucking thing half of this stream has been us say, like half of this reaction has been us saying how good this is <laughs> existing roadmap if you find something in the live game can you deploy weekly patches daily patches if you have a major exploit in your game can you identify the issue, then triage it, test it, and deploy a hotfix in 24 hours? I know you can't. <laughs> There's something about listening to this dude talking while I'm just staring at yeah. <laughs> Oblivion NPCs. <laughs> Especially this guy. This guy's all smiles. Yeah. <laughs> I just bribed him with 20 gold, too. I'm not going to stream I hate everything's video, but I do think that uh, I think this topic is fascinating and I'm I am yeah, tempted yeah. to give that video a listen. Mm. Just we we are we are dipping into a well that is bad GDC yeah. <laughs> uh, presentations with this thing. No, I this is this is more atrocious than like any YouTube video I've seen. This is the most I yeah. feel compelled <laughs> to like give it like everything I react to is almost always tied to a project that I'm working on. I'm never going to do with it anything with the information that I gleaned from this, most likely. But yet, I am trans <laughs> transfixed on this. This is amazing. 
Because if you're focused on those kinds of challenges, building up that velocity before you launch, instead of just focusing on your position at launch, then your game will get to perfect with shocking speed. And you'll be making a game shocking speed is destiny 2 perfect yet guys is destiny 2 perfect how long has it been out um it's been out a while so so we go back to the to the question okay. that i asked earlier was the vaulting process part of making it the perfect game okay so it came out in 2017 now let's look at its development when did it start the sequel was first mentioned in 2014 based on documents um <laughs> When's it? I don't know. I I got I got chat here, and they're saying um it's it's only gotten worse, and it's it's terrible. I wouldn't piss on it to put out a fire. <laughs> okay, so November of 2014 to September of 2017 was there. That was their warm up period to set up Destiny for launch, which is the beginning of the journey to making the game good. Okay, it all starts with launch. So. If you right. played in 2017, you're just participating in the artistic process of Destiny 2 eventually being good. <laughs> does that... A uh, uh, question. How does Destiny 1 play into this? Did Destiny 1 ever become the perfect masterpiece? Is that there why is they no finished it? There is no Destiny 1. W was Destiny... No, Destiny 2 was the first one. We started with... <laughs> but it was on the board. No, we started... it, it was on the board. What about all those... What about all those expansions? No. Uh, it started with <laughs> Destiny. <laughs> <laughs> was that was that just part of the journey to making Destiny Two the perfect game? My God, the <laughs> the mental gymnastics required to reconcile this, like <laughs> all to justify rushing a shoddy product out the door. Which is funny too, because like. Honestly, I was there when Destiny 1 launched. There's a lot of things I was going to say about Destiny 1. Broken and unplayable was not one of them. It just lacked content. I, I have no idea if Destiny 2 was broken at launch. I didn't play it, but Destiny 1 was like... The problem was like... The beta. I, I played the beta and I, and I got to the end of the beta. And I was sold on the game. I was like, okay... It, if this is if this is just a beta, this is a lot of content for a beta. Um, it, this game must be pretty huge. And then I got the game, and I realized the beta was actually like one third of the actual game itself, and, and that was the problem. Um, I understand though, velocity. You know, um, you need to release stuff quickly now. <laughs> so did they did they learn the? Oh, you were right. Okay, so they learned the velocity lesson because of Destiny. Of course, 1. because, because he, people he, got mad. No, he wasn't in charge yet. Yeah. Oh, right, right, right. Remember, he has to take over for them to truly learn the lesson. Uh, I mean, I'm getting blocked out of his resume now because of the, <laughs> I have to sign into LinkedIn. Ah, uh, Justin Truman. I'd like to know his. Uh, Okay, here we go. So, um, he, okay. So, oh my god. This is beautiful. Okay, let's explain Justin Truman's career. He joins January of 2010. What was Reach's release date? Hillary's release date. He came from Pandemic Studio after it shut down. So he got nine months on Halo Reach, right? And then he was at Activities Engineering Lead, which kind of tells me that he didn't, probably didn't work on Reach. He's not credited as working on Reach. He's credited as working on Destiny. So they were probably mm -hmm. working on Destiny, and he like joins in to start working on activities in January of 2010. He's the activities engineering lead. So Which... this is probably a department that they made for Destiny. Because I mean, he was a he was a senior programmer at Pandemic and a gameplay lead. I know. So I know it's convenient for me to say this, but um. The activities were one of the things I hated the most about oh, Destiny Oh, no, that, that's what chat confirmed. It's like, <laughs> this guy made one of the worst parts of Destiny 1. <laughs> but so... that's, that's where our story gets interesting, okay? So he's he's that position until September of 2014, which is only two months before they start working on Destiny 2. September 2014 to September 2015, he is a senior engineering lead on Destiny, the Taken King. So he's the engineer lead on, on the Taken King. 
Mm -hmm. He in September of 2015, he takes over as gameplay design director on Destiny 2. September of 2015, which is 10 months after uh, Activision said we're working on a second Destiny game. He's the design director for the whole game. Damn. That's that's really impressive. That's that's a quicker trajectory than like Todd Howard and Emma, honestly. Yeah. So here's the thing. He's in that position for two years. The game launches September of 2017, where his job title changes to just design director. So he's not just on gameplay now. He's the total design director at launch. So that's where this is coming from, because his opinion is launch is the beginning of the journey. <laughs> that's because launch was the beginning of his journey being in charge of Destiny 2 as a whole. He holds that position for a year. He gets promoted to production director. He holds that position until November of 2020, where he becomes the general manager. And he holds that position through to this conference. So at, right now, he's general manager. In five months, he is becomes the chief development officer. Which is his current job so title. How many more people does he have over him at Bungie at this point? Uh, we don't know his title, but let's look up chief development officer i need i need some i need some armor i don't think like i think he, his boss is the board of directors right probably yeah i mean he's an executive level position so it's not even really that he answers to the ceo yeah like he doesn't he, his boss is the investors basically what do you want oh well he's definitely speaking their lingo i guess so this is why he's all launches the beginning of your journey. That's because Destiny 2's launch was the beginning of his journey. Amazing. <laughs> Do you think... Now, this is my tinfoil hat going on here. Um, he... Like, like, who proposed killing Destiny 1? Like, just eliminate it entirely. It, it was probably... It's cynical to say Activision. I almost think it was an internal decision because from what I've seen from the chat, Destiny Ye 1 was having a ton of issues with their new engine. Ye yeah, yeah, yeah. They just couldn't maintain it, which remember, in uh, marketing for Destiny 1, they promised a 10-year lifespan. Okay, so he doesn't have anything. They didn't even have a... Oh, plan God. to have raids they had a halo 2 moment for the vault of glass raids and basically save the game oh no i can i can totally believe that destiny 2 is just a stroke of bad luck for the industry on why it's still around man what the fuck? i love it i love it so fucking much that is perfectly tailored to your community and built to last so a bunch of this like the big cultural hurdle for for our team and, and our organization, one of the main things that I'm gonna keep returning to is about redefining success. Like, what does quality mean to you? Uh, I team? see. If we, if, <laughs> oh, no. if we redefine success as what we've accomplished, then we're successful. Oh, oh no. But once again, this is what leads creators astray, is when they, when they have to start it's cope this is literally no, he's, he's literally just he's right in the sense that he looked at what they were doing before destiny and he redefined success so that destiny would fit alongside halo <laughs> yeah yeah but it's like it's cope yeah and it's how these types of managers take over they say look my results are going to be shit so if i redefine what success is when they are shit i can yeah. say well you know it was still success by the paradigm that I'm in with 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 these metrics that I've convinced you are, are correct. We're we're on the right track now. And I don't just mean in terms of like business goals or KPIs or something. Like I mean, I mean in your bones, like in your heart. <laughs> why do you get up and go to work making video games every day? And for us at Bungie, for a lot of us, like it used to mean that feeling of of seeming perfect, of being impeccable being uncriticizable that is uncriticizable I, I i'd like to who give me names 
Who comes to work and says, I come to work because I want to be perfect. I know that... I, I don't know. This sounds like he's projecting a little bit, honestly. I didn't pay attention to the last sentences he said because I was lining up something that I'd like to play for just maybe a minute or two. <laughs> All right. Let me jump ahead to... It's about the dance. I love the dance. It can be a little bit of a fight. It's always a, a degree of compromise. Someone comes by your desk and says, that's just not quite right. Then things change. You make a cool gun. Things nice. morph. The next thing you know, it's a flamethrower. Things completely get cut. Bungie giveth and it taketh away. The design process is not just driven by the story and it's not just driven by the gameplay. The development cycle revolves around missions. So at the beginning, when we're concepting missions, you fill it with some sort of challenge. When I first start on a mission, I will try to get a good high-level set of goals of enemies, weapons, and events. The first phase is repulse the covenant. And then the second phase, we're trying to have it so the player expands their territory that they have and pushes the neutral and the enemy territory back. And then the third part, let me take a look no, this is not Kroby Cat. Kroby Cat pulled from the same thing we're pulling from, which is the making of Halo 3 documentary. Armor, weapons, I have it that was a minute. That was your detox. You got one minute <laughs> of them being genuine about a video game. Now, let's listen to this asshole tell us about how he's a success. I'm a success in this game industry. I'm as good as the best of the artists. I'm an artiste because I redefine success to say that I... My video game, Destiny 2, is just as good this as dude, any of the Halo games. This dude is... See, what's scary is, like, people like this... Well, people like this exist. And it's terror. People like this are, like... Th these are the people you call sociopaths. Like, you, you think they're sociopaths that you work with. Because, like, they will just manipulate and twist everything. And gaslight people and shit like this. These are the people who create a toxic work environment. And they just... It's so easy for them to get in and just like when it, when a company is down, when there's a moment, that's when that's when they're the most fucking potent. That's when they're the scariest. And where the fuck is this goddamn vendor? I need clothes. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Ra the Radiant Raiment? Oh, no, that's an armor vendor, isn't it? Uh, Oblivion clothes vendor. Well, I I need I need light armor is the thing. You need light armor. Um, maybe stonewall shields. Detailed listing. Um, armor. Imperial City. Okay, I, f I, f I found some. Okay. I found some. Mar I had to go to the shield shop for armor. Uh, the best defense. Yeah, the, the the vendor the vendor the light armor vendor is not there. I don't know where he is. Hey, you're looking for Marrow Rufus. Maybe I gotta like fucking. Let me hang on. Let me read his. Let me read me. his schedule because they gave all the NPCs <laughs> schedules, so they're always like yeah. fucking off somewhere. He gets out of bed every morning at six a.m. because he's got a grind set. He starts the day by eating a two fucking hour breakfast. <laughs> Why? Like, okay, one hour is the minimum sec segment of time for Oblivion, but. Why would they set it to have him have him a fucking two hour breakfast? He eats breakfast with Bernardo. <laughs> he opens shop at 8 a.m. He spends the next 12 hours offering his services and he closes up shop at 8 p.m. During the week, he spends the evening at the Merchant's Inn eating and drinking again until midnight. So the dude's out fucking partying until <laughs> midnight and then goes home and sleeps until six in the morning where he gets up and does it all again. Fucking Sigma male. No wonder, no wonder he has to have a, a two-hour <laughs> breakfast. He's fucking hungover. Yeah, he's like... He only got six hours of sleep. All right, let's listen to this asshole talk. And for us at Bungie, for a lot of us, like it used to mean that feeling of, of seeming perfect, of being impeccable, being uncriticizable. Success for us was feeling uncriticizable. Yeah. I'd say that's pretty uh, successful if nobody's criticizing you. <laughs> I mean, he's like, okay, there's two components to success. Uh, you're doing everything right artistically and you're making money. N like, you don't want to be, you know, this well appreciated person, but you're fucking broke, right? 
I thought you were reading the Bungie yeah. GDC guys schedule. <laughs> you thought it does feel like an oblivion NPC. That's his schedule. Is he's fucking? <laughs> he's doing his services from eight a.m. to eight p.m. and then he goes and parties. <laughs> <laughs> that is all part of that box product mindset. But now we're instead focused on being fast. This man has no person over him that can stop him from saying things like that. <laughs> he has no masters. He has made it. He's free. That, that was... That was his metric of success. Mm -hmm. When I no longer have to answer to anybody, I've made it. Man, he would have loved being a YouTuber. It, I'm telling you, this guy, he would he would be a force to be reckoned no, this, with this, on YouTube. This guy's a gold play button easy. This, this oh, guy's yeah, a gold yeah, yeah. play button, switches to Twitch, pulls like 100k viewers, <laughs> and then runs a crypto scam and kills his entire channel. And like, <laughs> his run is probably about eight years, but he walks away with like a huge bag of money. Yeah. So good. God damn. Box product as if it's bad that you're selling something complete. No, that's his entire perspective. His entire thing here is he's pitching the idea that you don't have to release a complete product because eventually the game will be perfect. Hey, guys, Destiny 1, right? Is De Destiny 1, right? I Like... You know, when I play Destiny 2, I'm investing in the future product of Destiny 2. If I want to play a perfect game, I go back to Destiny 1. <laughs> Somebody asked if I'm running the unofficial patch. I am. So this bug, this quest will not bug out for me. Well, it, 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 it might, but... We, we've crashed yeah. twice so far, so you never know. That, that's why I'm going to make a hard save right now. Betty sold those guys the submarine. <laughs> Oh yeah, that, that's that's that was a joke that we were ma that I was mm -hmm. making earlier. Is that like this is the type of person that gets people killed on a submarine? This is the guy who's listening to the accountant. Well, he's not know, listening to the auditors who are like, "Where is all this money? I need all of this, all of this." Like exactly, he's listening to the to the um to the dude at H and R Block. No, listen. Who's like, you know, you don't have to report all of this. Car you, you could get away with it. You're probably not going to get audited. You can save a lot of money if you don't report it. Carbon fiber is a great material. It's okay if it flexes <laughs> under pressure because... You ever seen a racing bike? Okay, racing bikes go fast. And fast <laughs> velocity is better than underwater position. Okay? <laughs> Listen, you, if, if you're underwater and there's something wrong, what would you rather be? Fast or slow? What's gonna, Personally, I'd rather be fast. What's going to get you out of that dangerous oh, situation no. fast? A carbon fiber hyperbike or an old steel frame beater that you'd get at Walmart? I'm telling you, these dinosaurs, these middle-aged white men dinosaurs that are designing submarines, yeah. <laughs> they're used in steel because that's what's established. They've got a box product mindset when it comes to submarines. We here at Ocean Gate, we sell a service. <laughs> Dude, I can totally see it. This dude's fucking selling submarine rides at Ocean Gate. He's not even the guy that gets killed in the process. No, no, no. He's selling the rides to people. And the really, the really tough part here, though, is that to do that you have to get comfortable with public failure. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, I, oh, I, no, God. I can fully believe that you are comfortable with public failure. <laughs> Hold on. I've never gotten fired, so it's no big deal. Com comments are enabled. There's 11K views on this, and it has 114 comments. Dude, um... This is amazing material. This is some of the best stuff I've seen on YouTube in a long time. In, term, <laughs> this in terms of raw entertainment so value. So fucking good. The fact that this doesn't have a million views and 10,000 comments amazes me.
Number two comment. This is probably one of the most embarrassing talks I've ever seen. And it speaks volumes <laughs> on why Destiny is such a mediocre product. Because that's exactly <laughs> what they see it as. A product, not a game, an experience, or any medium for artistic expression. It's all about velocity. What an awful company. <laughs> Nail on the head. Oops. I think I'm gonna... I, I forgot... I forgot how much of a labyrinth these uh, these castles are, so I think I'm gonna go pay the beggar five gold so I can get my uh, get my quest marker. Like you have to get come. No, okay. This guy is a YouTuber. He's taking every shady sponsorship deal he can. Oh yeah. It's all about velocity. He loves raid raid shadow. It's legends. okay if the sponsorship fails, and I embarrass myself because it's just velocity. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. We got to worry about the next video. Comfortable with all those failures and those iterations that journey from your game sucking to it being great. You know what pisses me off about this as a video creator? I'm not afforded this kind of liberty where I can just I can yeah. just <laughs> dump a shitty video out on out on the internet. And don't worry, guys, the Skyrim video will eventually be good because I'm going to spend the next nine months patching it up. This would legit be like me dropping a Skyrim video in three months and then spending nine months like gradually updating it. I can't do that. Do you know how much <laughs> shit, if I could, I would fix about like the Morrowind video? And not even like script things, just audio things. Just production. Yeah, yeah. Just production things. There's so much that I could fix that I don't get the option to. I could fix it. It would be a separate video, wish, and then like all the comments are lost, wish, and the views are lost, the algorithmic. I wish lost. I could have added an ending to my Mass Effect One video. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, there's so much, there's so much that you could do if you could update videos, but you can't. I have to live with the fact that um, I need to release a finished product. More of that happening out in the open instead of in secret at your studio. <clears throat> I hope we get to the trust, retention, and revenue section. How much longer do you think the stream will go? Let me look up... Let me look up some of this stuff. And, uh, how much longer are you gonna how go? How far... I don't know, um, how far are we into, uh, into the video? We are 20 minutes in. <laughs> We're gonna have to wrap it up soon. I, d I probably should eat dinner or something. I, we, we gotta do, like, a, a, a stream let's, just going okay. through the, the rest of this fucking thing. Let's nail... It's in four minutes. Let's uh, jump ahead of it. Let's nail this point. We can come back and do this another mm -hmm. time. But while we have the kind of the the well, well, we've got a good rapport. I, I want. I'm. I think I'm gonna. F I'm gonna finish this quest and then we'll we'll wrap it up. And the mantra that we can. So we've skipped four minutes here. Okay. I don't know if he said. Yeah. He probably said a ton of gems, but like. I don't know if he's actually advanced. <laughs> I mean, his literally, ideas. literally, fucking every every sentence this man has said so far has been a quote. Every sentence this man has said could make a, an eight minute video. Yeah. <laughs> came up with during that difficult year was first trust, then retention, oh then my. revenue. Are you an adventure? Okay, Whoa. we have to get the context of this. We've jumped. We've, we've jumped in too early. We got to get the context of this. Whoa! I hope there's context. It's not that does not make that sound as exploitive as it just came off as. All right, so this slide still has him on redefined success, so I assume he's still talking about the the concept of redefining success just for three more minutes. Big, your your game is with your chosen audience. But in order to adopt a service mindset, we've had to get a lot better at defining multiple axes of success and doing that very precisely. The only reason you have to do that is because you need to explain to the investors why it's okay that everybody's yeah. pissed off at us. So let me start with our first tangible example. This was when we really started learning to break apart and be more precise with our definitions. It's going to be probably, let me check his resume, like let me check his resume. Um, I like how we're t we're listening to this as I'm bribing an NPC for her to like <laughs> tell me 
the secrets of their like castle so I can rob. My it. gamble is that this is gonna be post September twenty seventeen, so post Destiny Two launch. These that they're learning this lesson. So remember this terrifying moment I was talking about in February of 2018. That's pretty close to my guess. So it's after the huge player drop off the Destiny 2 experience. Wait, what was that? I, I'm sorry. I was it's, listening to my NPC for a okay. second. I speculated that um, the terrifying moment was going to be uh, that he had to learn all these lessons about redefining success was after September of 2017 when he took over as the lead on <laughs> Destiny 2. <laughs> And he said it's February of 2018. So that was within five months. <laughs> of a man, I was within five months of a man who's had a 13 year career there. So, oh my God. I feel pretty good about I've, I've got this man down. Dude, like, see, people think we had this discussion where it's earlier, like, where it's easy to start to try and, like, get into the mindset of somebody, like, a YouTuber specifically, and, like, you, it, it, it evolves into an issue of, like, everybody's putting on a front or something like that. It's impossible to really... The fact that we we have this guy pinned down, like, we know him now. The, the fact that you're able to come so close to that. If I had... If we had listened to that three minutes of context, I probably could have guessed that it was going to be that first six-month period. And, and gotten it down <laughs> even closer. Yeah. Because I'm like, it, okay, this is a man who's going to take credit for everything after he took charge of Destiny 2, because that's what he's proud of. And so the low point has to be the low point of Destiny 2. And then once I understand, figure out that context, I'm like, okay, even though I don't know, I don't know these stories about Destiny 2's player count, I can probably guess that it was like the first, in that first year, because that's the rough part. You yeah. can reverse engineer and figure out this guy's entire playbook. This is fucking great. Living through it felt like a stressful, real-life version of FTL, if you've ever played that game. Like, I like the notion that this guy's an FTL player. There's something amusing about that. This would be up this guy's alley, this kind of strategy, um, disaster management game. Because that's kind of what FTL yeah. is, is. It's a series of disasters <laughs> that you have to manage. Yeah, this is totally this guy's game. He's he's play he's running Bungie. Like, what what fucking airlock can we open? You know, how many people do we need to fire to make this work? Like, th that's the kind of game he's playing with people's lives. FTL's bad. Mm. It isn't live service. He can't like it. True. Mm. Yeah, his metaphor is founded in a thing that he thinks is antiquated and it's an indie game too which is uh even more interesting like if you're shout out to the guy who commented in here literally hours ago to watch this gdc video yeah if you're still in here uh <laughs> sound out um because <laughs> yeah true, i don't even true hero right there doing god's work yeah what brought it up oh yeah we were reading the book and i think i was read oh yeah i read the bungee quote in the book <laughs> and they were probably like where is oh yeah yeah you, you gotta contrast guy. this with modern yeah 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 yeah. Uh, what what is it, great suggestion if you want to watch this video i will link it in chat hopefully it doesn't get filtered um but if you want to look it up it is from box products to live service how destiny 2 transformed to bungie it's a talk by justin truman you just got to look up his name and it'll probably come up If your engine room oh, is on fire and your O2 is draining out through a hull breach and your shields are down, which of those is most important to fi fix first? I told you, it's right up his alley. He loves... <laughs> he's in his element when he's managing a disaster. I kind of... You know what? I kind of vibe with that. Um, I, I like fixing things. Yeah. But he's... He, like I said, he's one of those people like... He'll sneak in when somebody's at their lowest and is, it'll be like, I know how to fix this, but it's going to cost you your soul. Mm -hmm. And you also have to pay me a shit ton of money to do it. Like, he's the type of person who loves, like, if he was an accountant, he'd love to be, like, one of those um, uh, people who go in and, like, evaluate a company and, like, how much are they uh, actually worth. Like a liquidator? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, dude, this is like the exact like, personality during, of the during guy like that the... ran like Sears into the ground. Yeah, yeah who yeah. did it intentionally to make money? Yeah, yeah, yeah. like that company died he, because he it was loves... it was intention. It was murdered. It, it was murdered. Yeah, the hedge fund people came in and they're like, "We can make so much money just by gutting this company." Because if you get it wrong, your ship's gonna explode. And the mantra that we came up with during that difficult year was first trust, then retention, then revenue. With context, this quote is amazing. The context here is they had a disastrous launch with Destiny 2. They were hemorrhaging players and you can just imagine them sitting around at a, in a meeting and he comes up with this quote and he, and he the first time that he says it because he came up with it you know he did he, he's yeah. got a bunch of people on the staff they're all worried that they're going to lose their jobs because it was that time period where like blizzard was just even successful departments they just fire everybody on yeah, yeah, yeah. so everybody in the meeting is worried they're going to lose their job this dumbass stands up <laughs> turns on his slideshow and says guys we need trust and then we'll get retention and then we'll get revenue that's where this quote comes from. That is amazing. <laughs> the black pill. I, I, it's, it's it's the de it's the devil. Like it literally, you're doing a deal with the devil. It's uh, people are like, we are desperate, and this man has the answers. It is ex every company that is being run poorly has a man who's exactly like this. Yeah. Okay, this is not one single corruptive influence that's affecting a ton of people. Every company has something like this. This is the a personification of that voice on your shoulder that's telling you, hey, a few microtransactions, you know, it's not the worst thing. In-app purchases, you don't need to worry about in-app purchases. It's okay. Justin Truman's on the grind site. Get that paper from these Destiny 2 sheep. The thing is, the man has transcended my ability. Like, I have a lot of respect for absolute grifters who just yeah. come in and make a ton of money. He's transcended that because he's so stupid that he's going to say it out loud. <laughs> Why is that note worth so much? Which one? Divining the Elder Scroll. Ah, oh, fuck me. Probably just to um make it so that players are more likely to grab it and read it oh right because um the 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 the, the whole story eververse was added in the time frame you're talking about uh and no context i don't know if that's good or bad that's what's hilarious again i want to reiterate i've never played destiny 2 beyond that like free time that it was available so um not free to play like but there was a beta and i played it and i thought it was all right you, that's what's scary is i very easily could have ended up in the destiny community because it's it's yeah. it, it is kind of up my alley yeah yeah and it's like i'm glad i was stubborn and said i'm not gonna play destiny until it comes on pc and that since that never happened i never did and i never got fucking trapped in it <laughs> The microtransaction shop is ever est okay. So that's where that all comes from. Because I did see a video explaining kind of the downfall of the game like that. And we realized that our first priority was player trust. Because we'd assume that's one okay, see, that's how they get you. The first part mm -hmm. of the statement's always good. It always makes sense that you would yeah. build up trust, right? Yeah. And it sounds like it because because when you're in a situation like this, the, the first thing, your first reflex really is to look introspectively, right? And be like, oh, we, we really must have fucked something up. And this guy comes in and he has the perfect pathos explanation. And it's that we, we, we betrayed their trust. And it's like that, 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 that feels right. That sounds right. Mm -hmm. And in certain cases, and in, in a certain sense, that is true. Never trust anybody but, that talks about building trust. You either have trust you, or oh you don't. God. Okay. Yeah, yeah. If you're doing a good thing, you don't need to worry about building trust. 
And if you don't have trust, yeah, those, you just those do are the, good those are the people. Those are the people who are like, you know, if if she doesn't like you or something like that, you just keep trying. You you never give up. You, you whatever you gotta do to get her attention or something like that. That that that's fine. Because she'll learn to trust you. She'll learn to like you. Now, Diablo 4 players that were qu questioning me when I said the microtransaction shop in Diablo 4 is probably just laying the groundwork for something that's going to happen in the future because every other Blizzard product did that. This is what we're talking about. This is exactly the type of bullshit that goes on in the meetings in these games that has them go from, oh, it's just cosmetics to, oh, it's just a battle pass to, oh, it's just pay to win. <laughs> Yeah, no, we're listening. We're literally listening to the slippery slope argument. Yeah, and it's like, not this slippery slope. Oh, I'm worried about it's happening. It's we should build a slippery slope so that it can happen. Yeah. <laughs> Does the hunter have this one's ring? Oh, I forgot to I forgot to visit her to talk to her oh. before going to get the ring <laughs> so I could get the extra. <laughs> God. When we built Destiny Two. Oh, here's my face once again. Who ran yeah. into this would just happily leave and come back for the next expansion. But what they were actually doing once they ran out was they were sticking around in all of our online communities with these megaphones shouting to everyone to avoid this game because oh. it sucked. Oh, God. And this was oh especially God. bad with, with streamers and influencers because we had <laughs> literally He's talking about us. hurt their livelihood by making streaming destiny. A less viable profession so they were loudly and like understandably shouting their complaints to every viewer this is ho Hold this on. is horrifying but he's not wrong pump pump the brakes there were people who were saying that bungie ruined their livelihood because destiny was not like a forever game that they could stream forever somebody somebody probably said that but i think that he's extrapolating He's making the argument that all of this anti-Destiny 2 stuff was owed to revenue loss from Destiny 2 being a less popular game because of their actions. So it's like a control thing. He's like saying, I'm in charge of Destiny 2 and by being in charge of Destiny 2, I'm responsible for the revenue of the people who make content about Destiny 2. It's a power thing because he's he's like essentially internally codified this idea that I'm not just in charge of Bungie, I'm in charge of everything that surrounds Bungie. Yeah. Which <sighs> Ah, once again, it's like it's nice when developers embrace their community and like take some sort of like ownership and understand well like like a like a game that's super moddable and the developers understand like you know if we release this patch without even telling the modders or showing any of them like the dudes who make the the script extenders or something it's gonna fuck a lot of shit up maybe we should you know cut them in or something like that 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 comes from a good place um what he's describing right now sounds neurotic and like like you said very controlling yeah um <laughs> that's yeah, I've never okay. I've never known a game community to turn on like look at the Bethesda space. You if this logic was true, there would be like Mr. Matty plays and Juicehead and Oxhorn and all these Bethesda channels, these pro Bethesda channels would be, you know, criticizing Bethesda because they hadn't put out more content for them because they were fucking starving yeah. in the years between yeah. Fallout 4 and Starfield. They have been dying for content. Okay. <laughs> so if this logic were true, they all would have turned, but they didn't. Okay. Now there's an anti Bethesda space, and I'm using a generalized term. I don't like the term anti Bethesda because I don't think it's quite accurate to describe, but it is a term that we would be labeled with. And his thought process doesn't apply because it's not like I was a Bethesda content creator. I got spurned by the lack of new content fallout content and so i i was gradually twisted because i my revenue was hurt and eventually i started criticizing bethesda that's not how it works okay these fucking destiny fans would eat shit and justify it so when they were getting criticized they were getting criticized like oh my god i don't need to explain it we hey. know it's bullshit uh, so I, so i have the ring and i just told her like amusei was going to sell it and now she's going to pay me double. So is that 
an unofficial patch fix? I think there is unofficial. There are, well, there definitely are fixes for this quest. Uh, Thieves Guild Oblivion. Quick side tangent. Quick break here, because this is breaking my head. <laughs> Darcy. <laughs> No, this is a normal thing. If you don't tell her, she only gives you 100 gold. Okay. Interesting. I hope so. You have earned the reward. The Thieves Guild was always good to Adarji's dearest mate. I am grateful that the memory is still honored. Why do so we, we do this job for we her? We needed to solve these trust issues first. Hunting. So we focused a lot of our early work on trying to repair our reputation with our players and our community <clears throat> and our influencers. We, we bumped to the top of our priority queue several early changes to the game, not because our designers believed that these were the most important root causes to our engagement issues, no. but because they were vocal pain points in the community and addressing them quickly would clearly indicate that we were listening and we were no so okay what happened to your whole velocity thing which just wouldn't velocity solve this problem you're eventually going to address those criticisms anyways <laughs> yeah so okay <laughs> you're telling me this is okay so you have the blizzard people who are saying you don't know what you want yeah you, you like you don't want that right this dude is on the complete opposite end he's like they're telling us shit that we know is wrong, but we're going to do it anyways. Yeah. Because it's going to make them trust it us. It doesn't matter how much they misunderstand the tech. They are, they're calling this, yeah. No, no, no. They've reversed and they figured it out because they know that we're going to fix it first. We're going to validate the the people by like, oh my God, they listen to me. Because like, like, look at how giddy I get when I think that, like, Bethesda listened to me on the Fallout Yay. 3 launcher <laughs> thing. So, like, to actually, like, have like have that be an intentional part of the design and process. Remember, we're going to build trust with these community members by directly addressing their things. So, they were, like, line item, like, this des Destiny this Creator A, we're, we've knocked out their results. We should be getting positive videos from him within two weeks. That, that's it. That's it. You hit the nail on the fucking head. You have to remember that this is in the context of him complaining about people who were being loud with with big microphones. So we're going to do what this we're going to do what they're suggesting just to shut them the fuck up. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. And then, OK, we, we shut up the influencers. <laughs> we get them back on our side and then the rest of the community will follow them. We'll fall in line. Yep. Holy shit. <laughs> this is amazing it wow really is. like i, I said stop. this this dude might actually be a sociopath i don't like playing the 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 armchair uh you know armchair therapist or whatever but that's sociopathic behavior right there mm -hmm. knowing exactly which social threads to pull to get the desired outcome yeah and to think like and then you just look at this dude's like trajectory through through the company as well. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if he's coming up with suggestions like this for how to fix the game, what is he doing in the back end to get to the position to be able to give those suggestions and claim all the credit as well? So remember, credit credit's super important. Wow. When I do a corpo playthrough of Cyberpunk, it's going to be based on this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Responding to our player community and we were just trying to do our best and this this trust battle took us almost a full year if I'm being honest and that's also when we did stuff like we were full year uh, February 2018 yeah hang on okay so he's design director February of 2018, a full year later, he's production director. So this timeline that he's talking through, he got a promotion in during. Mm hmm Of course. Because he was right. Hello. Yeah. Well, he was right once he redef once he managed to redefine um the uh the metrics. Yeah. But I mean, like, 
you know, they probably saw a player increase because they specifically targeted the creators. My God, dude, this is amazing. <laughs> and it's like, see, I'm not even saying like they're like this is unusual or anything like that. We know um, game developers and publishers and stuff love to target creators um, because first off, they're cheap. They're really fucking cheap. And they're stupid. And, and they're easily yeah, amused. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, so it's like he's saying stuff that we already know, but he is, he's saying it. He's saying it at the at fucking GDC. Like, yeah, we ba basically. And the audience is full bribed. of sharks that are just like him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all nodding their heads like, yeah, yeah. I Target am... the influencers. Fuck those assholes. Shocked. Shock and awe right this, now. This is the kind of mental refresh I need before I have to listen to Todd Howard talk for six hours tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, because Todd, Todd Howard is a master of, like, saying just the right thing to, you know, you know, just make people feel, put like, feel comfortable. This dude is just, like, bold face. I am corrupt and i do not give a this shit. is march of last because year this, for anybody there's never there's never been any consequences there's never been any consequences for what i've said or what i've done and, and it as far as i can tell is there never will be because gamers are fucking stupid what todd thing is tomorrow we're we're gonna be listening to all the todd interviews i gotta be honest with you i need to clip some of this to play on tomorrow's stream <laughs> so that i can go i can i need to open that stream with this is what todd howard could be yeah, yeah, right. So, no matter what I say today, Todd Howard is still leagues above this. Yeah. I, I want to believe that Todd Howard still has, like, integrity. And, like, I really do think he, he's making the games he really wants to make, right? Mm -hmm. Um, like, they, like, they really do believe in Starfield. They really did believe in Skyrim and stuff. Um... They're just really ashamed with Fallout 76, but whatever. Um, I don't think I'm going to clip the stream. I, I And I did download this, and I, I don't think there's any worry. Because there's no way this guy's going to hear about it before tomorrow. And like, we need to pull the GDC <laughs> thing now. Because he's got no shame. Yeah. He's got no shame. He sees nothing oh, yeah, wrong with yeah, it. Yeah. And he sees nothing wrong with it because he was right. He was He's right insofar as this is exactly how you make money. <laughs> in this environment in this industry you gotta play like this now but yeah i will be streaming tomorrow yeah I'll, I'll be um i'll be on there too it'll be another co-stream i'll need to uh do some therapy for my throat <laughs> which is usually just honey and an apple and uh, no caustic meals Every single Destiny YouTuber has played this video at this point. They don't give a fuck. I would hope so. I would hope I would <laughs> hope that there would be a um, an introspective moment. Yeah, throat therapy pause. Uh, I would hope that there would be an introspective moment if you there, for if you were a Destiny YouTuber, where you go, "Holy shit! <laughs> I made this complaint." They solved it a month later. I started shilling the game again. The last three years, the last four years of my career as a Destiny YouTuber have been a sham. I was completely taken advantage of. If yeah. I was a Destiny YouTuber, I'd be playing this shit every fucking video because I would be so pissed. <laughs> that This is the <laughs> fatal flaw of this guy. You would never admit this because those influencers <laughs> that you manipulated now know. <laughs> that's the fatal flaw here is that he admitted it because the scam depends on them maintaining that illusion that they're not doing it yeah i Damn. i helped him get to this point yeah only he doesn't get to say that because they're not under his employee he doesn't get to email them and go i made you i brought destiny 2 back from the brink and you were part of it and you have to thank me I'd be playing. I'd be shouting this from the fucking windows if I was a Destiny YouTuber that got <laughs> that got caught up in this. We removed all of the microtransactions from some of our releases in that year, taking. 
Say it outright. Say it outright. If we want to build trust, we will remove the microtransactions. And then as, as soon as we have that trust, guess what's coming right yeah. back? <laughs> yeah. Just look at Fallout, Fallout 76. Multi-million dollar losses in the process because the risk... We took the losses oh. because the benefits of having that trust were too good to have. We knew that we would make 10 times the money if we built that trust and then stabbed them in the yep. back instead of just keep stabbing yeah. them in the front. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we had the cash to burn. Remember, there's a lot of developers who tried this and it didn't work. Temporarily, Star Wars Battlefront did it. Actually, Star Wars Battlefront ripped out all the microtransactions. Event like, um, You might be describing a time period in like... 2018 i think where they took it out and then they brought it back but after 2019 all the microtransactions were gone i'm shocked and fucking amazed that i live in a world where battlefront 2017 <laughs> is blown out of the water in shadiness <laughs> well it's ea you know it, it, it's kind of one of the things where it's like the game, they tried to do the redemption arc, they did everything right, but people just didn't care enough, and EA did not have enough goodwill by then to I don't, be able to even get the benefit of the doubt. I, I don't think, I think a, a one-off stream of the the beginning experience of playing Destiny 2, I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't even know how it plays now. I played it when the, when the, um, expe when the original, um, campaign was still in it so i have no idea how it even starts you should now. we'll cook up a a, a, a fresh <laughs> battle net account and get destiny 2 i think you guys start with the free trial so you get do the I, free trial experience do i do i even need a battle battle.net account i think they decoupled it now it's just steam okay so just fresh account make sure that there's no way that it can be linked mm -hmm. i think you've got that new like steam account yeah yeah, yeah i got i got a new steam account boot it up I'll play like a support role because um, we could keep watching this during that stream <laughs> while we're on. Yeah, that could be the stream where we finish this is you're playing the onboarding for Destiny 2. Yeah. That's a great stream idea. Thanks, Gong. <laughs> yeah. Of losing more trust was so much worse at the time than the known loss in Revenant. But that's skipping a step. Didn't he skip the retention step? Like, he's being transparent. <laughs> he doesn't care about retention. He cares about revenue. Retention's all. Yeah. Retention's just what you need to get the revenue. So like, that's that's the only that's the only extent of it. He doesn't care about retention from the perspective that he's giving something to people that they would enjoy. He doesn't derive any pleasure from from facilitating people's happiness or. You know, like I like making videos because, uh, you know, I like the thought process that someone's at work listening to them and that I'm making their shift yeah, that, easier. Yeah, that is a um, that is a component to it. And the reason that we were able to eat that revenue loss was because we knew that revenue wasn't the goal yet. Trust was. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you're ba yeah, yeah, and you're you're basically saying we were paying for trust. I understand the fight is the yeah. revenue loss was you paying for trust. Not bad work for <laughs> yet, what is it now? incredible. Yet, incredible. How do not? How do more people not know about this? This. Hang on. How did I not hear about? I'm going this? in my server right now. Channel one. The channel one is where I post videos that I really enjoy. Not, they're not submissions. <laughs> they're actually like stuff that I find. I didn't find this one, but I got recommended it. But I'm posting yeah. this in there because this is one of the best. This is so great. If if, if this doesn't <laughs> viscerally piss you off, this is amazing content. Because this doesn't piss me <laughs> off. Well, because it's like I'm checked out of the AAA industry at this point. Mm -hmm. Like he's just saying he's only confirming what I've known. It. it you know what? I don't. So I'm it's, not pissed it's like, off because it's, I'm vindicated. It's vindicated. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's ex you fucking stole the word out of my mouth. Because it's like, I used to get road rage. I, I love this example. I used to get road rage until I realized that it's vindicating when you're able to actually predict the stupid shit people do on the road. So it's like, once I was able to do that because I became a better driver, more experienced driver, and I start to see people do moves, like, I can see them doing the, the move in their head before they even know that they're going to do it. So like 20 seconds ahead, I'm like, that dude's going to make that jump. He's not going to signal. 
And then long behold, and it's like, I don't get angry from that because I'm vindicated instead. That's, that's the feeling that I'm getting right now. <laughs> this is everything that we were told wasn't happening. This is like, yeah, <laughs> this is like a, a, a yeah, okay. It's all in your Twitter head. leaks, uh, Twitter gate, whatever it was called. Twitter files, Twitter <laughs> files. When Elon Musk yeah, was yeah. like dumping all the, uh, private exchanges that were going on at Twitter felt so fucking vindicating. <laughs> because it was stuff that we knew, but it was proven. And it was shit that was calling conspiracy yeah, yeah. theories. Okay. And I can't tell you the shit that I've dealt with for years of people saying that stuff like this isn't happening. Okay. The AAA industry, it's never been better. Games have never been better. And then this guy comes along and says, and, and, and proves everything that I thought was true. Was true. He disconnected the filter from it, from his thoughts to his words. I have to wonder if this guy has ever had a filter. He has a Twitter account. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, I was going to do that earlier. I was going to look at his Twitter account and see what he's doing. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, it's either, it's one of two things. Either he's he's never had a filter and he's never been in a position where he could be held accountable for the things he says and the things he does, or he's learned over the years, like, you gotta there's things you gotta say and then there's things you gotta keep to yourself and like but it's just like it burned him so fucking much to hold back all this shit for so long and now he's in a position where he he believes like i'm untouchable the company that i am in is on the top of the world because they did what i said and like shit will never land on me and it's like now he just lets everything fly out it's one of those two. Dude, I'm, imagine the pivot, the, I, pivot, the pivot twist. It's been about a month now that I've been thinking Cyberpunk's the next big thing. We do this Destiny stream and I get so fascinated with the game that I'm like, Destiny long form project, let's go. That would, that would be, <laughs> it'd be insane. There's, there's, there's a lot here. But no, I think it's going to be, I, I think it's going to be limited to this talk. I think that this is the big like entertainment value. Yeah. Because I this yeah, transcends yeah. being a Destiny fan. You don't have to play Destiny to know, to to get what's going on here. <laughs> it would like these clips would make a video really entertaining about Destiny, but um, like the rest of the content related to Destiny, yeah, it's just it's it's that'd be a nightmare of a project. You thought Fallout seventy six was bad, yeah, yeah. I definitely I definitely agree with those people that were saying, well, Destiny's still worse. Because now I know. I now I see. I've <laughs> been illuminated to just how bad destiny had it over there i thought that destiny was just like yeah we've got you know a ton of microtransactions I, yeah and like a bunch of yeah yeah i content. thought i had no idea i thought it was like i thought they were like you know just having like an up and down sort of thing like you know sometimes they release a bad thing but you know at its core like bungie's bungie's misguided and probably like you know old bungie's dead okay but maybe new bungie isn't like that bad right well here's the thing is destiny is such a covered game in terms of live streams live streamed content that even if the mm -hmm. old content's not available i can still cover it because every angle that's possible of it has been done yeah 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 it would just it would just be a pain in the ass to do that project Revenue can come later and then once we have later it's always about it's always that temporal relation that there not only will it come later not only is the goal to make it come later which fine it's a business whatever but not only is the goal to make it come later, but that it's guaranteed. We do this right and it's guaranteed. Yeah. This is a, this is a strategy that would never work for the majority of companies in the industry. And the only reason that Bungie has had it has it work is because he came along, parasitically attached himself to a company with a brand that was amazing. Yes. A proven track record rock star company he parasitically attaches himself on to their track record and only because it was bungie and only because they enjoyed those successes was he able to take this risk and have it pay off yeah and also the money to burn player trust and sentiment under control we then focus once we had it under control yeah, I'm under control. Yeah, I mean, like, this is a guy that's doing a retrospective. <laughs> you know, he built this basic plan. It worked and he felt vindicated at the time that it worked because he was proven right that, like, I can totally manipulate these fuckers into doing it because I, I built a, we built a loyal like it's almost like the entirety of Destiny <clears throat> one was just to 
build it up so that this could happen. <laughs> Have a low point, get people invested that the low point's over, Destiny is so fucking back, and then like you get even an even bigger audience. Yeah. Focused on retention. And this was the real focus of our first major expansion after Destiny 2 launched, Forsaken. Forsaken's... Someone said something about Forsaken, I think. Notably, Forsaken... Forsaken? For, no, Forsaken. Forsaken's considered by many <laughs> as the best released in the franchise, and currently most of its content is boring slash pointless. It makes sense because Forsaken was created to get that effect out of you. And I know that sounds cynical because I would say... You know, okay, Halo was made for you to enjoy it. Forsaken was made for you to enjoy it, too. But for a very different motivation. It wasn't that they were making it because they wanted you to enjoy it. They were making it because they wanted you to enjoy it so that you would trust them again. Yeah, that you would shut up and trust them again. It's such a mistake that he said it. <laughs> that he said it out loud. I wonder if like uh, this I hate everything video is going to be like a big spark in their community. Is this is this a new video that just came out? Uh, it's definitely been posted recently. I hate everything. Destiny 2. Yeah, one day ago. It's got 300,000 views. Are you still on the, uh, you're playing this off the watch together, right? Yes. All right. I'm just going to switch over to that. I'm, I'm getting tired of running around. Yeah. You're t tired of training uh, acrobatics. Yeah. <laughs> so let's, let's just switch over to. Forsaken was built around killing off a fan favorite character for mm -hmm. empathy points. And the next expansion is bringing him back for even more empathy points. Dude. In like this talk contextualizes so much. Oh boy, you better, uh, can we lock like the, the watch together? Oh, I flashed it again. Yeah. God damn it. We'll see if anybody joins. Yeah. Product focus. But there, there should be a settings panel. Yeah, it's settings in the playlist section. Uh, okay. I ahead. thought you. I I thought you thought. I thought you that chat message said for spoken instead of forsaken. No, everybody thought it was for spoken. Forsaken introduced random roll weapons after they removed them from the base game and its launch. The chase of the god roll was a big incentive of the series. Yeah, I know that uh, Destiny Two is another one of those series that I think they they probably came up with the god roll term, and I think. Fallout 76 was taking it from them. I just got here. Who is this guy? This is Justin Truman. He is the chief development officer at Bungie. Uh, so one of the top dogs at Bungie, basically responsible for Destiny 2 in the state that it's in. I don't see a way to lock this down. Product focus more than any other specific goal for that release was to fix the end game for Destiny 2, to fix our retention and to ensure that there were plenty of long term pursuits and content in Destiny 2 for our most hardcore players. Well, almost in a way, only an officer could talk like this because anybody that's lower would I'm pretty sure they would have to um, they'd have to be sending it like presenting their presentation at GDC to their the legal team at the company they work for so that it all gets approved of like, yeah, you're not going to say anything that violates your NDA. And so like because he's above that, he's able to have this kind of this such this, this huge like revelatory like this explains years of the game's development focus. And uh, yeah. Anyone lower would walk off this stage unemployed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this focus allowed the product to succeed. Not just succeed in being a great expansion, which, which it was, but being the expansion that Destiny 2 needed at that moment in time as a service. Again, he's not saying anything that's wrong. 
but he's definitely saying things that are alarming. And it worked. So this was that terrifying moment in February of 2018. But by the time Forsaken launched one year in, our brand trust was back on track. Our retention had recovered from that precipitous. This is not a retention stat. This is just your active user stat. <laughs> Can we get like a play play hour counter thing? Can we get some any kind of better statistic? And what is what even is this chart? Hold on. That's what I'm wondering. Okay, so it's like weeks after weeks after Okay, so no weekly active users. Wow. And I assume this is measured in weeks, but I don't know. But there's no there's no indicator there's of what no they're, numbers. Yeah, because there's no numbers on the Y scale. So it's they're like, never gonna say how, how many do I players even... they had. That's like one of the closest kept secrets for any kind of live service game. Because, but it's like so I don't even know like they could be they could be messing with the Y scale so that it just looks more dramatic than it actually was. Mm -hmm. And they could just lie about this like fucking how could yeah. you possibly ever disprove this? Yeah, no, uh, these types of companies keep their player counts under wraps because they know full well that that people are going to be like, no, 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 guys, infinite. It's just not played on Steam. OK, yeah, that's yeah. why these companies, they hated Steam so much because Steam uh, Steam charts Publishes. were a thing and yeah. they fucking hated knowing that people could like check how many people were playing their game. That's why they wanted to yeah. create alternative launchers and their own launchers and <laughs> have these different play like all the PC Halo Infinite players. Oh, they're playing through the Xbox app. Nobody plays through the yeah. Xbox app. It's fucking horrible. <laughs> it's one of the worst plays that you could play a video game. OK, Steam is functional. But because the Xbox app exists, they can say that oh, PC has a ton of players. It's amazing. Drop. The year Forsaken came out was nothing but absolute quality content. They got the clout and word of mouth that the game's good again and then fell off. Same for Witch Queen as well. I feel like Fallout 76 had a like an emulation of that. Where like they had a couple they like even the brain rot people, you know, Wastelanders, Brotherhood of Steel, they have that time period that they can go back and think, man, the game was good during this time period, and then it just fell off. After D2 launch. <clears throat> and only after we had solved... The problem that Halo Infinite has is because it's multiplayer, is free to play, there's no reason. You don't have a Game Pass excuse for why you wouldn't play it on the superior platform to play it on. for trust and solved for retention, did we then actually start paying attention to the business again? My stomach's dropping. <laughs> 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 I, it, Cause I mean, I know this is where it was all going, but like <laughs> a more intelligent game designer would come up here and say, we had this drastic drop off and we were really worried but we were always focused on making games that we would want to play. And so we did the work. Yeah. We did. We sacrificed revenue, but we did good content to give people what they wanted to turn the game around so that we could earn their revenue again. And he's like flat out saying we are always chasing the revenue and we knew to get the revenue. We needed retention and to get the retention. We needed their trust. <laughs> like his mindset, he's presenting it this way, but his mindset's backwards. He starts at the bottom. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's the funny thing, too, is like you can look at this. See, this is the most this is what's so sinister about this. You can look at this as one of two ways. You can either look at this as, as the charitable way, or the incharitable way. The charitable way is like, OK, yeah, this all makes a lot of sense. Like we, we, we want it. We want them to trust us again. And if they're sticking around the retention, that that makes sense because they, they're they starting to trust us. again. It's like, it, it, oh, my God, it's it's one of those like mind logic games where it's like it's just worded so perfectly that it could be read one of like mm. two different ways yeah it's a beautiful statement in in temporarily allaying concerns that you're doing <laughs> it for the wrong reasons but damage control 101 that was when we were experimenting with revenue innovation that we knew would ultimately be player wins but were complex and we knew that they needed to be built off of a foundation of trust. So that was when we started charting our course to get out of loot boxes.
Okay, so no, it's just read it, read this the way it is. It was 2018. Battlefront 2 almost killed the loot box business <laughs> model entirely. Remember, people were saying like the EU, like the EU was actually saying like, oh, we should really start investigating loot boxes as potential gambling. Yeah, no, like, like, that's the level I got. The to hammer was coming down, of... <laughs> and you saw all of these companies immediately like eliminate their loot boxes who's still doing them mm -hmm. I was like siege still does them right but very a ton of companies abandoned it because they were like they were forward thinking in the in the business that they were like it's gonna get banned and we need to be ready with the backup <clears throat> plan yep that's the only reason and in that process they came up with more robust money making model models which is what he's saying He's not saying, oh, we, you know, we were doing a good thing and we got rid of loot boxes because we realized that it was a bad for player experience. They said we needed a more yeah. robust model because they were it almost became illegal. Or um, and, and, and move our sort of direct purchase. That's also when we started to add a free to play entry point into our game. Like these were all designed to further sustain the long term destiny hobby. And I think they've made our game better for all players. The fr I got a question. How does making the game free to play increase um, retention amongst players who are already there? Yeah, no, like... How does that build trust with existing players? Maybe if it's like... I have friends that want to get into Destiny, but they didn't want to pay for it. Now they can play it. Maybe in that very specific and case. And mind you, it's not free to play. It's just free to try. You have, you have, there's yeah. only like two things you can do in free to play Destiny. <laughs> You're gated, and it's nothing that people actually want to do. I'm just thinking about Warframe running concurrently with this. <laughs> <laughs> Battle passes replace loot boxes, essentially, because battle passes are an infinitely better business model when it comes to getting revenue out of players. Because mm -hmm. not only do you sometimes some battle passes you have to pay to access and then um, you hold player retention because people will stick around to complete their battle pass because like some cost fallacy comes into play. I pay ten dollars. I'm going to get my ten dollars out of this. And then you end up playing like 50 hours. Like Halo Infinite's battle passes are like exactly 50 hours. You don't have to buy them, but they, um, their battle passes are 50 hours. I know that. And uh, so it's a huge like, you know, it's a work week, basically. And then once you invest that time, you're already invested. You're more likely to stick around. Battle passes are insidious. But to go back to that FTL analogy, like it would be suicide to be messing with our shields when our O2 systems were down. And I truly believe that each of these different releases along this road would not have succeeded if we didn't have clear laser focus each time on what. You can pay to just skip the battle pass in Destiny 2? Well, yeah, a lot of battle passes, you can just buy your way to the end. Even um, Fallout 76 had that. You could buy the, all the tiles in the scoreboard with atoms. Really? Yeah, it was it was a crazy amount of money too. It was like eight thousand atoms or something. Eight thousand atoms of what? To skip the whole thing or to buy a single time? No, to buy your way to the end of the battle pass. Because to get to the end of the battle pass, you have to buy all the preceding steps. Right. Fallout really? seventy six. Oh shit, I complete I completely missed that. I probably would have made fun of that. Yeah, no, like um that's the crazy thing. That's how battle passes get you, is the um they don't give you Why? any one thing to focus because why why would you pay though because isn't the battle pass supposed to be content okay. isn't that why the battle pass exists it's 150 atoms a dollar 50 to advance a single rank of the battle pass so, well the goal is oh, you're God. at the end of the season and you're about to miss out on the last oh. the last 20 ranks of the battle pass oh. so you're like you know i've been working hard this season and i'm gonna get there I'm just going to drop $30 sunk cost. Fallacy. Yeah, because you put you Got put it. all this work into getting uh, 80 ranks of the battle pass. 
and oh. for probably circumstances that were out of your control maybe you had a busy work week maybe you had an emergency you weren't able it's... to finish the battle pass in time so you now you got to buy your dude. way out or it was all for nothing dude what the fuck uh, you can tell like this is such a foreign concept to me because like i did not even think of this yeah I'll... i am so not the type of, i'm so not the audience for a battle pass no i'm telling you right now uh you have no <laughs> clue how degenerate battle passes really get <laughs> oh. for uh, another oh another common God. strategy is there are two tracks to a battle pass there's a free track and a paid track and the free trip guys the it's not gambling the regulators it's not gambling because they know the win like the winnings every time they know exactly what they need to do to get the winnings so and it's it's 100 transparent the entire time so the, there's a free track and a paid track to most battle passes the free track will give you something like every 10 or 20 ranks and the paid track will give you something every rank so you know how fallout 76 gives you something every rank in the battle pass that's yeah. actually more generous than his industry standard <laughs> <laughs> so typically you would get 10 ranks in the battle pass and then you would get a like a free thing that they're just giving away. But it will tell you the yeah. entire time what you're missing out on because you haven't paid for the oh battle my. pass. And oh a lot God. of battle pass systems give you a percentage bonus for unlocking ranks of the battle pass if you've already paid for it. Wait, percentage. So bonus? in Siege, if you pay the $10 for the battle pass, you unlock the ranks of the battle pass 30% faster oh okay so you pay ten dollars to get the premium and then you unlock ranks of the battle pass 30 percent faster and you gain access to the stuff that's in the battle pass which then like it's built to put you in a situation where you're going to be in a sunk cost fallacy mindset and then trap you there so that you further invest yourself into it and that's how they siphon money out of you no it, it's wow. like leg it's legitimately <laughs> evil <laughs> And this is how Sony has made 13 to 15 billion dollars off of microtransactions alone in Call of Duty. Wow. Our specific goals and definition of success were. And importantly, these goals, they change from release to release. So, so that was a really... I'm sure the revenue goal stays the same, though. <laughs> the only revenue goal shifts oh, yeah. is how much. Yeah. Private sessions is taking psychic damage live on stream. And this isn't even psychic damage. This is like my mind is just this is like finding out like some some like I don't know crack den has been <laughs> existing in your neighborhood for like years and years and you had no idea. And there was a just like there wasn't even a drug bust. Just the drug dealer is just got high one day and just started spewing nonsense on the on the corner. And it's like, yeah, I run the crack den on the side of the on the corner. What are you going to do about it? Nobody's going to arrest me. That's why a lot of new gamers are really struggling with these new games that come out and don't have any of these microtransaction systems. This is this sort of mm. A feeling of hollowness that you see from them because like they're yeah. they're coming in with these expectations of a battle pass and all this stuff and it's like it's going to be this huge life investment and then none of it's there and like you can see them kind of fail to process process it i don't think they're like mentally dependent on it they just expect it yeah yeah well what you're saying uh that um these companies rely on replacement uh yeah Generate gener replacement. generational replacement. People like us that grew up without yeah. these systems look at this stuff as disgusting. But people who are 10 years younger than us have known nothing but battle pass systems and loot box systems. And they're so used to it. And oh. they there's these messages that influencers spread about how it's necessary for their revenue models. Yeah. So oh, it, yeah. It's yeah, not yeah. just that you're not just being taken advantage of because that's one like I play Siege every now and then and like I know that people are being taken advantage of and I don't give a shit. Sometimes I even buy the battle pass if I if I play like a, a big season. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, but these people, they look at they they get it all because they think the game that I like could get shut down if I don't. Yeah, <laughs> there's so like it's there's so much psyop shit that goes that oh. goes into these monetization systems.
And it, it, when you consider the actual damage that it does to people, uh, this guy goes from, oh, it's just, you know, it's he's a bit of a sociopath and has a mask off thing to how many people's lives did he potentially ruin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you see, you see the you see the articles from time to time of like, oh, some some parent their kids st- like use their credit card and racked up like ten thousand dollars on blah blah blah, and it's just like, yeah, that happens like a lot though. <laughs> uh, and that that's that's why. Um, well, and what that's why gambling uh, gambling streams on Twitch got cra- like got banned because they were like, well, you know, th- these these things like ruin lives you know uh unregulated uh people people get hooked on this shit and it's just yeah so they just took the loot boxes and they're just like all right we're gonna find a more insidious way we're gonna push the argument a few more years um so that the the, the governments are like the government like they're just playing it's like one of those it's like one of those like hackers or something where it's just like it's an arms race against like the the against like the antivirus co- like companies and stuff like that as long as we stay ahead of the regulations um we'll be fine so we were talking about generational replacement guys like this know that all they have to do is wait and their audience yeah. and their audience will grow because those old boomers you know you're never going to convert them but there's always new gamers that have been raised into the system that could be yeah brought into the fold god damn whoa you know, stuff like this makes me so glad that I have other hobbies. Um, because, like, if the day comes where, like, you know, indie games are no longer the bastion of freedom and creativity and stuff, and it's all just fucked, um, I will just not play games anymore instead. Have you seen those clips I... on Twitch streams of people opening CSGO cases? Where they no. will, um, they will, like, oh. legitimately... Uh, They'll just like be in like mid match. They're playing a game, a competitive game, and they just mid match open the menu to go open a, a CSGO case and spin it as fast as possible just to see if they win. And then they go right back to playing within 15 seconds. No, I've never seen that before. I've seen dedicated streams where people are opening cases. Though. No, no, no. This is next level. These guys are so hooked <laughs> on the case opening experience that like they could be in the middle of something and they're just getting that itch. And that's just that's loot boxes. That's the old paradigm. That's outdated. That's five years outdated. I can't believe it's been that long since uh, since we were trying to regulate this shit and they found a more pervasive way that's harder to regulate because I don't see what's like you can say it harms people. But what's the legal way that you would stop this within the current paradigm of how we do things? We yeah, le- yeah, well, that's the thing. It's like, how can you even define this as gambling? Because it you can't technically isn't. You can't approach it from the gambling perspective. There's, I don't think there's any legal yeah. precedent that you can say it's harmful to people that we, I, can, we have to. Like, I don't think so. Straight up, it would have to be a war on drugs type situation where we just come out with new categories yeah. of stuff to make illegal just to set up a system to criminalize this. Mm-hmm. And even war on drugs was all predicated on like vice taxes and stuff. I think that's the place to start is a battle passes should be on a vice tax. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. And we need to be doing the work to define this stuff so that legal apparatus can regulate it. Because when I was in college, I wrote a couple essays about loot boxes, putting it into easily digestible terms. That was what we were doing during the um, during loot boxes was getting the discourse <laughs> out there so that then the regulators could come in and say, OK, we've got this mountain of uh, this mountain of research and terminology that we can use to create legislation. Yeah, so that's the work that needs to be done. Simple example, three definitions of success, layering them on one. Three definitions, all redefinitions, of course, because we're redefining success. At a time, as we've iterated since then, it gets it gets more and more nuanced because we keep trying to build more and more precise definitions of success. So, for a more recent example, here's one of our typical uh, KPI report cards. I pulled this straight from one of our internal presentations not not too long ago. KPI means key 
performance indicator. It's quantifiable measurements of performance. That you, you were on the money with him. <laughs> Metrics report cards. Let's go. We measure against a defined <laughs> target we set ahead of time. And we call it a report card because while every release might have their own unique metrics that we want to measure. So like, for example, in the Witch Queen, we released the new Glaive weapon. So we have a metric for like, how many people are using the Glaive weapon? Those are, those are unique per release. This report- Got entire departments of tracking the most inane bullshit and trying to like, just create like any kind of statistical understanding from the sheer amount of noise that they have to come up with. Yeah, yeah. How, our measure of success for the Witch Queen expansion is how many people are using glaive weapons. And then, Not how many and then, people are just playing and enjoying it. It turns the out that, like, bot, like that. bot farmers figure out that glaive weapons are like the most efficient for their root. Yeah. And like, so, so, like, the, the, why does the metric keep going up? Glaives aren't in the meta. And then it's like, oh, turns out bot farmers are like, because it's easy for bots to get or something. Yeah, yeah. Port card is the baseline grades that every release is gonna get no matter what. And it gives us a common language to define and discuss success every time. So Has he used the word art yet in this discussion? Because like, this is, this is just, it's so weird. It's so fucking weird. You're coming from a company that Literally, their motto was, we make games we want to play. It, it, a company of, like, creators, of, like, people who are, like, artists and stuff. People who are passionate about what they are making. And now you're talking about, we let statistics decide how we're going to produce content. If he said it, it was in the eight minutes that we didn't see. <laughs> he might have said it when he was quantifying what, an, uh, what a box release was. And he might have said, like, they're more artistic or something like that. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. We've got a transcript. We've got a transcript. <laughs> Control F art. <laughs> hang on. Am I actually able to search specifically? For, like, if I put it in quotes. No, match, match case. No. Whole words. Three matches. Okay. It's the okay. Things... Okay. We've got the three matches. The three times that he says the word art in this presentation. Okay. Oh, wait. No, one of them's a comment. <laughs> uh where's number two where where is number two you see it's i can't it's find number two but it's somewhere in the comments it's somewhere lost in the, the comments so he, has, the, he says it once here's the quote the way th so so i i just want to finish my point the way you have to look you have to attack um you have you, you have to approach something like this is you have to look at what is not said okay the only time he's said arts is let me try to find the opening of this data is updated every single day we then do what we call live ops review this is in fucking 15 minutes by the way he's still talking about this <laughs> we, we do what we call live ops reviews of this data every two weeks so we dissect the performance of our last two weeks of our game with the team and importantly the audience here for these live op reviews is not just like our pms or analytics we try to get all the feature leads like all of our design directors our art leads anyone who's making so the only time he says art is in reference to the job <laughs> title of an art lead. The pro yeah, the productivity. While it's nested in all sorts of, we're using statistics, which is really the point that I'm making right now, is that he is talking about quantifying a creative process through statistics. Wow. It's a serve. From a, from a company that... I mean, I get why they removed their, why they eliminated their old slogan. Because mm -hmm. it's being, it's, but, it, um, everything's being run through a guy that doesn't even conceptualize games as being art. Yeah. Well, like I said earlier, you, you have on the one hand people who are making the arguments that video games are art, and then you have people like this who are saying video games are not even a product anymore. They are a service. They are a service that you get out as quickly as possible, and all that matters is shovel is funneling funneling content into your game. And if his words, and if you have a problem, his if words, you have problems, redefine success, and then follow this three bullet point <laughs> plan.
to build to build <laughs> trust with your influencers so that it trickles down and then get your attention up by releasing good in-game content and then turn on the revenue options slowly. Yeah. But I think um I think this is where we should call it. Because yeah. if he's gonna talk about this for another fifteen yeah, minutes, absolutely. Like, this, this feels like a good a good Hang part on, let's to let's let's jump at. ahead. How long does he spend on the KPI report card uh slide? <laughs> on a black screen. So two minutes. Uh four minutes. Okay. He's still talking about data, but he's got five minutes on the KPI report card. Talking about data, talking about data, talking about data. Data informed design. That's a great one. <laughs> there's at least like, 15 there's minutes on like math shit that um, is all just statistical analysis. Man, what a fucking stream. Man. What I did not expect uh, this detour. That was beautiful. I was I was only planning on going for like four hours mm. too. I was like, yeah, we'll do some like fun oblivion stuff. It'll be like, fun. It'll be fine. And then and then this. <laughs> I mean, it was an oblivion stream. Oh, it was. It yeah. captures the experience of playing obli playing oblivion <laughs> uh, while listening to YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like, I'm basically a YouTuber who's doing my own live stream, and you're listening to it. And just like somehow you've gotten <laughs> through the screen. <laughs> oh man, that was good. So yeah, was awesome. tomorrow we're watching Todd Howard interviews. I think this is great contrast material. I'm gonna get quotes from yeah. <laughs> snippets from this to play ahead of that stream. <laughs> and then uh, I, I guess we gotta get together the Destiny thing so we can finish. Yeah, this. yeah. <laughs> we'll have to coordinate that. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. That's good. Holy crap. Thanks to everybody who stuck it through. Uh, I hope you were as fascinated <laughs> as we were. Um, we love this type of industry, uh, corporate is, background memo. Stuff. This is this is the good. Please shit. look into Tom Sawyer's presentation. This like Oh man, it, it's just been so good the past right few weeks then. with the FTC proceedings and everything like that. Watching Microsoft basically plead like plead pro poverty to the um, to the FTC and stuff, saying, "Yeah, we lost the we lost the war, we lost the console war. We had to buy out all these companies because like Bethesda was about to get bought out by Sony." It's 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 so good, and it's all just coming out all at once. It's this has been such a good summer for. Uh, for, it makes me sad that there aren't like or at least as far as i'm aware if there is channels dedicated to this stuff please send them my way um because otherwise like i i don't know like we like me and pat might have to start going through like i want to go through the all the stuff that came in the ftc stuff because there's so much in there there's so much to unpack um it, it's just it's just great I don't know if I could ever make videos on this stuff, but just just for my just for my pure entertainment value. Will we break down the FTC proceedings in a future stream? I, I'm going to I'm going to look into it. I, I'm going to look into it or whatever. Um, the problem is, it's like I, I need to avoid like legalese because I'm not a lawyer or anything like that. Um, so. But just like the juicy drama of like Microsoft just saying, you know, they couldn't get dev kits and that's why there is no uh, there is no like a port for um, for Minecraft on, on the PlayStation 5, even though there's no dedicated port on the Xbox still. It, it, just, 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 just stuff like that. Sorry, my apologies. Stuff for like that's so good. Yeah, we I was just talking about how we probably should do like a stream on like the FTC proceedings and stuff. Yeah, too, we gotta we just... gotta compile a spreadsheet of uh, everything yeah, that's yeah. gone on with that. This this stuff is so good because I was asking Chad, I'm like, is if there's any channels that are dedicated to like breaking this stuff down, I want to see them because like I'm willing to do that. If there's nobody else doing this stuff, I'll do streams where I'm just breaking this stuff down. I'll try my best anyways. Cuz this is this is the stuff that makes doing doing these sorts of videos having a channel like this. Yeah, this is I've always been interested in the corporate side. 
I I mean, dude, as somebody who <laughs> went to school for business and stuff, this is my this is my uh, this is my alma mater here. So to like see it, like to hear some of the stuff that he was saying, like from my like business classes and stuff <laughs> that I've read in textbooks and everything. Um, there's there's one class I took, one of my favorite classes. It was um uh, dysfunctional business or dysfunctional. Um, behavior in, in organizations or something like that. Basically, it's like how companies fuck up. And like, there's stuff that he's saying that's triggering, like stuff that I read in, uh, in that class. Like, these are the types of people that you don't want in your organization. It's fascinating. So fascinating. Everything I said was wrong. Why Indy's different now? Is that the Tom Sawyer talk? Why Indy is different now. And if there's other like good GDC talks that we should watch. Six years ago. Indy is this is Lisa Brown. I think um I think this deserves like a, a, a channel in your uh in your Discord for people to just post stuff related to Yeah, okay, hang on. Um, leaks. Games industry. I'll just make um make that a channel right now. Yeah. Uh, probably like a short term drama. Probably a short term thing. We'll just roll it into submissions yeah. eventually. But uh, if you've got any yeah, good yeah. stuff, you can put it in there. Uh, we got a Chris in that channel with uh. The cream of the crop here. <laughs> the gold, the gold standard. Yeah, this is this that is, all all submissions are going to be judged against. Th that's what we're looking for is what's been pinned in. There. Yeah. Yeah. The depths of pillar of pillars of attorney too. see, there you go, because Tom Sawyer is a very generic name. So if it's about pillars of eternity, then that gives me more specificity. Looking back and moving forward with Pillars of Eternity. You said uh, you said Tom Sawyer, you're talking about Josh Josh Sawyer. Come on guys, Jay Saw, Jay Saw. <laughs> How'd you see the Outer Worlds video and not know that it was JSAW? Oh, right. We got a shill. Um, I have a video out already on pa uh, available on Patreon. Uh, my City Skylines review, one hour long. Um, if you subscribe right now on Patreon, you get access to it. Otherwise, the video will be live Friday. I'm not going to do a premiere for it. Um, I'm just going to drop it out because I don't... I got stuff I got to do Friday. I so. am premiering part one of my outer worlds video like like it um uncensored full cut for members uh patrons members etc and streaming tomorrow both of us starfield todd howard interviews i think it'll be a great contest. salty salty did you did you leave Sal while we were watching have you seen any of the gdc stuff that we've been watching for the past three salty hours might have or did salty might have missed that? the fucking gold that's been the gold. what the last five <laughs> you, um, hours you might want to go back and if, watch this VOD. I know he was here for when I was reading <laughs> from the book. Since like four o'clock. Oh, yeah, you dude. Watch this VOD. <laughs> watch what you missed because we saw fucking gold. <laughs> I <laughs> I st I stared into the abyss and it stared back. <laughs> Bet? No, dude. Some of the best stuff I've seen on YouTube of all time in terms of entertainment value. Not necessarily a great Ev video, but everything. Ev dude, I'm not exaggerating. Every fucking line that as in, said. No, as in we are going to be doing a stream sentence. where we watch ex it exclusively. This is one of the first time we're doing a reaction to something that isn't tied to any of our projects. <laughs> And very possibly one of us is going to be playing Destiny while we do it. <laughs> I think it's a good dynamic. One person runs the watch together. One person plays Destiny mm -hmm. or plays yeah, the yeah. game. 
I can I can play Destiny with my brain turned yeah, off. Yeah, so it's good. I'll hand that to you. I'll handle the watch together in chat, and uh, yeah, it'll be quite the stream. Yeah, no no timetable on it, but um, but we'll 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 try and get it set up ASAP. This is what happens when Put I chose when way. I choose to go to work for fuck's sake. <laughs> no, I promise. Uh, it's probably one of the best uh, co streams we've ever done. <laughs> holy dude crap. this week has been a banger it, it, <laughs> i feel like we're gonna be spoiling people here. yeah because we're gonna we're gonna and disappear some. again for a few weeks and they're gonna be like yeah. why is it that they do like a week of fucking bangers back to back <laughs> which was an accident the, this none of this was planned like we both we both synced up yeah so like like yeah. complete accident we're both releasing videos on the same day <laughs> yeah so like uh i said like i i needed to like get my video out and i said uh you know this friday sounds fine and and then i contact you to ask you what you're doing and like oh you're gonna stream this week before you launch a video i'm gonna stream this week before <laughs> i launch a video and then indigo yeah. messages me and says hey do, <laughs> do you guys both <laughs> want to join our stream it, and he had no idea what we were doing yeah his and because his his thing was completely impromptu too he's like i i just want to put something together and i know you guys are usually like good to go so you want to just hop on and just and so yeah this this is like a, there was this a new just like very serendipitous oh yeah yeah the larp i forgot about that yeah and we did a podcast so sorry for spoiling all you guys but at least you know what pace it pace yourselves out you don't have to watch everything all at once um, if you have you know, to watch it for the next few if, if you weeks. have to pick anything and you haven't seen it yet watch the fucking the the <laughs> gdc stuff someone <laughs> like as fast as possible get a timestamp in the comments for when that is <laughs> i might i might have to delist this video for a bit i did flash something on screen that i might have to remove but uh I, th I might I might even go in and I might just like re-render this and just upload it because I have a, I have a local copy that yeah. I've been saving. So I, I might even go through and just like re-render it and like cut it down and stuff and then just like about, upload it to my second channel. I don't channel know about cutting something. it down. I might just cut there, there's some like dead space. I think I could probably cut through. I'll probably do like I did with Indigo stream and do a clip from it. Because mm -hmm. I uh, I clipped a part of indigo stream that i think is important for some topics on a scale of one to the 2016 libertarian debate how wild was it I, I don't even know what that libertarian debate is but this was the most mask off moment i've ever i've ever seen from basically anything but uh, especially from the industry Oh man. All right, but I got to I got to hit the road here. Thank you guys for coming out. Um yeah, I'll be on Patrician's stream tomorrow. Uh we'll be doing some Todd Howard stuff, which will be not nearly as um horrifying as what we just what we were just listening to for the past like 3 hours. And uh yeah. Uh video release friday like i said and um i don't know when the next stream's gonna be I i'm gonna tr i'm trying to do the plan with oblivion is to have like a summer of oblivion because i have a lot of footage and stuff that i want to record for uh for this game so we'll see how many streams i'm able to knock out but i do have to focus on the skyrim project as well i gotta write that that script i, w I need to have that video mostly done by the time starfield's releasing so Everything's up in the air at this point. Enjoy this week while we got it. That's all I got to say. Are you still there, Pat? Yep. Did I lose yep. you? Yep, still here. Okay. All right. Well, say goodbye. All right, chat. We'll see you tomorrow. Good luck catching up with everything we've done. <laughs> <laughs>